Raymond, Vampires in America, Volume 3. Written by D.B. Reynolds. Narrated by Tracy Odom. Prologue. Buffalo, New York. It was totally dark. She touched her fingers to her eyes to make sure they were open. They were but the room was like pitch black, like she couldn't see her freaking hand in front of her face. Her mom must have pulled the stupid blinds down behind the curtains again to save energy. Regina was all for saving energy, but she wasn't a damn bat either. She sat up with an irritated groan and reached for the small lamp near her bed, nearly falling on her face when it wasn't there. She frowned and felt around blindly with both hands, finally hitting something solid. A small table lamp, but not hers. The first stirrings of unease coiled in her chest as her hand felt its way up the unfamiliar base to an old-fashioned push-button switch. A press of her thumb yielded a dim yellow light. She stared, abruptly wide awake. This wasn't her room. The strange lamp should have warned her, but somehow she'd still expected to see her familiar bedroom with the old-timey furniture she'd inherited from her Grandma Lena and the cheesy posters she'd bought with her twenty-first birthday money two years ago, the ones she'd thought were so sophisticated, but turned out to be just weird. But this wasn't her room. It wasn't even her house. So where the hell was she? She blinked, forcing down her fear and thinking furiously. She'd gone out with friends. Right. Okay. Katie's bachelorette party. But after that, she'd probably had too much to drink. All the signs were there, the sick stomach, the pounding head. God, had one of her friends dragged her home with them? Had she been that out of it? A wave of guilt swept over her, replacing the fear and tightening her chest with remorse. She could hear her mom's voice lecturing her, saying, If you can't drive, you catch a cab or go home with one of the girls instead. Just make sure you call me, Regina, so I don't worry. She clutched the rough blanket close against a sudden chill and swung her legs over the side of the bed. Her feet touched a cold, damp floor, and she frowned at the sensation. A concrete floor? She looked up. No windows, either. Was this a basement? She didn't remember any of her friends having guest rooms in... It all came rushing back. The lights on the dark street, ice gleaming on the sidewalks. She'd almost fallen. No, she had fallen. She flushed in embarrassment and remembered a strong hand gripping her arm, keeping her from hitting the ground. She glanced up, wanting to thank her rescuer, and then... She jumped as a noise broke the silence, something loud and heavy, a door slamming into a wall. She froze, listening, expecting footsteps. She heard a soft sob instead, a woman's voice somewhere nearby... She stood, taking a tentative step toward the door which was little more than an outline in the dim light. Hello? she whispered, wondering if the other person could hear her. She reached for the doorknob. Hello? she said again, louder this time. A heavy footstep scuffed in the hallway and she snatched her hand back, holding herself tightly. Her heart was racing suddenly, her breath fast and shallow, making her light-headed as she strained to hear. A key rattled and the unseen woman began to cry, louder now, pleading. Regina stumbled back onto the bed, pulling her feet up, wrapping her arms around her legs, trying to be small, to be invisible. The woman began to scream. Chapter 1 Sarah Stratton's eyes opened, a scream filling her throat, choking her as she fought it down, as her hand slapped the switch next to her bed. 
Light flooded the room, and she sat up, her gaze taking in every familiar detail. She inhaled a deep, sucking breath that was more of a sob, like in her dream. Stop it, she told herself. It had been a dream, a nightmare, nothing more. The darkness, the terror, they weren't real. Not this time. Hot tears flooded her eyes, and she dashed them away angrily. Climbing out of bed, she stumbled over to her closet. There was no point in trying to go back to sleep. She had to get up soon anyway. She had two classes to teach and blue books to grade. Might as well get an early start, get in her morning jog, maybe have a real cup of coffee at the local Starbucks instead of sleeping that extra hour. It wasn't because she was afraid of the dream. Afraid the fear would come back, the helplessness. Stop it, Sarah, she repeated. She pulled on her winter jogging clothes with quick, sharp movements, warm leggings, a sweatshirt over a sensible athletic bra. It was nearly spring, but she'd learned the hard way that cold weather lingered here in Buffalo, especially in the mornings. She twisted her long blonde hair into a secure ponytail before bending to lace up her shoes. Downstairs, she grabbed her warm windbreaker from the closet and zipped her cell phone and ten dollars into a pocket, adding her keys once she'd locked the front door securely behind her. She paused for a moment to adjust to the freezing air, noting the slick spots on the short walkway down to the street. The girl in her dream, Regina, she'd called herself. Had fallen on a walkway much like this one. Sarah shook her head adamantly, refusing the memory. A dream, she reminded herself. She did a few warm-ups, leaning against the old wooden railing, stretching her hamstrings. The light was still burning on her landlady's side of their shared porch, but it was too early for even that industrious lady. But not too early for Sarah. She took the stairs down at a quick jog, stepping to the side and running across the dead grass to avoid the slick pavement. On the street, she settled into a regular pace, legs pumping smoothly, breath easing in and out in a steady rhythm, her body warm despite the icy morning. And finally, she permitted herself to think about the dream and what it might mean. It had been years since she'd had a nightmare that bad. The kind that brought her awake, screaming, that brought back the cold and the damp, the despair, the wisp of humid breath over a bare cheek, the heat of a hand as it reached to touch. Sarah stopped in the middle of the empty street, breathing hard, her heart pounding. She bent over, hands on her knees, each breath a gasp for air. Hey, you okay? She jumped at the man's voice. Nearly stumbling as she backed away, eyes wide. He raised his hands, palms out, and took a step back. Sorry, I just thought. Sarah forced a smile, trying to look normal, but she could tell by the look on his face that it wasn't working. No, I'm sorry, she said, fighting to even out her breathing. I didn't hear you coming. Yeah, I'm fine. Bad night last night. The other jogger nodded, clearly not believing her, but anxious to get away from the crazy lady. If you're sure, yeah, yes. She waved him away. Thanks for stopping, though. I appreciate it. She began to walk slowly, hands on her hips, cursing her own stupidity. She didn't even look up as the helpful man jogged past, not wanting to see the concern or the curiosity on his face. The dreams, the damn stupid dreams. Why were they back? And why now? Chapter Two. Her office was too warm. Coming from California, it was always a surprise to Sarah that people on the East Coast kept their rooms so warm. It made her drowsy. Which only reminded her she'd gotten up an hour early this morning, and why. She hunched determinedly over her desk at the university, 
trying to keep her eyes from crossing as she read what passed for freshman college essays these days. Low music played in the background, a golden oldie station playing tunes from the 60s and 70s, the songs of another generation that somehow spoke to her soul. But not even the sweet rhythms of Motown could soften her disgust with the essays she was reading. What did they teach these kids in high school anyway? Half of them couldn't spell worth a damn, and most of the other half had the vocabulary of a thirteen-year-old. Granted, most of them were only taking her world history class because they had to, but... A phone rang. She'd already picked up her desk phone's receiver before her brain processed the fact that it was her cell phone ringing instead. She dropped the landline receiver with a disgusted sigh and fished her cell out of her coat pocket where it was thrown over a nearby filing cabinet. Checking the caller ID, she smiled and flipped it open. Hi, Sin. You ever wonder what people did before caller ID? Sin asked. Answered the phone and hoped for the best, I suppose. Why? Sin made a discontented noise. How's Buffalo? Hmm... Okay, I guess. But there's this white stuff everywhere. I'm not sure what it is exactly, but it's cold and slippery. Sounds intriguing, except for the cold and slippery part. Yeah, well, not really. So, not that I'm complaining, because I'm grading blue books and I'll take any excuse for a break. But why are you awake? The sun is shining. Where you are, anyway— Shouldn't you be cuddled up next to that gorgeous vampire you're living in sin with? Sin blew out a dismissive breath. Don't be stodgy, Sarah. You're too young for it. Besides, we did the whole blood exchange thing. Repeatedly, actually. We're mated, and that's the vampire equivalent of marriage. When in Rome, okay, yuck on the blood thing. I still don't understand how the blood thing is important, Sarah— especially for a super-vamp like Raphael. It marks me as his mate, which is a sort of protection, and it links us in a way. I don't know if I can explain it, but it's important. All right, I believe you. Changing the subject now. Please tell me it's not like 80 degrees in Malibu. It's not. It's raining, which means the natives are convinced the end is near and are engaged in ritual auto pileups in an attempt to appease the angry gods. I remember it well. So why are you awake? It's barely past noon on your coast. Shareholders meeting. I had breakfast afterward with my father and grandmother. Sometimes I don't think we'd recognize each other if not for the family resemblance. Sarah thought about her own family and forced a polite laugh. Sin, of course, wasn't fooled. Everything all right, Sarah? Sure, why? Oh, man, that was weak. What's going on? No, really, I'm fine. It's probably just this god-awful weather. You're the one who wanted to move far away from sunny California. Yeah... Sarah sighed deeply and said again, more softly, Yeah. Okay, that's it. We need to get you out of that two-horse town. I think a vacation is definitely in order. I can't, Sin. Even if I had the money, which I don't, I've got... I can't take the time off. I'm teaching two classes, and they've loaded me up with committee work. I'm the new kid, I'm untenured, and I'm female— which means I get all the crap assignments, because they know I can't refuse. A weekend, Sin insisted. The university won't collapse if you take a weekend off. Come on, somewhere close. What's close to that place? Niagara Falls? Hell no, she answered herself. Full of tourists and all that water, which is probably frozen stiff by now. Wait, where's my head? Manhattan. You're like an hour away by air, and God, Sarah, the stores. Sin, I can't. Besides, we'll never get a hotel. Who needs a hotel? My father has a townhouse or a condo or something. It's always empty this time of year. He hates the cold. Okay, fine. One weekend, Sin. That's it. What a grouch. 
Is this what happens when you become a professor? You're not wearing tweed, are you? Sarah laughed at last, a real laugh this time, not the forced polite one from before. No, no tweed. That stuff itches. I'll figure out which airline to call and no, I'll make all the arrangements. I don't trust you. Any weekend in particular good for you? No, they're pretty much all the same, Sarah admitted, contemplating her dreary life. Well, Jesus, Sarah, no wonder you need a vacation. Okay, let me talk to Raphael and I'll get back to you. This is going to be fun. If you say so. Work on that attitude, girl. I'll call you back. Sarah pulled the phone away from her ear, feeling abruptly deflated as Sin disconnected. She could have told Sin about the dreams. Sin would have understood, would have tried to help. After all, she was living with a vampire, for God's sake. What was a little telepathic dreaming compared to having your lover suck your blood every night? But Sarah had never told anyone, not since she'd gotten out of that place. Maybe Sin was right. She'd been under a lot of stress with the new job and the move across the country to a city she'd never even visited, except for her job interview. And Buffalo was so different from L.A., or even Berkeley, especially Berkeley. She stared at the backlit screen of her cell phone until it went black, then slid it into her pocket and went back to her blue books. There were pills one could buy over the counter now, sleeping pills that worked as well or better than some prescription meds. Maybe she'd stop at the drugstore on her way home. Bad enough that Cynthia would show up looking like a runway model, there was no need for Sarah to look like five months of bad weather, even if she was living in Buffalo. Chapter 3 Malibu, California Raphael stood in front of the full-length mirror, automatically sliding the red length of a silk tie beneath his collar as he watched Cynthia move absently around the room behind him. His sin was normally a direct woman, but there were times, usually when she wanted something she knew he would resist. He smiled, meeting her eyes in the mirror as she came up behind him. I'll do that, she said, and slipped around in front, taking the tie and running it through her elegant fingers. He surrendered it willingly, always pleased when she ministered to him, which wasn't often. She was fiercely loyal. She would and had killed to defend him and his. But she didn't take to what in his day would have been considered the more womanly chores. He almost laughed out loud at the thought. She caught the edge of his smile and scowled up at him. What are you thinking, vampire? Only of how much I enjoy having you fix my tie for me. She squinted doubtfully. Uh-huh. She finished knotting the silk and reached up to turn his collar down. She had to stand on tiptoes to reach behind his neck, and he put his hands on her hips, steadying her and pulling her closer, enjoying the press of her full breasts against his chest. She raised her face to his, and he indulged himself in a long, slow exploration of her delicious mouth, feeling the soft warmth of her breath against his cheek. His body responded to her as it always did, his cock stirring eagerly, as hungry for the taste of her as if they hadn't just made love less than an hour ago. He slid his hands from her hips to the firm curve of her ass, pulling her close, and let her feel his arousal. Trying to ply me with sex, my sin. I don't need to ply you, she murmured against his mouth. You're already mine. He smiled. True enough, Lubemeyer. Why don't you just ask whatever it is? She stiffened in his arms and his smile grew. Whatever what is, she demanded. He laughed out loud and she drew back enough to slap his chest, immediately smoothing the spot as if afraid she'd hurt him. Damn vampire! Ah, but I am yours, am I not? She wrapped both arms around his neck. 
I was thinking, she admitted slowly. He gave her a smug smile and she scowled up at him. I want to go to New York this weekend. He frowned. It's snowing there. But it's Manhattan. Shopping, clubs, museums. What's a little snow? He raised one eyebrow and she clicked her tongue in disgust. Fine. You remember my friend Sarah? He hadn't met that many of her friends, but the name. The one in the bar? he asked doubtfully. That's the one. Something or someone is bothering her. I want to know what. She's in Buffalo, she said with a grimace of distaste, as if that's not enough to get someone down. But I don't think that's it, or not just that anyway. I'm going to meet her in Manhattan for the weekend. Are you? She glared up at him and he added, I cannot let you go to Manhattan alone, my sin. Her glare turned to a look of interest. My father has a place there. I'm sure I, too, have a place, he chided her gently, with far more suitable accommodations than your father's. But it is not a simple matter for me or my mate to travel to another's territory. He drew a long breath. "'thinking about Sin's request and how it might serve a purpose of his own. "'One weekend, Lubimaya. No more.' "'She grinned, standing on tiptoe again to kiss him hard on the mouth. "'I love you,' she whispered. "'I know,' he said smugly. "'She slapped his chest again. "'Say it!' "'You are my heart, my soul, my life.' Her lovely green eyes filled with tears and she coughed to cover her emotion. Should I talk to Duncan? I will do so. Arrangements will need to be made with Kristoff and with Raymond, who runs the city for him. His phone rang and he turned to pick it up from the desk. Duncan, he said answering. A few moments, thank you. He hung up. Do you have plans for the evening? I'm sparring with Elka later, and maybe Mirabelle, and then I need to check on some internet searches I've got going and send off a few reports. Nothing major. I will have Duncan coordinate with you then. She grabbed him when he would have turned away, fisting her fingers in his short hair and pulling his head down for a deep, lingering kiss. We could stay in and have wild monkey sex all night instead. It's cold and raining up there. He glanced at his watch. Three hours, my sin. And then I will permit you to ply me with sex until morning. She gave him a wicked look. You've got a deal. He took his jacket from the closet and shrugged it over his shoulders, standing still while she smoothed his tie and straightened his lapels. I do love you, you know, she said. And I you, Lubemaya. Raphael sat at the conference table watching as Duncan ushered the last of their human guests out of the room. He could feel the surf pounding against the cliff below, vibrating the floor beneath his feet. It was one of the reasons he'd chosen this location to build his home. He loved the ocean, the primal energy, the smell and feel of it, the silver shimmer of the moon on the black water. My lord... Duncan closed the door and crossed the room, taking the chair to Raphael's right. It went well, I thought. It did, Duncan. As much as I dislike dealing with humans, this investment is promising. He pushed his chair back and crossed his legs at the knee. Tell me, is Ryman still requesting a meeting? Duncan showed his puzzlement at the change of subject. He is, my lord. Cynthia wants to visit Manhattan. Duncan frowned. It's very cold there this time of year. Raphael met his lieutenant's eyes and smiled. My reaction as well. Unfortunately, Sin is convinced her friend Sarah is in need... of a friend, I suppose one would say. I see. Make the arrangements, please, Duncan. 
Check with Sin on the date and use our people for everything, including Sarah's travel. She is Sin's friend, not mine. I know very little about her. I understand, my lord. What of Kristoff? I will contact Kristoff. But we both know who the true master of Manhattan is. Shall I call Ryman, then? Raphael nodded. You know what we want, Duncan. My lord. Duncan bowed slightly and left the room. Raphael stood slowly, stretching to his full height. He hadn't planned a visit to New York so soon, but it might work out for the best. Kristoff was declining. That much was obvious. And there was only one vampire among the aging lord's children who had the power to take and hold the territory. It was time for a new order among the Vampire Council of North America. And what better place to start than with an alliance between the two coasts? Chapter 4 New York, New York, Manhattan Sarah sat in the big black SUV and watched the city zoom by outside the tinted windows, feeling like a bit player in some movie with the Secret Service hustling the president around a shadowy foreign capital. She kept waiting for the bad guys to jump out in front of them with guns blazing. Although, come to think of it, she was pretty sure the Secret Service could have taken a few tips from these vampire guys. There were three SUVs, two of them, one in front and one behind, jammed full of big, no-nonsense vamps. She rode in the middle vehicle with Sin and Raphael and Raphael's lieutenant, Duncan. In the front seat were two of the security types, including the mountain Sin called Juro, he was apparently in charge of the whole thing. All the security vamps were wearing these totally gorgeous charcoal-colored wool suits, which had to be custom-made given the sheer physical size of some of them. And how weird was that? The latest in vampire security attire, charcoal wool. Even the lone female among them was wearing one, and looked like she could break Sarah in two, which she probably could. Duncan was wearing the same thing, albeit with a different shirt and tie. And, of course, Raphael's outfit probably cost more than three months' worth of Sarah's salary as an assistant professor. She eyed the vampire lord where he sat on the middle seat in front of her, one arm around Sin, their heads together as they murmured back and forth. She had to admit she was intimidated by him. He was otherworldly handsome, a masterpiece of sculpture come to life. And although he rarely said anything, at least not in her hearing, when he walked into a room he was instantly the focus of attention. He was like a massive sun whose gravity pulled everything else, planets, stars, passing meteors, into his orbit just by existing. Except for Sin. Sin was never one to hide her light under a bushel, but when she and Raphael were together, they both burned just a little bit brighter. And as for Sarah, she was pretty sure Raphael wouldn't have noticed her at all if not for sin. Not because he was rude or anything, but because she honestly didn't cross his radar. Which was fine with her, because in the final analysis, he was one scary guy. The driver cursed abruptly, slamming on his brakes as the SUV in front of them did the same. Sarah grabbed a strap of her seatbelt. She was the only person wearing one. The vamps probably didn't need them, and neither did Sin, for that matter, what with Raphael never taking his hands off her. The SUVs took off again, speeding through Manhattan, running signals and cutting off traffic with impunity. She supposed in a city with so many dignitaries, people were used to motorcades like this. There were plenty of blaring horns, but then when weren't there horns honking in New York City? That's probably why it was called the city that never sleeps. Who could sleep with all that noise? She glanced over at Duncan, sitting next to her. He was the most human-seeming of all the vampires— but Sin had assured her that Duncan was nearly as powerful as Raphael himself. 
He caught her glance and smiled absently, just as all three SUVs turned into the alley behind Chopin's. The most expensive and trendy club in Manhattan was owned by vampires. Who knew? Although it actually seemed rather appropriate, given the elite club's usual clientele, which consisted of people famous for nothing but the accident of having been born with lots of money to spend on themselves. Unlike those glittering folk, however, who arrived at the front door in full view of the paparazzi, which was the whole point of going to Chopin's, Raphael and his group had detoured around the block to what was apparently a very private entrance. Located in an alley, it was hardly a typical alley entrance. A dark gold awning of some plush and glittering material extended above a single door, with a dark blue carpet runner beneath it. And, rather than the glaring motion sensor lights of the other buildings they'd passed, a subdued, gentle glow picked out the gold in the awning and scattered it into the dark alley. The SUVs pulled to a halt with Raphael's vehicle closest to the entrance. His security personnel debarked first, pouring from the two escort vehicles. Several of the vamps ran off in each direction, obviously to make sure no one was lurking nearby, while the others took up station in a half-circle around the SUV. In the front seat, Juro didn't move, other than to raise his wrist to his mouth a couple of times. He had a radio microphone there, and Sarah noticed he was wearing an earpiece, too. Again, just like the Secret Service guys. Fascinating. With no obvious warning, everyone was suddenly in motion. Jura whipped out of the SUV faster than Sarah could follow. The doors opened on the building side of the vehicle, and at the same moment the back door to the club swung outward in welcome. Unlike his security people, Raphael moved unhurriedly, sliding gracefully out of the SUV and holding out a hand to help Sin, as if she needed it, Sarah thought, smiling. Still, it was sweet the way he waited, the way he kissed Sin's hand and twirled her into the curve of his arm, the two of them laughing. And they certainly made a beautiful couple. Sin in her figure-hugging black-knit dress, those long legs going on forever above a pair of to-die-for stiletto heels, and Raphael with his silk-wool sports coat and slacks over a black cashmere turtleneck. Sarah sighed. Ironic, really, that of all their friends it was cynical Sin who'd fallen for a guy who was obviously a true romantic. Yo, Sarah! Sin's voice interrupted her musings. You coming with us? Sarah looked up and grinned. Now that was the Sin she knew. Yeah, yeah! She scooted across the seat, self-consciously tugging the short skirt of her red silk sheath down over her thighs. It was a beautiful dress. She and Sin had engaged in a little shopping therapy today, wandering all over Manhattan, spending money like they both had it. Sin had pressed Sarah gently about what was troubling her, but she wasn't the type to push too hard. She had too many issues of her own to dig unwanted into someone else's. Instead, they'd shared a very pleasant afternoon, shopping, drinking coffee, gossiping about mutual friends. By the time they returned to the townhouse, Sarah had convinced Sin she was simply homesick after an unexpectedly long winter in a new city. Besides, the day had been the best therapy she could have asked for. She'd spent several carefree hours with a good friend in one of the greatest cities in the world, found this beautiful dress at a terrific price and a pair of gorgeous shoes to match, and hadn't once worried about those damn dreams and now she was about to go dancing at one of the hottest clubs in Manhattan. But there was no way she was going to be able to get out of this stupid truck without flashing everyone in sight. Sin strolled back over to the open SUV door. Come on, I'll block the view. Sarah laughed, touching the running board briefly before stepping onto the surprisingly deep carpet. Nice carpet, she thought too nice to be sitting out in this weather. She was wondering if they'd deployed it just for Raphael when her thoughts stuttered to a halt as every hair on her body suddenly stood on end. 
Her skin prickled almost painfully as something very like a giant electrostatic charge swept over the entire alley. What the hell? she gasped. Sin took her arm, unconcerned. Vamps, she whispered in Sarah's ear. Too many and too strong in one place. They're like super territorial. This is Ryman City. That's Rymond, by the way. But they call him Raj, like Roger. Anyway, it's his city. But Raphael's the more powerful vampire, which means all the security guys are on edge. They have this instinctive drive to protect their masters. No one's really threatening anyone, but it's an automatic reaction. They all brought their power up at the same time just now, but it'll calm down in a minute. Sin. Raphael's deep voice, smooth as honey, called back to them, and Sin hustled them forward to where he waited just outside the club door. Patting Sarah's shoulder, Sin left her to Duncan and stepped up to Raphael, sliding her arm through his and holding her face up for his kiss. His lips lingered over Sin's mouth before he leaned closer and whispered something in her ear, something that made Sin respond with a low, sultry laugh that had every male in hearing range turning his head to look. This must seem odd to you. Sarah glanced over at Duncan. It's kind of like royalty, I guess, huh? Duncan nodded. Just so. Lord Raphael is a visiting prince, or, if one is accurate, closer to a king. There are formalities which must be observed, particularly as this is vampire royalty. A wrong move could result in considerable violence, something we all wish to avoid. Absolutely, Sarah agreed fervently. She had a feeling any violence would be very bad for a certain assistant professor. Next to her, Duncan smiled as if aware of her thoughts. Once we are seated indoors, everyone will settle. Okay. Shall we? He gestured toward the open door where Sin and Raphael had disappeared along with half of their security people. Once inside, they moved quickly down a long hallway and through a small anteroom. She could feel the low throb of a drumbeat from a door to their right, which was upholstered in tuck-and-roll leather. It sounded way too much like a heartbeat to Sarah, but that was probably just her imagination, given present company. The door opened to admit music and laughter, the typical sounds of a club, along with the hum of conversation and the soft chime of crystal. This was, after all, Chopin's, not some neighborhood bar. Sarah found herself hustled along in the middle of the group, moving not so much under her own direction as carried by the general tide of motion. They passed through another leather upholstered door and into some sort of VIP lounge, with a long bar and a surprisingly empty dance floor. There were a few tables against one wall, but it was mostly low-slung open banquettes of black leather, with chrome and glass coffee tables and the occasional freestanding leather chair. There were candles on the tables, but most of the light came from wall sconces, their light beaming toward a dark ceiling where it bounced back to provide subtle shadows. As Sarah observed all of this, she noticed that every eye in the place was on them. The dance floor was empty because everyone was focused with an almost scary intensity on Raphael. And she noticed something else. A lot of those watching were vampires their eyes gleaming in the dark room as they followed the powerful vampire lord's progress. Their gazes were a mixture of fear and desire, as if they didn't know whether to run for their lives or to throw themselves at his feet. A pair of double doors opened briefly on the far wall, admitting a blast of much louder music and raucous noise. And something else. The air pressure dropped sharply, and Sarah would have staggered if Duncan hadn't taken her arm. "'What now?' she muttered. "'Rymond,' Duncan said softly. Chapter 5 Sarah concentrated on breathing as a big vampire headed across the room toward them. 
He was tall like Raphael, but blonde, with close-cut hair and clear blue eyes in a face so stereotypically Slavic he defined the word. High, flat cheekbones, slightly narrow eyes, a strong jaw, and a beautiful smile filled with white teeth. He was dressed in elegant formal wear, a tuxedo jacket and pants, and a crisply white formal shirt with smooth, flat pleats. But the neck of the shirt was open, the top button undone, and the confining black tie was hanging loosely as if he'd just whipped it off. The music was still playing, but what little conversation there had been was now silenced as everyone, human and vampire alike, held their collective breath, waiting to see what would happen next. Sarah looked around quickly, wondering if she should be worried. But Raphael's security seemed unconcerned, or at least no more concerned than they'd been all night, and Sin was leaning casually against Raphael's side. She turned her gaze back to the new arrival and realized there were no fangs in that devastating smile. None of the vamps were flashing visible fang. Probably some sort of protocol thing, like not bringing your guns to the peace table. Rod stopped just short of Raphael's security and gave the massive Juro a grin that managed to be both friendly and challenging at the same time. The pressure against Sarah's chest increased, and she began to wonder if she'd survive the greeting portion of the night, much less whatever came after. Juro didn't react, other than to stand aside, while Raj took a single step forward and bowed slightly. "'My lord.' "'Raymond,' Raphael acknowledged. Obviously vampires didn't waste words, Sarah thought somewhat irritated and wondering how much longer this would take. Her new shoes were spectacular, and the four-inch heels did wonders for her legs, but they were never intended for standing around like this. "'This way, my lord,' Ryman said easily, as if continuing some silent conversation. And maybe he was. She'd heard rumors of vamp telepathic abilities, but hadn't had a chance to ask Sin about it. For that matter, she wasn't sure her friend would have told her even if she'd asked. There were some things Sin volunteered, and others... Well, Sarah could understand that. Sin's first loyalty was to Raphael, after all. And who is this? Sarah looked up and found her gaze neatly captured by a pair of icy blue eyes. A frisson of energy sparked as every nerve in her body suddenly woke up and began to hum happily. She forced herself to move, to offer a handshake. She felt the strength of his fingers as they wrapped around hers, dwarfing her hand. He was not just tall, but big. His shoulders, his upper arms and chest were massive, tapering to narrow hips and muscular thighs and... Oh, my! Sarah had always liked big men. Of course, most men were big compared to her. But she liked big men, the kind who gave off heat, a coiled energy that warned they could spring into action at any moment. There was an air of contained violence to such men, an alpha male arrogance that said they could meet all comers and take every one of them. This, she told herself, was a vampire. Suddenly she understood what Sin had been talking about, what it felt like to have all that power and energy focused on only you. He smiled, a slow, lazy smile that sucked away in a millisecond the little bit of air left in her lungs, leaving her gasping for breath and trying not to show it. Something in his eyes told her he knew it anyway, and she was suddenly struck by vivid images of naked bodies in a darkened room. But no, he'd leave the lights on, so those icy eyes could drink in every tremor of her body as she writhed. Jesus, Sarah, get a grip! Her eyes flashed to his face, and she realized she'd been staring like an idiot when he said in a rich, unhurried voice, Raymond Gregor, Raj to my friends. His words were deep and resonant, 
starting way down in his diaphragm and making the long journey up through that wonderful chest to her ears. His eyes glinted with humor, and Sarah bit her lips against the urge to get even closer to him, to feel that big body wrapped. What was wrong with her? She swallowed hard and managed a presentable smile. I'm Sin's friend, Sarah Stratton, she said, and cursed her pale skin as a blush heated her cheeks. Raj only laughed cheerfully and placed his huge hand at the small of her back. Let's get you seated, sweetheart, he said, propelling her across the floor in Raphael's wake. A vamp Sarah didn't recognize went ahead and held yet another door open for them. Juro disappeared inside this new room briefly, then reappeared and nodded. The room was clearly reserved for very private parties. It was furnished much like the VIP lounge they'd crossed through, but the leather was softer, the tables burnished steel rather than chrome, and the glass tops thicker and polished to a gleaming finish. Raphael and Sin strolled over to the largest of the banquette-like sofas, an open curve of black leather against the wall, with a low glass coffee table sitting in front of it. They settled next to each other while Duncan took a leather barrel chair facing Raphael across the table. Sarah sat on the other side of Sin, studiously ignoring the wicked grin Raj sent her way, promising a dangerous evening ahead. She tucked herself against the soft leather and pretended to care about the decor. The space was small enough that it felt warm and intimate rather than isolated, a feeling that was enhanced by the wall of glass facing the VIP lounge. Sarah remembered seeing it as a black lacquered wall from the lounge side. From in here, however, it was a slightly opaque glass providing a clear view of everything going on in the larger room. Speakers suddenly came to life, bringing in sound, the music and the buzz of voices as the club guests, human and vampire, resumed their interrupted festivities. A full bar lined one wall, and Sarah saw row upon row of the finest labels of various alcoholic beverages, many of which she recognized from her parents' wet bar. Of course, that was long ago, before the dreams, and what came afterward. She forced the memory aside, focusing instead on the sterling silver champagne bucket waiting on the polished mahogany counter, with what looked like a nicely chilled bottle of Cru Grand Cuvée. She could already feel the bubbles against her tongue. But wait, did vampires drink? Other than blood, that is? Raj was still standing, one hand resting on the back of the sofa. We have a full bar here, my lord, Raj said, answering her unvoiced question. Danny. He gestured to the vamp who'd opened the door for them. He was tall and slender, smoothly handsome, with a mocha complexion and an elaborate tattoo that wound around his neck before disappearing into his shirt. He nodded when Raj said his name, smiling at her with the assurance of a man who knew women found him attractive. Danny, Raj continued, can get anything you'd like. If it's not in here, we certainly carry it at the main bar. And, of course, there's blood available in whatever form you prefer. He caught Sarah's eye when he said that, holding her gaze for a moment before letting his eyes travel along her body like a warm caress, over her breasts and down her bare legs to her high, high heels and back up again. She shuddered slightly under the impact of his inspection, and he smiled confidently. Danny wasn't the only vampire in the room who knew women liked him. Sarah resisted the urge to tug her skirt down and wondered absently if vampires ran in packs, like all of Raj's vampires were lady killers, while all of Raphael's were the strong, silent type, like he was. Of course, Raphael's people were in hostile territory, so that was probably part of it. But Raj just seemed younger somehow, more carefree. Raphael carried an air of tremendous authority, a confidence that no one would ever dare cross him. She didn't think anyone would ever cross Raj, either. 
but it was because he looked damned dangerous. She saw Raphael whisper something in Sin's ear. Her friend sighed in annoyance, but she stood, pulling Sarah up with her. Come on, Sarah, she said, scooting around the glass table. We womenfolk have been banished to the bar while the big bads discuss serious business. Sarah glanced at Raphael, but his attention was on Sin, his eyes shining silver, his lips curved into a gentle smile. Thank you, Ruby Maya, he said. Sin blew out a dismissive breath, but grinned at him before dragging Sarah over to the bar where a glass of delicious champagne was waiting with her name on it. Raj watched the two women as they crossed the floor and climbed up onto the high bar stools. He had to admit Raphael's woman Cynthia was stunning. But she was like an exotic animal, something wild and lovely and totally unpredictable. He had a feeling she'd be a hellion in bed, but a lot of work out of it. Too much work for Raj's taste. Her friend Sarah, on the other hand, was something else. It was obvious she felt outclassed by the strikingly beautiful Cynthia, but that was a shame, because she was a lovely woman in her own right. If she were to walk through the room outside that door, the eye of every vampire would follow each tiny movement of that tight little ass. She was shorter than Sin, maybe five foot four without those heels, but half of that was legs, and the rest was all lush curves. She'd covered her breast with the red silk of her dress, but she filled it out nicely. Nicely enough that he already knew what it would taste like when he put his mouth on those firm nipples he could see pressing against the straining fabric. She scooted back on the bar stool, tossing her long blonde hair over one shoulder and crossing her legs with a hiss of smooth skin. Raj felt himself growing hard in anticipation. Raymond. Raj blinked back into instant attention. My lord. He sat on the leather sofa, twisting slightly to face the vampire lord. Duncan nudged the low table aside and moved his chair closer so the three of them could converse. You wanted a meeting, Raphael said. Raj studied him silently for a moment. His next words could very possibly condemn him if Raphael was his enemy. Raj had power, enough to defeat his own master when and if he decided to take that step. But he had no illusions about his ability to defeat Raphael, and he couldn't be certain where the vampire lord stood when it came to his fellow council members. On the other hand, Raj trusted Duncan, insofar as he trusted any vampire who wasn't of his own making, and Duncan had encouraged this conversation. You were at the council meeting last fall, my lord, Raj said to Raphael. You saw that Lord Kristoff is not what he once was. He weakens, and the entire Northeast weakens with him. Already vampires are siring their own children without permission, building private fiefdoms within the territory. Raphael frowned. I hadn't known it was that bad. But you knew something was wrong. I suspected. Raj sighed inwardly. Conversation among powerful vampires was like swimming through mud. There was no clear path and too many unseen hazards. Every word became a weapon, and what was left unsaid often conveyed far more than what was said. On the other hand, boldness was a virtue. Time runs out, my lord, even for vampires. I need to know if you intend to remain neutral, as you have in the South. And why would I not? Because Kristoff did you a favor once. Did he? Kristoff has told me, my lord, of how you arrived in this country, how you came to his court and he permitted you to travel through to the West Coast to establish your own territory. Raphael's black gaze focused sharply on Raj. He bared his teeth in a slow smile, seeming genuinely amused, but there was nothing friendly about it. 
Do you really believe he could have stopped me, Raymond? Raj swallowed his irritation, sorting his own truth from his master's fantasies. No, he answered evenly. No, my lord, but Kristoff believes it, and he might call upon you if he felt threatened. I wondered if you might have a lingering fondness for him that would respond. My interest is in stability. If Kristoff is unable to maintain his territory, it endangers us all. Raj nodded, figuring that was the best answer he was going to get. He was surprised when Raphael kept talking. I have long felt there should be more cooperation among the territories, he said calmly, crossing his legs and smoothing away invisible wrinkles. It occurs to me that you and I have much in common. My lord? A certain outlook, Raymond. A practical approach to doing business. He met Raj's gaze directly. Should the occasion ever arise, I believe it would benefit us both, and the vampire population at large, if we were to... consult in the future. Jesus Christ! Raphael was not only giving his tacit approval for Raj to overthrow Kristoff, he was proposing a fucking alliance. With Raj ruling the Northeast and Raphael the entire West, they would go a long way toward controlling the vampire population of North America. The other council lords would scream bloody murder if they knew. The lords never cooperated in anything— it made doing business with each other almost impossible. But if he and Raphael— What do you think of the South? Raphael continued casually, as if he hadn't just dropped a political bomb in Raj's lap. It's hot and sticky, Raj said, grinning. But I doubt that's what you had in mind. Raphael gave a bare smile. I was surprised when Anthony seized control, Raj continued in a more serious vein. I thought he was content with New Orleans. He was, Duncan confirmed. Jabril let him run New Orleans however he wanted, as long as he paid tribute. But then the hurricane wiped out half of his holdings and more than half of his people. That many, Raj said in surprise. At least— Duncan said, nodding. He's being very cagey about the specific numbers, but it's no secret he wouldn't have gone for the territory otherwise. Raj frowned thoughtfully. I don't know Anthony that well, but I wouldn't have judged him to have the juice to hold the territory for long. Raphael shrugged. Anthony required certain assistance, particularly with regard to Jabril's rather convoluted finances. One of my own, Jacqueline, is quite skilled in such matters and is remaining in the South for the time being. Raj kept his expression blank as he glanced between Duncan and Raphael, surprised again by the bluntness of their conversation. Raphael had all but said outright that Anthony was only able to hold his territory because of Raphael's backing— was this meant to be proof of Raphael's new policy of cooperation? As you said, my lord, Raj said finally, nodding at Raphael. Stability is the goal for all of us. It would be unsettling, to say the least, if the South were to suffer another loss so soon. Yes, Raphael agreed. His eyes raised to follow the progress of his mate, who had left her perch by the bar and was now returning to the banquette. Lubimaya, he said. Time's up, handsome, she responded, taking his hand and pulling him to his feet. I want to dance. She gestured toward the VIP lounge through the glass wall. The dance floor had filled once again with writhing bodies, some of which were actually dancing. My lord, Raj said, standing up next to Raphael, I can drop the window entirely if you prefer. Perfect, Cynthia decided. Let's join this party. Raj glanced at Raphael, who gave a minute shrug and then nodded. 
Raj signaled over his shoulder to Danny, who reached under the bar and hit the controls, causing the wall of smoky glass to slide down into a pocket beneath the floor. The music and noise crashed in on them, along with the smell of marijuana, human sweat, and cologne. The lounge was in full swing, the humans intoxicated by more than just the free-flowing alcohol. These VIP rooms existed in every one of Raj's clubs for one purpose only, and that was blood. Like the blood houses maintained by Kristoff in Buffalo or by Raphael in L.A., the VIP lounges brought together hungry vampires and their willing human donors, who offered blood from the vein in exchange for a mind-blowing sexual experience and the illusion of dancing with death itself. Every human who walked through those double doors signed a legal waiver and release, and the whole thing was captured on security video as proof of willing participation, should it ever come to that. As recently as a hundred years ago, the vampires simply took what they needed. Now they had lawyers and forms in triplicate, just like everyone else. By this time of night, or morning, all pretense dropped. Vampire and human were coming together in shadowed corners, on the dance floor, or, if a couple preferred privacy, in one of several private rooms in the back. The scent of arousal was everywhere, along with the powerful and seductive influence of several dozen vampires on the hunt. Raj inhaled deeply and cast his eye on sweet little Sarah. Sarah watched Raphael twirl a laughing sin out onto the floor. They disappeared almost instantly in the crowd, as if they'd somehow pulled a curtain of shadow around themselves. She frowned, trying to see, but it was dark out there, the light seeming to shift almost constantly, making it difficult to focus on any one thing. She caught a brief glimpse of a couple on one of the leather couches and blinked in surprise, Maybe there was a good reason the lights were so low. She blushed and looked away quickly, only to find Raj staring at her from across the room. Her eyes widened and her heart raced, and she suddenly felt like a bunny beneath the gaze of something fierce and hungry and fully capable of swallowing her whole. Raj smiled that slow, lazy grin and started toward her with the loose-hipped prowl of a born predator, his eyes, the gleaming blue of a deep glacier, pinning her in place. He held out his hand as he drew closer. Come, little one, dance with me. Every nerve in her body trilled with excitement and screamed, Yes! But she scowled at him irritably. Little one? Not in this lifetime. My name is Sarah, she corrected firmly. Raj laughed, warm and sexy and full of intimate knowledge, as if they'd been lovers for years. Very well, he agreed. He took her hand and pulled her from the high bar stool, an arm circling her waist when she would have stumbled at the sudden movement. Dance with me, little Sarah he whispered against her ear. Sarah shivered involuntarily. She knew she should say no. He was an arrogant bastard who thought that charming grin could get him any woman he wanted. She knew she should thank him nicely, climb back onto that ridiculous bar stool, and get drunk on expensive champagne. But before her brain could formulate the words, her body decided for her leaning into him as he led her toward the other room. The music changed as they neared the dance floor, becoming soft and sensuous, slow and delicious. Sarah was swept into Raj's embrace, feeling small and delicate against his broad, muscled chest, circled by his strong arms. Even with her heel, she didn't come up to his shoulder, but he didn't slouch like some men did, or pick her up bodily and drag her around the dance floor, either. He took the fingers of her right hand, curled them into his left, and held them close to his heart, then dropped his other hand low on her back, his fingers drifting a little bit lower still. He exerted the slightest pressure, and their bodies were touching, her breasts against his chest, 
his hips against her belly. Sarah looked up as they moved out among the other couples and met those beautiful blue eyes. Put your arm around me, little one, he murmured. Dance with me. Sarah narrowed her eyes at the endearment, but slid her left hand over his impossibly broad chest before letting it curl around his waist. There you go. He bent his head closer and began to sway gently to the music. You smell delicious, he whispered. She smiled at the blatant double entendre and found herself relaxing, truly relaxing for the first time in months, maybe even years. She closed her eyes, letting her head rest against his deep chest, letting the flow of his even breathing lull her gently, the steady rhythm of his heart beating beneath her ear. They moved easily through the densely packed dance floor, circling around until they were nearly hidden in the dark recesses of an empty alcove, the soft velvet of a black curtain against the back wall, drinking in and absorbing the dim light from the crowded lounge. Sarah felt Raj's hand slide lower until it rested on the swell of her ass, felt his fingers press harder until there wasn't even the smallest space between them. She felt his breath against her skin as he bent his head to kiss her temple, the wet warmth of his tongue as it teased the curve of her ear. She shivered as he kissed the sensitive skin below her ear, tracing the line of her jugular until he stopped and sucked gently not breaking the skin, just gliding his tongue in a circle as if marking the spot. She could feel the smooth brush of his fangs against her neck, the hard length of his cock against her belly. She raised her arms, wrapping them under his shoulders and around his back, pressing herself closer, rubbing herself against his arousal. Raj chuckled softly. So eager, little one. Sarah heard herself moan softly, a sound so full of sensual hunger she couldn't believe it had come from her own throat. Raj responded, growling as he lifted her easily, spinning her around and pinning her against the wall. His hand slipped beneath the silk of her dress, pushing it up her thigh and over her hip. Her arms circling his neck once again, she hooked her bare leg around his hip and urged him closer, wanting to feel him between her legs. Raj lifted her leg higher across his back, sliding his hand under her thigh and into the wetness between her legs, pushing aside the soaked triangle of her silken thong. Sarah cried out as his thick finger slid easily into her slick folds, penetrating deep inside her, stretching her, preparing her for the full thickness of the cock she could feel growing ever harder, ever longer. Sarah. Sarah blinked and froze, suddenly terrified, wondering where... Sarah. Rod repeated, his fingers lifting her chin gently. She blushed hotly and stepped back, putting space between them, feeling the heat of her own arousal, the wetness between her legs. Anger flashed through her, and she glared up at him. "'Are you all right?' he asked solicitously. She drew a deep breath, certain he'd done something to her, but he seemed truly concerned, and she didn't want to embarrass herself by accusing him of— She swallowed hard, trying desperately to forget the feeling of his mouth, his— "'Oh, God!' They weren't in some hidden alcove. They were still on the dance floor. Had that all been in her head? It's probably jet lag, she said weakly. Come on, he persisted. I think you need to sit down. He took her hand in his strong fingers, and she felt a renewed flush of desire, remembering exactly what those fingers had felt like between... Her legs were shaking when Raj lifted her onto the bar stool. Here you go, he said, handing her the tall champagne flute. Take a sip. You'll feel better. Better? Was he mad? If she felt any better, she'd be a puddle of needy goo on the floor. 
Thank you, she said, took a small sip and closed her eyes, feeling the bubbles tickle all the way down her throat. Tell me where we were, he murmured against her ear, what we were doing. Her eyes shot open and then narrowed suspiciously. I don't know what you mean. Yes, you do. He smiled teasingly. You whispered my name. I did not. He laughed, a purely masculine sound, full of confident sexuality. You've never been to a bloodhouse before, have you? He asked. What's a bloodhouse? Raj lifted his chin, gesturing toward the dance floor. This, sweetheart, blood and sex for the taking and the giving. Ooh, she said, and felt her face heating with renewed embarrassment. I didn't know. I'm sorry. I don't apologize, he said cheerfully. I quite enjoyed it. She looked up at him quickly, wondering what nothing happened, Sarah. You just sort of drifted away while we were dancing. I'd be insulted. He lowered his voice. But since you were dreaming about me... Sarah gave him a disgusted look. You know, Raj continued, his amusement obvious. I get to Buffalo every once in a while. Maybe we'll meet again. Maybe not. Ah, now, stranger things have happened. Not to me, she muttered. She flashed suddenly on her dreams of tormented women and shuddered, knowing that wasn't quite true. Raj frowned and moved closer, putting one of his huge hands on her arm. Are you cold, sweetheart? She felt inexplicable tears pressing against the back of her eyes and lowered her head so he wouldn't see, focusing on the glass of champagne she was still holding. I'm fine. She lied. Just tired. I'm not usually up this late. I live a very boring life in Buffalo. We'll have to change that then, won't we? Sarah took another sip of her now warm champagne and wondered what it was she really wanted. Back in Buffalo, all she'd wanted was for things to return to the way they were, the way they'd been before the dreams came back. But now... She heard Sin and Raphael returning from the dance floor, heard them laughing with each other as they settled back onto the banquette, and she felt the solid presence of Raj standing next to her, the comfort of having a protector, even for a short time, someone who stood between her and the rest of the cold world. And suddenly she wasn't sure what she wanted at all. The next night, Sarah opened the door of the big SUV and jumped out, walking around the back where one of Raphael's vamps was waiting with her small rolling suitcase and the hanging bag with the new red dress in it. She took the bag and draped it over her arm, running a hand down the nylon cover as if stroking the dress beneath it. She glanced at Sin, who was waiting to say goodbye. I'll probably never wear this again, she said wistfully. There's always the faculty Christmas party. My colleagues would have apoplexy, and their wives would be convinced I'm trying to steal their pale, chubby husbands away from them. Sin laughed. Sounds like a lovely bunch. I'll have to visit sometime. Sarah added her own laughter. You'd die of boredom before you ever got out of the airport. She looked up and met her friend's green eyes. Thanks, Sin. I had a great time. Sin studied her for a minute. You call me, Sarah. If you need anything, you call me, okay? Even if it's just a friendly voice. I will. She hugged Sin, then grabbed the handle of her overnight case. I gotta get going or I'll miss my flight. Take care. Sin kissed her cheek before walking back around and sliding into the SUV. Sarah stopped to wave awkwardly around her baggage and saw Raphael's arm circle Sin's shoulder and pull her close, as if even that few minutes apart had been too much. She stood and watched until they were gone, then trudged into the terminal as the automatic doors whisked open in front of her. 
She had a life waiting for her back in Buffalo. Maybe not the one she would have chosen. Maybe not even the one she'd planned when she took the job there. But at least they didn't lock her up at night. Not yet, anyway. Chapter 6 So what did he say? Raj rested his elbows on the rooftop railing, ignoring the question to gaze moodily at the busy Manhattan street thirty-five stories below. He leaned forward and stared intently, thinking he'd seen a woman in a red dress. He laughed at himself. Sarah Stratton was long gone, back to her books and her classrooms. She'd been right about one thing. He'd probably never see her again. Which would be a shame, he decided, and immediately wondered why he'd thought that. Raj? He turned a cool look on his persistent club manager. How's the new club doing, Santos? Great. We're picking up all the overflow from Chopin's, plus even more with the new location. But we gotta talk about this other thing, Raj. You want to talk to someone? Get a therapist. Damn it, I thought— Santos's next words were cut off as Raj grabbed him by the throat and lifted him off his feet. Do we have a problem, Santos? Santos tried to answer, but could only gurgle wordlessly. Raj opened his hand and let him fall to the ground, where he remained, crouched on all fours and coughing furiously. Forgive me, master, Santos finally choked out. Raj gave him a dismissive glance. Get the fuck out of my sight. Santos started to stand, but one look at Raj had him crawling the several feet to the stairway door before dragging himself up to stumble down the stairs. Raj scowled, listening to the metallic racket of the vamp's footsteps fade away. He returned to his perusal of the street below with a disgusted curse. I hate that fucking vampire shit, he said. But you do it so well. The woman's voice was laced with amusement. She strolled out of the shadows to lean over the rail, joining him in his contemplation of the faraway traffic. He was only asking the question we all want answered, you know. It's been two nights since Raphael left, and you still haven't said a word. We're curious. You too, M. Raj's lieutenant shrugged. Me especially. Raj sighed. You're all so eager. Maybe one of you should take on Kristoff instead. Emily laughed. It was a low, sensuous sound. He'd eat me alive. You're the only one, Raj, and we all know it. She glanced over and away before reversing to brace her back against the cold metal. What if I don't do it? Raj asked quietly. What if I decide not to get rid of the old man? She gave another graceful shrug. I'm yours, Raj, body and soul. You made me, you own me. My loyalty is yours, whether you stick with what you've got or take on Kristoff and the whole Northeast. She paused to lean closer. But I'm also your friend. And as a friend, I need to understand what's going on so I know whether or not to be worried. You and I both know that Kristoff can't last much longer. If you don't take him out, someone else will, and then we'll have a fight on our hands because whoever it is will want this city for himself. Kristoff might be content to fester in Buffalo, but no one else will be. Raj studied the beautiful woman who'd somehow had the strength to become his lieutenant in the dog-eat-dog -dog world of vampire politics. She'd meant what she'd said about being his friend, and her loyalty touched him somewhere he didn't want to admit to. You know, he said, Raphael told me right out that he thought Kristoff had lost it. So did Duncan. Emily's face showed her surprise. I thought those guys played it closer to the vest. Yeah, 
it gets better. He offered me an alliance once I take the territory. Excuse me? Raj laughed. That was pretty much my reaction, too. He wasn't that blunt, of course, but the meaning was pretty damn clear. M absorbed this new information. Well, she said finally, you are the obvious choice. I mean, if he thinks Kristoff needs to go, you're stronger than anyone out there, and you know the territory. Yeah, Raj sighed. And I'm sure as hell not going to stand back and let someone else move in on us, so I guess. His cell phone rang, playing a distinctive tune that could only mean one thing. Fuck, he swore and yanked the phone out of his pocket. My lord, he answered. Raymond, his sire, the vampire lord Kristoff, said silkily, How did the visit go? Quite well, my lord. Excellent. You can tell me all about it when you get here. My lord. Some things come up, Raymond. I'll need you in Buffalo for a time. Raj frowned, wondering what the old man was up to. Kristoff had given Raj the rich territory around New York City for a reason. It kept him happy and far away from Buffalo. Sure, the old man was curious about Raphael's visit, but they could have handled that on the phone. So why was he being called back now? Something, my lord, he asked. Something rather ugly. What does that you'll find out when you get here? Raj was tempted to ask what kind of trouble could possibly have come up in fucking Buffalo that the old man's usual flunkies couldn't handle. But that flirted too closely with rebellion, and he wasn't ready to show his hand yet. Very well, my lord. He ground out through clenched teeth. I can fly at first dusk tomorrow. Fly tonight, Raymond. My lord, you have a private jet. Kristoff's voice turned petulant. Use it. I'll see you an hour after sunset tomorrow, and I'll expect a full report on your visitor. The old man hung up. Fuck. Emily just looked at him. Her vampire hearing would have given her both sides of the conversation, enough to understand Raj's anger. We're going to Buffalo? Not we. I need you here. I don't trust anyone but my own, and besides, I don't want Kristoff knowing about you yet. Not officially. He might be senile, but he's not blind. You can't go there alone, Raj. At least take a few of the guards with— I am capable of defending myself, Emily. Besides, I'm not supposed to have guards. He's got to know you're making your own. His spies... His spies can report anything they want. But if I show up surrounded by my own children, he'll have to do something about it. I'm not ready to push him yet. I'll go alone. Call the airport and get the jet prepped. He calculated the remaining hours of darkness and swore softly. Damn that old man. And tell them I'm on my way. Chapter 7 Buffalo, New York It was cold. So cold. Regina shivered in her thin jacket, wishing she'd worried more about staying warm when she'd dress for Katie's bachelorette party and less about looking good. Note to self, next time you get kidnapped, wear a decent coat. Her desperate chuckle became a sob of terror as the heavy metal door clanged open once more, sending tremors through the concrete floor. She pushed herself back against the wall, feeling the hard chill of the metal bed frame low against her back. She'd heard someone crying again last night. 
A cell door had clanged open, and she'd been so grateful it wasn't her they were coming for, so desperately glad she wasn't the one crying, begging. She jumped at the sound of metal on metal, close in the darkness. Her door opened, and dim light fell in from the corridor, piercingly bright to her eyes which had grown used to the near-total darkness of her cell. A man filled the narrow doorway, a dark silhouette with wide shoulders and a square head, eyes gleaming in the faint light. She scrambled off the bed and into a corner, tucking her knees to her chest, her whole body shaking with the force of her pounding heart. She clamped her lips tight, refusing to make a sound. I know you're there, little girl. You can't hide from me. A cry of dismay escaped her lips, and she heard herself sobbing just like the others, pleading. No, please, she whispered, staring up at him. Not me. Her protest crumbled as he drew closer, as his eyes bored into hers, clouding her mind with something sticky and warm. The light from the hallway faded until there was nothing but his eyes, his will, his desire. He reached for her, and somewhere deep inside she screamed. Sarah rolled out of bed, not even stopping to turn on the lights in a blind dash for the bathroom. She fell to her knees and threw up, her stomach heaving uncontrollably as she gripped the sides of the toilet bowl, gasping for breath. Tears rolled down her cheeks, and she begged silently, "'Not again! Please, God, not again!' She huddled on the floor next to the cold porcelain, her stomach empty, her throat burning. Repulsed by the smell, she slammed a seat down, reached up, and flushed. Pushing back against the wall, she levered herself up to sit on the closed lid and turned on the water in the sink, splashing her overheated face, ignoring the water that spilled over the sides and onto the linoleum tiles. She grabbed a towel from the rack and covered her face leaning forward until her forehead touched her knees. It was all so familiar. The isolation, the cold, every heartbeat like a bass drum against her ribcage, every breath as loud as a bellows in the dead silence of her captivity. Teresa Bracco, the teenager from West L.A., and Julie Seaborn, a mother of two from Hollywood, and the others— the nameless others who'd haunted her dreams, the ones she'd tried to ignore. She remembered them all. And she remembered what had happened when she went to her parents for help. The institution they'd sent her to was more of a boarding school than an asylum, except for the locks on the doors. She'd been fifteen years old when she walked through those doors, and she hadn't walked out again until her eighteenth birthday when, as an adult under California law, she'd fled her parents' tender care and reinvented herself. A new name, a new city, a new life. College, graduate school, a job. Just like everyone else. No one knew who she really was. No one. Not even her good friend Sin knew the truth about Sarah Stratton. There was nothing to distinguish her from the millions of people who went to the office or to school, who worked hard and slept safe in their beds every night. And that was just the way Sarah wanted it. But now the dreams were back, and with them had come the memories of all the women who'd cried in her nightmares and now lurked like ghosts, half seen in the corners of her mind. She stood and opened the mirrored cabinet, taking out her toothbrush and toothpaste with quick, determined movements. She couldn't do this again, she decided firmly. She wouldn't do it again. This wasn't some docudrama on television. This was her life. The years of working two jobs to put herself through college and graduate school, piecing herself together from scratch, from nothing. Helpless, frustrated tears filled her eyes. She let them come until she was nearly choking on toothpaste. She spit sloppily into the sink and rinsed her mouth, then forced herself upright. 
she gazed into the mirror, seeing the pink and gold reflection of sunrise just visible between the slats of her mini-blinds. And she couldn't help wondering if Regina was looking at the same sunrise, if that damp basement had a window somewhere, a taunting shred of freedom for her and the others, the ones she could hear crying in the dark. Chapter 8 Raj made a sharp turn down the alley without slowing, feeling the rear end of his big BMW sedan fishtailing slightly on the slippery pavement. It was that time of year in Buffalo when the weather couldn't decide if it was winter or spring, when one day could bring a last-ditch snowstorm and the next a quick melt that might freeze overnight into slick ice. It was one of the reasons he hated this town. Too cold, too wet, too windy, and too goddamn dead, even for a vampire. He punched the remote attached to the car's visor as soon as he made the turn. By the time he reached the garage, the door was fully open, and he slid the big sedan into the narrow space, closing the door behind him before he'd even turned off the engine. He was cutting it too damn close and knew it. He should have stayed put at the airport, but he hated sleeping in a public place, even a well-guarded one. He never felt really safe unless he was behind his own door with his own security. He'd known too many vampires who had trusted others and were no longer around to bemoan their foolishness. The garage was mostly dark inside, but that was no problem. Vampires could see as well in dark as light, maybe even better. In the dark, one saw only what was necessary— by lamplight, one could be distracted by beauty or whimsy. Feeling poetic tonight, Raj. He grunted at his own idle thoughts. It was more morning than night by now. He had only moments to get inside or he'd be sleeping on the garage floor next to his car, and there was nothing poetic about that. The interior door closed behind him with a heavy thud, locks sliding home automatically. He walked directly to the security panel, rearming it with his thumbprint and a six-digit code. His buffalo lair was in a small warehouse, fifty feet on a side and nearly three stories high, echoing in its emptiness and lit only by the green glow of the alarm panel's LED. This was his private place, a place even Kristoff didn't know about. Raj might hate this city— but he came here far more often than the vampire lord was aware. He crossed the bare concrete floor to a short stairway running down below ground level. Ten steps, a turn, and five more steps, and there was another heavy door, another security panel, a different six-digit code, and the door cracked open with a rush of warmer air. Rod shouldered the vault-like hatch open, letting its own weight swing it shut behind him, there was light here, a dim golden glow that rose up automatically to touch the otherwise dark furnishings and bring out the ruby depths of a burgundy carpet. The room was spacious, covering two-thirds the square footage of the warehouse above. A huge custom-made bed dominated to the left, linens neatly tucked in by Raj himself the last time he spent the night here. To each side of the bed was a table of dark mahogany, and against the wall a suede headboard the color of old blood. A matching sofa and two black leather chairs were situated to the right, next to a fully stocked wet bar. Contrary to legend, vampires could both eat and drink, although they gained no nutrition from it and the food had little taste. Booze, on the other hand, tasted every bit as good as it always had. It might not have the same kick— but for a man born and raised in Poland, the taste of vodka was as natural as breathing. Which was another thing the legends got wrong. Raj was as alive and breathing as any human walking the streets in daylight, with a few very useful enhancements. He would have enjoyed a shot of ice-cold vodka right about now. Unfortunately, getting to the small airport outside Manhattan had taken longer than it should have, 
and despite the short flight, the sun was already bursting over the horizon. He could feel the urgency of the coming day in every cell of his body. Eventually, he would succumb to its effect. The legends got that part right. But he was old enough and strong enough to resist the fall into unconsciousness for a while. He deliberately took his time, checking the security panel and entering a final code to lock down both the warehouse above and this room. He was kicking off his boots when daylight finally began to suck away his awareness. With his last threads of consciousness, he stumbled to the bed, ripped off the rest of his clothes, and pulled back the covers. The last thing he felt was the slide of crisp, clean sheets against his bare skin. Chapter 9 Sarah nodded her thanks to the barista as she grabbed her latte and eased her way through the caffeine-starved morning crowd back outside the café. The cold air hit her like a wall after the heat inside, and she shivered slightly, pulling her coat closed with one hand, being careful not to spill the hot drink. The weather had been nice enough recently that the café had resurrected the umbrella tables from winter storage, and she dropped onto one of the cold metal chairs, thankful for the heavy wool of her coat. She pulled out her copy of the local newspaper, the Buffalo News. It wasn't the New York Times, but if one wanted local news, this was the newspaper of record. And what Sarah was looking for was very much local news. She sipped her drink and flipped open the paper, nearly choking when she saw the front page. She snapped the newspaper closed and sat back in her chair. Deliberately lifting her cup, she took a sip, and then another, watching the cars drive by on Elmwood, watching mothers with their babies in giant strollers maneuver through the door of the café to congregate in a far corner inside and trade stories of dirty diapers and sleepless nights. Her eyes wandered to a park across the street, where a swing set waited forlornly, its seats hanging empty on their heavy chains, one of them a baby seat, its safety enclosure tilting unevenly, the chain kinked somewhere above. The cold spring air stung her lungs as she drew a deep breath and put her cup down on the table, resting her hand on the folded paper for a moment, her eyes closed in resignation. She sighed and opened both her eyes and the paper. The story was on the front page below the fold, along with a black-and-white photo of a pretty girl with curly black hair, a thin face, and the smile of a child who knew she was loved. Sarah stared at that smile and wondered what it looked like by now. Patricia Beverly Cowens, called Trish, the article said, 18, and a first-year student at the university. She'd attended a party on Sunday night, two nights ago, and hadn't been seen since. Sarah frowned and thought back. Her first dream had been nearly a week ago, long before Trish disappeared. She'd never known for sure, but she'd always believed her dreams happened in real time. And now, reading about Trish Cowan, she was sure of it. In her dream last night, Regina had... Sarah didn't even know what to call it. How do you describe being in someone else's head, someone else's nightmare? Regina had remembered hearing her abductor bring in someone new, a new victim, on what could easily have been Sunday. Sarah fisted her hands against the desire to pound the table. If he had taken Trish, did that mean it was already too late for Regina? Please, she begged any gods who might be listening. Please don't let Regina be dead. She closed her eyes against a nearly overwhelming despair. I can't do this, she thought desperately. Not again. But she had to, didn't she? Because there was no one else. Feeling fate laughing over her shoulder, she picked up the paper again. The police commissioner himself had presided over the press conference, which struck her as odd until she read further and discovered who Trish's father was. William Cowens, self-made billionaire, friend to presidents and movie stars. 
In a perverted way, she thought bitterly, it was lucky Trish was the latest victim. Not for Trish, of course, but for the others, because Trish's father had the influence to make things happen. Sarah continued reading. As usual, the police were very circumspect in what information they released. Sarah had hoped for some mention of Regina, some confirmation that there were other women missing. But it wasn't there. So maybe this was an isolated case. Maybe someone had kidnapped Trish for ransom, or even that hefty reward her daddy was offering. Maybe Sarah herself was seeing serial killers where they didn't exist, and Regina was just a figment of her imagination, a function of too much stress and too little sleep. It was possible, wasn't it? She sighed. What did it mean when she didn't even believe her own rationalizations anymore? She skimmed through the rest of the article, stuttering to a halt when she saw the name of Cowens's spokesman. She stared at the words, unable to believe what she was seeing. What were the chances, she wondered. Edward Blackwood, one of the few people who could connect Sarah Stratton to a young teenager from California. And he was here in Buffalo. Not that Blackwood's presence was surprising, given William Cowens's net worth. Blackwood was a prodigious fundraiser for Humanity Realized, which was the institute he'd founded for the announced purpose of facilitating the achievement of full human potential, whatever the hell that was. He'd been interested in Sarah once upon a time, had offered her parents a full college scholarship in exchange for her cooperation. Unfortunately for him, her parents didn't want his money. What they wanted, and what no one, not even humanity realized, could give them, was a normal daughter, one who didn't channel traumatized women in her sleep. Sarah only knew she didn't want to be anybody's lab rat, especially not Edward Blackwood's. And now he was here, just as her dreams were starting again. His participation in the case vastly complicated Sarah's life. If she'd been wary of getting involved before, his presence clinched it. She wanted no part of him or the tabloids that reported on his every movement. She would have laughed if it hadn't been so tragic. The one person guaranteed to believe her dreams, and he was the one man she wanted nothing to do with. She stood abruptly, throwing her half-full latte into the trash container and the paper after it. She strode down the sidewalk toward her office, determination in every step. She had a class to teach, a life to live. The police were investigating. They didn't need Sarah and her dreams. The faculty parking lot was only half full that afternoon as Sarah headed back to her car, deftly sidestepping the puddle of ice melt she'd somehow managed to park right next to. The day's early promise of sunshine had come through, and even now the air felt almost warm. She lifted her face to the weak sunlight and wished she could just take off, maybe drive into the countryside, stop for a sandwich and sit at a picnic table, enjoying this first real sign of spring, because she was pretty sure it wouldn't last. There were apparently no halfways in this part of the country. You were either freezing your ass off or melting into a big, steaming puddle. Stop complaining, Stratton. You have a job, don't you? Sometimes she felt guilty about that. So many of her friends from grad school were struggling to make a go of it, people with families and obligations, while she had snagged a tenure-track position at a decent university. Jobs like this were hard to find anymore, but even so, she sometimes wondered what she was doing here. It wasn't that she didn't enjoy teaching. She did, although she knew most of her students viewed her classes as a necessary evil, something to fill out a breadth requirement on their way to whatever career they'd chosen, law school for too many of them, like the world needed a whole new batch of lawyers every year. And it wasn't that she didn't enjoy the research part of it. She loved history, loved discovering obscure bits of knowledge about people and events long past. 
What she didn't enjoy was doing the kind of research that would gain her tenure. The footnotes and the literature reviews, the presentations and the conferences, with their incumbent glad-handing and ass-kissing. And academic politics were a world all to themselves, backbiting elevated to the finest of arts. She crossed the boundary between the walkway and the parking lot, her brain registering the change in texture beneath the soles of her sturdy, flat-heeled boots. She remembered her red dress from the weekend, with the skinny little high heels that Raj had so openly admired. When the hell did I start wearing sturdy boots? She wondered with a sigh. Probably the first time she'd fallen on her ass in the wet snow. But whenever it was, spring was here and it was time to stop. Tomorrow she was wearing her heels again. Good afternoon, Professor Stratton. Sarah jolted out of her thoughts and turned with a smile for her best and perhaps only friend on campus. And a fine afternoon to you as well, Professor Huffman. You're far away from your usual haunts. Linda Huffman had a temporary appointment in art history, courtesy of her husband Sam, who was something of a star in the art department. That's because I'm looking for you. You're coming to Sam's birthday on Thursday night, right? And don't give me any excuses about work, she added, anticipating Sarah's response. The break starts Friday, so I expect you to show up and get drunk like the rest of us. Linda, I really and bring a date. Right. Where do I find one of those again? Foolish girl. It would help if you'd say yes once in a while. Look at you. I know you get offers. In fact, my cousin Tony was asking about you a couple weeks ago after my mother's birthday party. Seeing the look on Sarah's face, she rushed ahead saying, Don't worry, I didn't give him your number. Even I know he's not your type. Although, come to think of it, I'm not sure exactly what your type is. But, she added, the gleam of gossip in her eye, Speaking of Tony, did you hear about Trish Cowan's? Sarah's stomach nodded, and she forced herself to exhale and fake a frown of confusion. Trish Cowan's? You've got to pull your nose out of the books once in a while, girl. Patricia Cowan's, the daughter of William Cowan's? You know, the bazillionaire who invented... Linda waved her hand in the air. Something or other, I don't know, but that's not the story. She's a student here at the university, and she's gone missing... Her daddy's whipping the local police into a frenzy trying to find her. That's awful, Sarah said in a low voice. She was having trouble focusing on the here and now. Her mind kept wanting to replace the smiling picture of Trish Cowan's with the terrifying images from her dreams. Linda sobered immediately, as if aware she'd been gushing over someone else's tragedy. Of course it is. Tony says they're working night and day. Wait, Sarah interrupted. What does your cousin have to do with this? Oh, Linda said, scrunching her face in thought. Tony's a cop. I thought you knew that. A detective, actually. He and his partner... Linda paused, eyeing her speculatively. Now there's a possibility for you. Dan's good-looking and much more, um, cerebral than Tony... Of course, I think he's on his third divorce, she added, frowning. Linda, Sarah said patiently, what does Tony have to do with Trish Cowan's? He and Dan are in charge of her case, Linda said, surprised. Didn't I mention that already? No, Sarah said absently. No, you didn't. And that's not all. She moved closer, glancing around to make sure they were alone. They think vampires are doing it. Sarah blinked in confusion. Doing what? Stealing those girls, Linda exclaimed, as if it was Sarah who wasn't paying attention. Girls? Plural? As in more than one? She asked, already knowing the answer. Well, yes. I think it's three or four. I'm not sure. But Sarah, vampires... Yeah, I got that. Why? she asked suddenly. Why? Linda parroted, 
her expression confused. Why do they think a vampire's involved? I mean, why would a vampire do that? For blood, of course. Sarah frowned, thinking about Raphael and his gang, about Raj. She tried to imagine any of them kidnapping women off the streets, especially when there were beautiful women like those in that club Saturday night, women who offered themselves eagerly. I don't think they need to do that, Linda. Not any more, anyway. Linda scowled at her, dissatisfied with the reaction to her big news. Well, I don't know, she said irritably. Tony said the missing women had all been to those horrible bloodhouses or something. He didn't want to talk about it, really, but his mother squeezed it out of him. Linda shrugged loosely, as if shaking off the entire subject. Anyway, I'm sure they'll find her. You know, freshmen, first time away from home, they go a little nuts. Okay, sweetie, I've got to run. She gave Sarah a quick peck on the cheek. See you at the party, and wear a dress, for God's sake. Sarah ignored the comment about a dress, putting it in the same category as her sensible boots. I'll be there, she said instead, and give Sam my love. She watched her friend dash off between the buildings. Thinking about vampires and the dark, windowless room Regina had woken up in. The kind of room in which a vampire might choose to hide his victims. Later that afternoon, Sarah sat in her home office, hunched in front of her computer, staring intently at the monitor, waiting for the secrets of the universe to be revealed. Or at least the next chapter of the book that was supposed to get her tenure. Unfortunately, there was nothing but a blank screen staring back at her. When the monitor reverted to her screensaver, she jerked back in surprise. How long had she been sitting here lost in thought? She pushed away from her desk with a sigh, not even bothering to save her work. She hadn't typed more than a hundred words, and none of it was worth keeping. Her stomach growled, reminding her it had been hours since lunch. She thumped noisily down the weirdly narrow stairway heading for the kitchen. The duplex she lived in had once been a single home. When someone had divided it in two, they'd made her half slightly smaller, with the cut right down the middle of the existing staircase, leaving each unit with a squished set of stairs, like something you'd see leading to an attic that no one ever used. Fortunately, Sarah was petite, five foot four in her stocking feet. If the socks were thick, although her much taller brothers had simply called her shrimp, she wasn't skinny, but she was fit and toned. So who cared about a number on the scale? Rounding the newel post at the bottom, she scuffed her way in stockinged feet to the kitchen and pulled open her freezer door. A dazzling array of Tupperware containers greeted her, all carefully labeled, courtesy of her landlady, Mrs. Maglietto. Mrs. M had sort of adopted Sarah when she'd discovered there was no family nearby. An inveterate gossip, she always seemed to know when Sarah was coming and going, and frequently met her on the porch with whatever casserole she or one of her many daughters had prepared that day. Sarah didn't mind; she'd been close to her family before everything fell apart. Sometimes she missed that sense of belonging, of knowing someone cared about her. That they'd miss her if she died, or if she was taken by one of the human monsters who haunted her dreams. Sarah shivered and realized she was still standing in front of her open freezer, lost in thought. First her computer, and now the freezer. Next she'd be drifting off while driving her car. She had to figure out a way to deal with the dreams before she suffered something more drastic than freezer burn. She slammed the freezer door and took a yogurt from the refrigerator instead, staring out the window as she spooned it into her mouth, barely aware she was eating. There had to be some way she could find out what the police knew. She could call Linda's cousin, of course, but what would she say? Even if he remembered her, she couldn't imagine he'd be eager to spill all the secrets of his investigation. After all, who was she? An assistant professor of history at the university, hardly an expert on. Her spoon clattered into the sink. 
Why hadn't she thought of that sooner? Hadn't she just spent the weekend with two of the most powerful vampires in the country? And wasn't her best friend practically married to one of them? She'd call Linda's cousin. She didn't know his last name, but that'd be easy enough to find out. She'd call him and offer her services as a vampire expert. Well, maybe not an expert, but a resource. There was probably nothing to the rumors anyway, but that wasn't the point. It would give her a chance to find out what the police knew without giving herself away. And anyway, who else could the police turn to if they had questions about vampires? The real vampires were all in Manhattan. She'd seen them in Raj's club. What self-respecting vampire would live in Buffalo when he had Manhattan to play in? Chapter 10 The sun went down and the vampires rose. Raj opened his eyes to the instant knowledge of where he was and how he'd gotten there. And hunger. He'd left the city in such a hurry last night that there'd been no time to eat a full meal. Normally he kept a supply of bagged blood in the bar refrigerator here for emergencies, but his last visit to Buffalo had been weeks ago, and the refrigerator was empty of everything but ice. Which meant, Kristoff be damned, Raj's first order of business was finding a willing donor. Demented or not, Kristoff was a powerful vampire, and Raj had no intention of meeting him at anything but his best. Besides, finding a woman shouldn't be difficult in this part of town, even on a Wednesday night. It was one of the reasons he'd built his lair here. He stood and headed for the bathroom, groaning at the stiffness in his neck. He'd fallen face down into bed this morning, which always left him feeling a little mean when he woke up. He twisted his neck with a loud crack of vertebrae and stared at his reflection in the mirror as he began to shave. He'd had a mustache when he was human and hair down to his shoulders. Now his face was bare and his thick blonde hair barely touched his collar. He turned on the shower and let steam fill the bathroom before stepping under the steady spray, one of the greatest inventions of modern man. As the hot water pummeled away his uncomfortable day's sleep, he thought about Kristoff and what this latest crisis might be. The old man had very little contact with the world outside his own small circle these days. He'd lived in Buffalo for hundreds of years, the last ninety of them in a big, turn-of-the-century house in the Delaware Park section of town. A fear of fire had forced him to rewire the entire building some years ago, but there was no television, no sound system, and just one computer, which was used by his minions to monitor security. Remarkably, Kristoff also owned an entire penthouse floor in a downtown high-rise, with both offices and bedroom suites. But he never used it, unless there were visitors to impress, which meant once every eight years when it was his turn to host the annual meeting of the North American Vampire Council. As for the city itself, Buffalo had once been fat and satisfied, its steel mills and ports thriving and new people arriving all the time. Raj had come here four decades before the American Civil War, looking for a different future than that offered by his own country, which was being slowly torn apart by competing foreign interests. Pure chance had brought him into contact with Kristoff, who had already been a vampire for centuries by then. Kristoff was the first master vampire to travel to the New World. With no competition, he had established his own territory and made himself a vampire lord. And he had been constantly on the lookout for potential recruits from his native Poland, men who were accustomed to the hierarchy of nobility and would not chafe under his rule. That the men he recruited didn't always volunteer to serve him didn't matter. Once they were turned, like Raj, they had little choice. Unfortunately, Lord Kristoff's fortunes were, of necessity, tied to the cities, and Buffalo's heyday was far in the past. 
Kristoff's refusal to see the truth of the decline, to move his seat of power to Manhattan or one of the other profitable northeastern cities was an indication of how out of touch he was. But his failure to maintain order in the territory was far more serious. Raj wasn't the only vampire who'd begun siring an army of loyal followers. If nothing was done, the Northeast would soon be a honeycomb of fiefdoms, weakening the whole until it shattered into pieces, or attracted the attention of some strong outsider who would come in and do a little permanent dusting. When the shower's water began to lose its heat, Raj turned it off and stepped out, wrapping himself in a big towel and drying off as he strolled over to his closet. His choice of clothing usually ran to black denims and leather jackets, especially in cold weather. But tonight he pulled out a charcoal worsted wool suit instead. Kristoff would be pleased. And for right now, that was Raj's goal. He wanted the vampire lord smug and complacent in his own power, totally unprepared for the not too distant day when Raj made his move. He tossed the towel away and began to dress. His hunger was growing by the minute. It was time to hunt. The woman moaned softly as Raj drank, the chemicals in his saliva turning the experience into one of orgasmic pleasure for her, instead of the brutal act it really was. Raj slowly withdrew his fangs from her neck and ran his tongue sensuously over the two small puncture wounds, speeding coagulation and healing. He licked his mouth and teeth, savoring the bouquet of her blood before retracting his fangs into his gums. Her blood was sweet with youth and warmed by the rum she'd drunk earlier. He heard voices and moved quickly, hiding her small body behind his bulk as two waiters came down the dark hallway toward them, keeping his back turned until they were gone. He then walked the groggy woman back into the crowded main room, skirting the edge of the dance floor to an empty booth. She'd awaken soon, probably a little embarrassed at the obvious evidence of her orgasm. But there would be no memory of Raj and no lasting or negative effects. He'd taken only what he needed, less than if she donated at the local Red Cross. He strode out to his car, feeling strong and alive once again. It was still early, although no doubt later than Kristoff would have preferred. But the old vampire lord's house was only a short drive, and whatever waited for him there, he would now face it at full strength. Chapter 11 The BMW responded readily when he turned onto Delaware Avenue, and he had to force himself to back off the accelerator— that was the danger of drinking too well. It left him feeling high and invincible, never a good combination when facing one sire. He went in through the back door, nodding to the two guards stationed just inside the house. Their faces were familiar, and they clearly recognized him, although he didn't know their names. He swung through the empty kitchen and into the hallway, where he took the basement stairs downward, resisting the urge to take them two at a time. The room below was crowded with vampires, but they were little more than a wall of meat between Kristoff and whoever came down the stairs. Kristoff preferred to surround himself with weaklings, vampires who presented no challenge to the vampire lord's authority. If the old man had known ahead of time how powerful Raj would turn out to be— he probably would have drunk him dry and left him for the undertaker all those years ago. But the truth was no one knew the full extent of Raj's power, not even Emily. He kept it carefully shuttered for the most part, using only what he needed to get the job done. It was dangerous enough that Kristoff considered him a threat. There was no reason to advertise just how much of a threat he really was. Of course it was Raj's strength that brought him to the vampire lord's lair this evening. He'd had a chance to think about Kristoff's abrupt summons, and that scenario was the only one that made sense. Whatever was going down in Buffalo, it was serious enough that Kristoff wanted Raj's power at his back. Raj only hoped he'd survive whatever it was. 
One of the newer vamps, a bulky Latino male Raj had never seen before, emerged from the crowd and thrust out his considerable chest in challenge. He was physically imposing, but registered not even a trickle on the power scale, which was all that mattered. Raj studied the younger vampire through half-lidded eyes and gave him a lazy smile. "'Joseph,' he drawled as he looked over the idiot's shoulder. "'If you value this pup, you better call him to heel right now.' Across the room, Kristoff's head of security looked up and swore as the pup in question shoved himself into Raj's face with a snarl. "'Morales, you fucking idiot! Stand down!' Joseph snapped. He crossed the basement and shoved at the vampire's thick chest. Morales stiffened against the push and only stared harder. Raj chuckled. <laughs> this one might be too stupid to live. You sure you want to save him? I said stand the fuck down. Joseph shoved harder sending the other vampire crashing through the crowd to smash into the hard wall on the other side. At Joseph's nod, two of the others held the idiot back when he would have rushed back into the fray. The security chief shook his head in disgust. Sorry about that, Raj. He so knew we have to lock him up at sunrise or he'll stand out there and watch the pretty lights in the sky. Maybe you should put him down then. Do us all a favor. What's he doing here? Kristoff likes him. Across the room, Morales grinned at him in triumph, but Raj only laughed. The puppy obviously didn't know it, but Kristoff's favor meant a vampire was too stupid or too weak to pose even the tiniest threat. Our master's waiting for you, Joseph said, which meant Raj was late and Kristoff was pissed. Raj shrugged, unconcerned. It was late when he called last night. I barely made it into town before dawn, and I needed to eat. What's this about? Raimund. Every vampire in the room, except for Raj, went down on one knee as Kristoff appeared in the doorway to his office. The kneeling was an affectation he insisted upon, and one Raj hadn't granted him in years. Sire. Raj said with a bend of his neck, nothing more. He lifted his head and met Kristoff's gaze directly, daring him to force the issue. The vampire lord's thin mouth tightened briefly before curving into an insincere smile. It's good to see you again, Raimund. His voice was strong and even, which meant he'd probably just fed. Over the last few years it had become apparent that Kristoff was feeding more and more often. It was another sign of his growing weakness, that he was reverting to a schedule closer to that of a newborn than a vamp of his considerable age and power. When he was hungry his speech would become hesitant and uncertain like an aging human's, although he never looked old. It wasn't his body that was aging. It was his mind. Do come in he said now, sweeping his hand across his body in a graceful gesture of invitation. He started back into his office, but stopped, frowning as he gave Joseph a pointed look. Clear this room, Joseph. Raymond and I will require privacy. The security chief rose from his kneeling position and stared moodily at their master's departing back. A long minute later he turned his head and gave Raj an unreadable look before giving the vampire closest to them a quick push. "'Everyone upstairs!' he barked. Raj shrugged, gave the fuming Morales a wink, and strolled through the doorway to Kristoff's inner sanctum. Kristoff was alone but for a young woman lolling on an elaborate velvet settee against one wall. She was half-naked, her blouse hanging open on small, pale breasts, her skirt scrunched up nearly to her waist and her underwear gone, if there had ever been any. Fresh blood, red and wet, seeped lazily from the big vein on her neck, and she was humming softly, a dreamy expression on her face as she twirled a lock of purple-streaked hair with one finger. Lovely, isn't she? 
Raj swung his attention immediately over to the vampire lord, irritated that he'd permitted himself to be distracted by the human female. Distraction could be deadly in Kristoff's presence, no matter that the old man was half senile. Young, he commented. But then Kristoff had always liked them young. Kristoff bared his teeth in a grin that showed far more than a hint of fang. Over eighteen, and plucked from one of the blood houses, so you know she's legal. He turned his back and walked silently across the deep pile carpeting to sit behind a fussy antique writing table with inlays so beautiful that even Raj could appreciate them. Velvet curtains in a full, rich red hung behind the vampire lord's desk, purely for the effect since there were no windows in any of the basement rooms. The remaining walls were bordered by a deep mahogany wainscoting against subdued satin wallpaper. Kristoff seated himself on a delicate chair and folded his soft-looking hands on a leather-trimmed blotter. His long, dark hair was bound with a black velvet ribbon, framing an unlined face and brown eyes which were remarkably clear, showing no signs of stress as he gazed up at Raj expectantly. Raj was reminded of an old Russian saying about a person whose face was untouched by the wind. It referred to someone unmarked by the hardships of life, and it wasn't a compliment. Here was a vampire lord who had lived for centuries, who had enslaved hundreds, if not thousands, of both humans and vampires, who killed brutally for no reason but his own convenience. And yet there he sat, the picture of a pampered young aristocrat, whose hands had never been soiled by anything so crude as blood. Raj stared at this creature who had so changed his own life and was nearly overcome by the urge to leap across the desk and choke the unnatural life from him. "'Why am I here?' he growled. Across the desk, Kristoff's lips tightened and he cocked his head in rebuke. "'Do not presume too far, Raymond. I am still master here. His eyes went abruptly flat, and Raj realized they could do it right now, decide this thing between them once and for all. But not with all of his own supporters hundreds of miles away in Manhattan, while Kristoff sat beneath a house full of minions whose very lives depended on his continued existence. They would defend him to the death out of a raw instinct to survive— no matter their feelings about him personally. Raj lowered his eyes and bent his head briefly. My apologies, my lord. Kristoff smiled graciously, the benevolent lord with his servant. Raj ground his teeth so hard he thought the old vampire could surely hear it. So, Kristoff began in the bored, dulcet tones of a born aristocrat, tell me what Raphael wanted. Raj looked up and shrugged carelessly. A holiday in Manhattan for his mate. Kristoff frowned. Why New York? Shopping, I suppose. That's what she and her friend did all day. Is there no shopping in Los Angeles? The friend works in New York, here in Buffalo, as a matter of fact. She teaches at the university. As for Raphael's mate, Raj hooked an uncomfortable-looking chair over with one foot and slouched down onto it. She's a rich American and clearly used to having her own way. Raphael indulges her. Does he? Kristoff's note of interest sharpened Raj's attention, although he was careful not to show it. To a point, he clarified. She's quite beautiful. The old vampire lord laughed. So even Raphael has a weakness. I never thought I'd see the day. Raj didn't say anything. If Kristoff wanted to believe Raphael's mate Cynthia made him weaker somehow, that was his choice. Raj had seen enough this weekend to know that while the western vampire lord clearly loved the human woman, he hadn't let down his guard at all. If anything, he might be more secure now than ever. 
Having finally met her, Raj was inclined to believe many of the rumors he'd heard about Sin's determination and her willingness to kill if necessary. And he had no doubt she'd defend Raphael to her death, if that's what it took. As for Raphael, only a fool would think to bring harm to Cynthia and survive. Well, this is all very interesting, but that's not the main reason I wanted you here, Raymond. We have something of a situation involving the humans, and you know I've never been comfortable dealing with them. One doesn't talk to the livestock, after all. He chuckled at his own jest. Still, this is America, and one must adapt. Raj ignored him. Kristoff had been in this country for nearly three hundred years, and he still spoke as though he'd only arrived a month ago. I'm afraid the human police are concerned, Raymond. That got Raj's attention. The police? About what? Apparently some women have disappeared. As if that's a rare occurrence in a human city. They butcher each other so casually we're far less of a threat to them than they are to themselves. Unfortunately, an influential man has become involved. His daughter is among those missing, and he's convinced the police we've something to do with it. Ridiculous, of course. The girl is no doubt fucking her minimal brains out with someone unsuitable and will come home pregnant and diseased when she realizes her mistake. But in the meantime, we are all forced to play this silly game. His voice was no longer that of a bored aristocrat, but had grown almost coarse with some emotion. Could it be fear? Did Kristoff know more about these missing women than he was saying? And was that the real reason Raj had been called to deal with it? In any event, the vampire lord continued, you will be meeting the police this evening. Tonight, Raj demanded. Kristoff raised one eyebrow in disapproval at the interruption. This evening, he repeated, at 9 p.m. I told them, why talk to them at all? Kristoff's patience snapped. His chair crashed behind him as he stood, his eyes twin coals of fire in the suddenly dark room, his power sweeping out to encompass not just the house on Delaware Park, but the entire city of Buffalo and beyond to Manhattan, where Raj's own vampires would be feeling the swell of his power and wondering if they were about to die. Raj sprang to his feet as, around them, the ancient mansion shuddered with the force of Kristoff's will. Plaster dust filled the air as old wood groaned beneath the sudden pressure. Kristoff's young donor had begun to whimper in fear, while in the outer room Crystal sang its death throes as something crashed to the ground and shattered into a million pieces. On the floors above them all movement ceased as Kristoff withdrew the very life force which kept his minions alive, demonstrating his power in the most cruel fashion. Raj sensed their terror all around him as they fell to their knees, as their hearts grew still in their chests and their breath was sucked away. Not even he was completely immune to the pull of Kristoff's will. But unlike the others, he fought back, releasing enough of his power to keep his heart pumping, his lungs drawing in air against the demands of his sire. In the silence that was the vampire lord's will, Raj's single heartbeat was a loud drumbeat of sound. Across the room, Kristoff heard it. Their eyes met. So, Kristoff said finally. He blinked and the light returned. All over the city, Raj knew, vampires would be collapsing in relief, overwhelmed by the touch of their master, sucking new air into their lungs, feeling the stolen blood in their veins begin to pump sluggishly once again. The young woman on the settee coughed spasmodically, her face blanched white with fear, her lips tinged blue from oxygen loss. Kristoff gave her an idle glance, then sighed impatiently and walked over, dropping to one knee at her side. He rolled up his sleeve and casually ripped open a vein with his fangs, 
holding his wrist out and allowing several drops to fall between the girl's gasping lips. She nearly choked as the viscous fluid dribbled down her throat, but her distress was quickly followed by ecstasy as the full richness of the vampire lord's blood hit her system. She moaned and rolled to her side, curling up on herself to lie there trembling. Christoph licked his own veins shut and smoothed his cuff down, buttoning it with crisp, efficient movements as he sat on the edge of the settee. A single drop of blood stained the pristine white cloth, and he frowned at it. "'I should have let you die, Raymond," he said without looking up. "'To this day I'm not certain why I didn't.' Raj remained silent. Christoph gave him a dismissive glance. "'I could kill you now, of course,' he continued conversationally. "'They'd all die willingly if I called upon them.' He waved his hand over his head to indicate the vampires in the house above. "'I could drain the city dry, if necessary, to defeat you. And what could you do?' His eyes burned again, but the fire was the cold of death. Nothing, he snapped, glaring at Raj. I am master here. Do not forget that, Raymond. You and I may come to a challenge some day, but that day is not today, and we both know it. He pursed his lips in annoyance as he contemplated the mess around him, bending slightly to straighten a fallen chair before returning his attention to Raj. You will meet with a Detective Scavetti and some others this evening at 9 p.m., he said. He slipped his fingers beneath his jacket and extracted an ordinary-looking business card with the police department's logo. He held it out to Raj. You will answer all of their questions within reason. I hardly need tell you to be discreet. Regardless of our personal animosities, I know I can trust you to handle this to the best of your considerable abilities. He paused, his gaze never wavering. Do you have any further questions? Raj studied his sire for the space of a heartbeat, reminding the vampire lord that his heart no longer beat of anyone's will but his own. He took the proffered card and asked, is this wise, my lord? We have survived for so long by remaining beneath their notice. For a brief moment, Raj thought he saw something like cunning in the old vampire's eyes, and then it was gone. The latest girl disappeared after attending one of those ridiculous vampire costume events, Christoph said, his mouth twisting with distaste. My lawyers have explained to the humans that we have nothing to do with those, but... He shrugged gracefully. Raj nodded. I will keep you advised. Kristoff nodded and turned his attention to the shivering young woman, one smooth white hand stroking her bare thigh. Close the door on your way out, won't you, Raymond? Everything okay, Raj? Raj spun away from the closed door to Christoph's office and found Joseph standing a few feet away, a sharpened stake in one hand. Raj gave the stake a pointed glance. "'You planning to use that?' he asked, almost hoping the other vampire would say yes. He could use a good fight about now. Joseph looked down as if surprised to find himself holding the deadly weapon. He swore and tossed it aside. Some of the younger ones didn't make it, he explained, and then he grinned, including Morales. Raj's only reaction was a slight arching of one eyebrow. He checked his watch. I'd like to catch up with you, Joseph, but it will have to be later. Christoph has asked me to look into— I know about the cops, Joseph snapped, his mood suddenly changing. I'm his chief of security, Raj. I know why you're here. Raj regarded the other vampire silently. Definitely some resentment there, he thought. And who could blame him? Look, Raj said, leaning in conspiratorially. 
If I'm going to deal with this quickly, I'm going to need your help. These aren't my streets any more. Joseph studied him for a minute before nodding in agreement. I'll tell you what I can, he said. Call me later. Now that I think on it, you should come by the house. Celia'd love to see you. She gets tired of the same old faces. Celia was Joseph's human wife. They'd wed in the old way long ago, for the benefit of Celia's now dead family, who had never known the true nature of the man she married. They'd been together for more than a century, long enough that although Celia was still human, her life was completely tied to that of her vampire husband. If Joseph ever decided to put her aside, to stop giving her blood, she would die within days. But that would never happen. Celia was a diminutive ballbuster of a woman who completely dominated the bulky vampire. Raj would rather meet the sun than be saddled with someone like Celia for even a day, much less forever. I'd enjoy that, he lied. We'll set something up. Raj went out through the front, glad to leave Kristoff's nest of neurotic vampires far behind. The air outside was fresh, and for once he didn't mind its cold bite. It was a relief after the lingering miasma of the house with its half-mad lord and pandering sycophants. He clicked the remote to open the BMW's locks and slipped inside, enjoying the smell of good leather, the smooth rumble of the engine when he turned the key— and the sad, gravelly voice of Leonard Cohen murmuring from his stereo. He picked up his cell phone and speed-dialed Manhattan. Raj, M answered before the phone had finished its first ring. Is that how you answer the phone now? I'm sorry, my lord, she said. Are you? I'm fine, M, he relented. But Christoph confronted some unhappy realities tonight. Everyone there come through all right? No problems. A few headaches and some panic among the younglings, but mostly... She paused as if unsure whether to continue. I was worried, Raj, she said in a low voice. So little faith in me, Em? No, she said quickly. Not really, she amended. It's just... You're there alone, and Kristoff has his whole gang behind him. In front of him, you mean. Kristoff leads from the rear. M laughed, and he could hear the relief in her voice when she continued. So, are you coming back soon? I wish. There's trouble here. Women have gone missing, including the daughter of a man rich enough to make the cops pay attention. The girl was at a vamp party before she disappeared, so the police are following up on what they regard as a vampire connection. M snorted. What vampire connection? No pun intended, but none of us would be caught dead at those silly parties. That's what Kristoff told them. But you know how it goes. And frankly, I'm not sure the old man's as innocent as he claims. He's a little too worried about this whole situation. Well, fuck. Just what we need. More bad press. Why not let Kristoff clean up his own mess? Because something like this could hurt us all. Besides, if there's any truth to it, and it's not Kristoff, I'll have to get rid of whatever vampire is behind it. God knows Kristoff won't get his hands dirty. He heard M's long sigh over the phone. Let me send some people, Raj. Now that Kristoff knows... Not yet. It's too soon. I need to get the lay of the land and find out what's really going on. All I have so far is what Kristoff has told me, and his main concern is always his own ass. I'm on my way to meet the cops, if you can believe that. Kristoff set it up before I got here. I'll call you after that. If it's not too late, I could still get some troops. Let it go, Em. I'll call you. He hung up before she could protest any further. He loved Em like a sister, 
and she was a first-rate lieutenant, but she could be a bit of a mother hen sometimes. He turned up the music and pulled away from the curb, heading for the police station, the one place he'd never expected to visit. Chapter 12 Sarah hadn't been inside a police station since California, hadn't had so much as a parking ticket in those twelve years. She stood at the bottom of the short concrete stairway, staring up at the glass doors, and wondered why it felt as if she was giving up her freedom by walking into that building. Intellectually, she knew it was just a building. Moreover, a building filled with men and women who put their lives on the line every single day for people like her— and it wasn't as if they were going to arrest her or anything. She was going to have a nice conversation with Tony Scavetti about vampires, then go back home to her little duplex with its weird staircase and Tupperware-filled freezer. So why was her body in full fight-or-flight mode? Vampires, Sarah, she muttered to herself in a low voice. You're just going to talk about vampires. And if Tony happened to let fall some tidbit of information and she happened to suggest something in return, what harm could there be in that? Right. She hitched her purse higher on her shoulder and went up the stairs. The door opened as she reached for it, two men in suits, and guns, she noted, coming out as she went in. One of them held the door for her, his gaze moving up and down her body, finally lighting upon her face with an appreciative smile. She'd worn pants today, no matter what Linda said. It was too cold for anything else. But they hugged the curve of her hips, and she knew she had a figure that looked good in sweaters, even with most of her body hidden beneath her long wool coat. She smiled back, murmured, Thanks, and stepped into the station. The first thing that hit her was the smell. Sweat, dirt, and under it all the lingering scent of pine cleaner. Unfortunately, too many unwashed bodies had passed through too recently for even the most rigorous cleaning to have made a difference, and she had a feeling the cleaning hadn't been that rigorous. Next was the number of people crowding the barren lobby. She'd scheduled her appointment with Tony for later in the evening, thinking it would be a quieter time. So much for that idea. To her right was a reception counter— and Mayberry this wasn't. The bottom half was wall, the top half a double layer of presumably bulletproof plastic. She could see various people in uniform moving around behind it, with one well-fed middle-aged officer sitting at a counter behind the plastic and more or less facing the waiting room. She walked up to the small perforated oval near his head and stopped, waiting for a reaction. It took a while, but eventually he looked up. "'Can I help you?' he asked, reminding herself that she had a reason for being here that didn't include antagonizing the first cop she came into contact with. Sarah smiled and said pleasantly, "'I'm Professor Stratton, Sarah Stratton. I believe Detective Scavetti is expecting me.' The cop regarded her silently for a few moments, but then punched some buttons on his console and spoke into his headset. Scavetti, you got a visitor. He paused, listening. Nah, it's a lady. Says her name is... He looked at Sarah for guidance. Stratton, she reminded him. Sarah Stratton. Sarah Stratton, the cop repeated. Yeah, okay. He punched another button and said, He'll be right out. Have a seat. Sarah surveyed the seating options and decided to stand. A few minutes later, the single, windowless door across the lobby opened and Tony Scavetti appeared. She'd all but forgotten what he looked like. He hadn't made much of an impression the one time she'd met him. But she recognized him immediately. He was one of those Italian-American males she passed every day on the streets of this city, with dark hair greased back, olive skin, and deep brown eyes. He was good-looking, if you liked the type, and he clearly spent a lot of time in the gym, with a trim waist and broad shoulders beneath an ill-fitting sports coat. She walked over and held out her hand. 
Detective Scavetti. His eyes never made it to her face as he shook her hand briefly, seeming in a hurry to get her inside and close the door on the lobby. Sarah, he said, come on back. She followed him down a short hallway, through a bullpen crowded with desks and people. Phones rang almost constantly, and there was a steady murmur of voices broken by the occasional loud exchange. More than a few heads turned, most of them simply curious, as she followed Tony to a glassed-in office with four desks, none of which were occupied. Have a seat, he said, moving to the desk furthest from the door. There were two padded, straight chairs in front of the desk, and she took the one that didn't have a torn seat cushion. So, Sarah, he said, smiling, what can I do for you? Sarah put her purse down on the floor and leaned forward. I hope it's what I can do for you, she said, laughing slightly. As I said on the phone, I was talking to Linda yesterday, and she mentioned you were the lead detective on the Trish Cowan's case. Tony didn't look happy about that, but he nodded. She also said you thought vampires might be involved, and since I... Fu he looked at her quickly. How the hell did Linda... I think your mother told her. Fu he sucked in a breath and smiled, leaning way back in his chair until it hit the wall behind him. Sorry, bad habit. I guess I'll have to arrest my mom for talking out of turn. I'm sorry, Sarah, but you may have wasted your time in coming here. I'm not free to discuss any ongoing investigation. I'm sure you understand. I do, she assured him, and I'm not here to ask questions. I'm actually hoping I can answer some for you. I'm very good friends with some people high up in the vampire hierarchy. If you needed— He smiled patronizingly and dropped his chair forward. I believe we have the vampire angle covered. I don't think— His phone rang and he picked it up quickly. Scavetti! He listened for a minute and swore. What the fuck? His eyes flashed to her once again and he turned away slightly. What's he doing here? Nobody told me— yeah. Great. Fan-fucking-tastic. What about— All right. You bring him back and I'll meet you in the conference room. He slammed the phone down and she could see the tendons in his neck straining as he fought for control over his anger. He stood abruptly and Sarah knew her few minutes were over. Come on, he said tersely. I'll walk you out. He came around the desk and took her arm, propelling her quickly back through the bullpen, not letting go until they crossed into the hallway. Sarah felt her chance, slim as it was, slipping away. What did he mean when he said they had the vampire angle covered? Was there someone in town who knew about vamps? No one at the university, that was for sure. Who could he— her eyes widened as she suddenly remembered someone just a short flight away who knew a hell of a lot more than she did about vampires. Raj pulled into the parking lot behind the police station, backing into a spot in the second row with a good line of sight on the entrance. He wasn't comfortable being here, although he dealt with cops all the time in Manhattan. There was always some idiot with a death wish who decided to take on one of his vampires, or who got drunk and started a fight in the waiting line as it wound its way down the block. But Manhattan was Raj's city, and he knew its cops. He knew who worked what beat around his clubs, and he always donated to the various police charities when called upon, which was often. This, on the other hand, definitely wasn't his city— and he wasn't dealing with some asshole on a drunken disorderly. The Cowan's girl had been gone a few days. The odds were she was already dead, which made this a potential murder investigation. And Raj had a feeling the Buffalo Police Department wasn't going to be impressed with his donations to the NYPD policeman's ball. A taxicab pulled up to the station house, its left front tire dropping visibly into a water-filled pothole before the driver edged forward to sit spewing exhaust in front of the stairs. A woman climbed out of the back seat, her hair uncombed, her clothes obviously pulled on in a hurry. She shoved some money at the driver and he took off, 
swerving at the last minute to avoid hitting the pothole a second time, driving right by Raj on his way to the exit, windows open despite the frigid air. As the taxi whipped onto the street, it cut right in front of a limo, which had slowed down for its own ponderous turn into the lot. Raj chuckled softly. Who knew sitting in a police parking lot would be so entertaining? The long black vehicle made its stately way across the width of the building, the driver deftly avoiding the water-filled pothole while taking up almost the exact position the taxi had occupied earlier. The right passenger door opened almost immediately, and a man jumped out, his ready demeanor and discreet weapon proclaiming him a bodyguard even before he scanned the area carefully. The driver had disembarked and circled the car by then, and, after getting an affirming nod from the bodyguard, opened the back door and said something to whoever was inside before stepping out of the way. A large man emerged first, his longish blonde hair uncovered, his camel-colored cashmere coat buttoned tightly. He turned just enough to offer a good look at his face, and Raj swore softly. Edward Blackwood, a traveling snake oil salesman if there ever was one. A second man stood from within the limo, almost as tall as Blackwood, but not nearly as bulky. In his late fifties, with carefully styled dark hair, he wore a black winter coat and had a scarf wrapped around his neck against the cold. Unlike Blackwood, he didn't wait, but went immediately up the stairs and into the building, his bodyguard in tow. Blackwood seemed taken aback by the rapid departure and hurried to keep up, hustling along behind. Raj frowned. Given Blackwood's habit of hanging around rich men who had nothing better to do with their money than wasted on humanity realized— Raj had to figure the dark-haired man was William Cowens, the missing girl's billionaire father, which didn't make him happy. He had come prepared to deal with the cops, not a distraught father. The limo driver pulled the vehicle deeper into the parking lot to wait for his boss's return. Raj sat there a few minutes longer, then switched off the ignition and climbed out of the warm car. Time to find out how much the police knew and how much they didn't. Time to get the job done and get out of this town before it sucked him dry. Raj crossed the parking lot swiftly, taking the stairs two at a time. The scent of a woman's perfume drifted on the air, something light and flowery, something oddly familiar. It persisted as he crossed to the reception desk to confront a human policeman sitting behind a bulletproof barrier and studiously ignoring everyone on the other side. Raj tapped on the plastic and the cop looked up. My name's Gregor, Raymond Gregor, he said, using the American version of his name. Detective Scavetti is expecting me. Mr. Gregor! The man's voice came from behind him and Raj spun, tensing slightly. Detective Dan Felda, the man said, stepping forward. Scavetti and I are partners. Felder was tall and slender, probably considered good-looking in a subdued sort of way. He smiled as he extended his hand. Didn't mean to startle you. I was passing through and heard the name. Detective, Raj said, accepting the handshake. So, no problem entering the building, huh? Pardon me? Felder looked away uncomfortable. I kind of thought you might, you know, need an invitation or something. Raj's first instinct was to scoff, but he thought better of it. It was a generous gesture, and besides, it might come in handy later to have a friendly contact inside the department. No, he said, but thanks for thinking of it, Felder. Public places like this I can do just fine. Oh, right, makes sense. Felder gestured toward a closed door. We're down this way. He jerked his head at the desk cop who pushed a button somewhere. A loud buzz sounded and Felder pulled the door open, indicating Rod should go ahead of him. He would have preferred the cop go first, but that would have looked a little too paranoid, so he went on through. They had taken only a few steps when that same perfume hit his senses. He lifted his head and grinned. 
Sarah Stratton was coming down the hall along with another detective. She was obviously uncomfortable and embarrassed by whatever the detective was saying, and not yet aware that Raj was standing there. Look, I appreciate your effort in coming down here, Sarah. The cop said as they came closer, but like I said, we have our own experts on these things. Of course, I just thought, well, since I do have contacts with the local vampire lord, she did. That was news to Raj, and it didn't make him happy. He didn't want Sarah Stratton within a hundred yards of Kristoff or any other vampire, except, of course, himself, Tony. Detective Felder said. The other detective looked up impatiently. Yeah, just a minute, Dan. Look, he said quietly, taking Sarah's arm. Why don't you leave me your number and I'll? No, she said instantly. She glanced up nervously and froze, her eyes growing wider when she saw Raj watching her. His lips curled into a pleased smile, although what he wanted to do was knock Tony's fucking hand off her arm. Tony, Felder insisted. This is Raymond Gregor. Tony, presumably the Tony Scavetti Raj was supposed to meet, paid attention at last. He forgot the woman at his side to focus on Raj. You are the vampire, Raj nodded, and you must be the detective. He responded. He took a cynical pleasure in Scavetti's automatic bristle of reaction as the human drew himself up to his full height, which was no more than five eight, and flexed gym-built muscles beneath a too tight jacket. Raj regarded him evenly. He'd met too many Scavettis in his long life, the ones who picked fights for no better reason than to prove no one was tougher than they were. Good to get those details out of the way. Felder said, playing peacemaker, something he probably had to do often if Scavetti was his partner. Uh, Professor Stratton, he reminded Scavetti. Scavetti frowned, but switched his attention back to Sarah. Yeah, Sarah, I'm sure Gregor here can answer any questions. In fact, you two probably know each other, right? A bright pink blush spread along her cheekbones as she looked up at Raj, staining her otherwise porcelain pale skin. Her hazel eyes darkened almost gray with emotion, and lingered a heartbeat too long before dropping to hide behind thick eyelashes. Mister Gregor, she said softly. Professor Stratton, Raj purred. He took her hand and tugged. Smoothly extricating her from Tony's grasp and drawing her close enough that he could breathe in her scent, shutting out the smells of sweaty cops and burned coffee. His actions startled her into looking up and meeting his eyes again. I hate to interrupt, Scavetti said snidely. Raj just barely held back a furious snarl at the interruption, and he felt Sarah's jolt of surprise, as if she'd forgotten Scavetti was even standing there. Could we get on with this, please? The detective asked. Raj glanced at Scavetti and permitted a cloud of disdain to cross his expression before he shut it down completely. Of course, detective, he said. I'll just walk Professor Stratton out to her car first. Sarah flashed him a startled look, but Raj only bowed slightly and gestured down the hallway. She gave him a weak smile and shivered slightly when she walked past him. Raj swallowed his grin and followed, watching the muted sway of her hips beneath that bulky winter coat, and wishing she was wearing something light and silky like before. Maybe a soft skirt, something to play around her slender legs above those sexy high heels she seemed to favor. He glanced back to find the two cops staring at him and shrugged gracefully. This will only take a moment," he assured them. "What the fuck?" he heard Scavetti swear before he'd gone ten steps. "What's he going to do to her?" "Looks like they know each other," Tony Felder responded in a bored tone. "What do you think he's going to do? Drain her in the parking lot? Besides, what do you care?" "Fuck you, Dan." I might not want her on this case, but that doesn't mean I want some fucking vampire sucking on a neck either. 
Raj chuckled and stopped listening. He caught up with Sarah just as she pushed open the outside door, letting in a rush of much fresher air. Chapter 13 Sarah put her shoulder into the heavy door, sucking in a cold breath and telling herself she'd done everything she could to help Trish. Scavetti had been, well, not polite, but probably as polite as he ever got. Every other word out of the man's mouth was an expletive, although he had tried to censor himself for her benefit. And she was sure he'd only agreed to give her the five minutes he had because, according to Linda, he was hoping to hook up with her. And then, of course, there was Raj. She'd looked pretty stupid once he'd shown up. If she'd known he would be here, she'd never have come down in the first place. And not just because he made her look foolish with the cops, either. That man, that vampire, was nothing but trouble. Every time she got within two feet of his gorgeous self, her IQ seemed to drop about forty points. And he knew it, too. The arrogance just oozed out of him. He was so damned sure of... The weight of the thick glass door suddenly disappeared as a long arm reached over her shoulder. The light from the lobby disappeared, casting her into shadow, and she looked up, not surprised to see Raj right behind her, his easy grin not fooling her for a second. She murmured her thanks and stepped out onto the landing, pulling her coat closed and hunching deeper into its warmth. "'I'm fine, Raj,' she said quickly. "'You don't have to—' She jerked her gaze sideways as the solid thunk of a car door punctuated the night. Across the parking lot, a chauffeur had just stepped out of a long black limo to grab some fresh air. She couldn't be positive, but she didn't think the vehicle had been there when she'd arrived at the station. It could be anyone, of course. Limos weren't common, except on prom nights, but they weren't completely rare in the city either. But for some reason, maybe it was the phone call Tony had received while she sat in his office— she was convinced this one belonged to William Cowens, and that meant Edward Blackwood was nearby. She immediately turned her back on the lobby and stepped away from the lights, just in case. Raj caught her reaction naturally and slipped an arm over her shoulders, his great bulk effectively hiding her from both the limo and the lobby. She could feel him studying the limo and its driver over her head. "'Come on, Sarah,' he said. I'll walk you to your car. He started down the stairs with her firmly in the curve of his arm. And you can tell me why you don't want William Cowens to know you're here. Sarah nearly missed the next step, but his solid strength kept her upright. He tucked her against his body with a low chuckle. I love the boots, sweetheart, he murmured but they're not the best choice for the icy streets around here. Sarah felt a rush of pleasure that he'd noticed her admittedly sexy high-heeled boots, but cursed her own clumsiness. I didn't expect to be walking much, she muttered, and I'm not worried about William Cowens. No, then maybe it's the limo driver, a former lover, perhaps. He said it lightly, but there was a definite growl on his last words. Sarah laughed. <laughs> right, it's the limo driver. I was just startled, that's all. I'm not used to hanging around police stations. They had reached her car by then. Sarah beeped the locks open, and Raj reached around her to open the door. Is it Blackwood? he persisted. She threw her back across the seat and gave him an exasperated look. I told you, I don't even know. Raj placed one hand on the door and braced himself against the roof of her car with the other, effectively trapping her. He was so damn big. She stifled a brief, irrational urge to run, looking up to meet his amused gaze instead. Do you know how lie detectors work, Sarah? She frowned in confusion at the seeming non sequitur. Of course. When a person lies about something, there are physiological changes that give him away, 
pulse rate, respiration, and probably some other things, too. It's not exactly my field, but what— He leaned down until his mouth was at her ear. Your pulse and respiratory rates just rocketed, little one. And your luscious heart is going pity pat. Either you're madly in love with me, or you're not being totally honest. Although it might be both. She felt the soft touch of his tongue along the curve of her ear. Delicious, he whispered. She shivered and forced herself to meet his icy blue eyes. Except they weren't quite so icy any more. She licked her lips, and those eyes followed the movement of her tongue before returning to meet her gaze with a slow, sensuous blink. Ice can be hot, too, she reminded herself. Why do you care? she managed to say. You didn't come down here to offer advice on vampires, he chided her gently. Of course, there's your close relationship with Lord Kristoff. He let the words trail off suggestively. I don't really know him, she admitted, although I did, er, see him at a university reception once, and I could probably get Sin to set up a meeting or— I don't think so, he interrupted harshly. Sarah looked up at him in surprise and caught the dying flash of some emotion in his eyes. If you have any questions about vampires, you can ask me, he said. No one else. Excuse me, she said, his high-handed attitude restoring some of her usual backbone. Raj gave her a charming smile, one that almost made her forget her newfound determination. Lord Kristoff doesn't deal with humans much, whereas I... He nuzzled her cheek softly, placing his lips once again at her ear. I am at your complete disposal. Sarah didn't need a vampire to tell her that her heartbeat had just gone into overdrive. She turned her face into his, struck by the smoothness of his cheek, by the warm, masculine scent of his skin. Raj, she murmured. Yes. What are we doing? He laughed. I must be out of practice if you need to ask me that. Sarah smiled up at him, feeling relaxed and warm, just like she had in the club. It was strange how he could make her feel that way. Strange and a little troubling. She started to turn, intending to slip into her car, but Raj had other ideas. He wrapped an arm around her waist, lifted her up to her toes, and kissed her. A long, soft, sensuous seduction of mouth and tongue. When he finally ended the kiss, tracing her jaw with his lips as he set her carefully back on her own two feet, she held on to him, not entirely certain she could remain standing on her own. "'I have to go back inside,' he murmured, even as he continued to taste her, his mouth moving slowly from cheek to cheek and down to her neck where he lingered. "'Why don't I come by your place later?' He bit gently into her neck and then kissed away the small pain. And we can talk all about what's really going on here. Sarah forced herself to breathe, to take a half step back. She stumbled into the doorframe of her car with a jolt and Raj steadied her with a hand on her arm. She stared up at him, a bit stunned to realize she was actually considering it. He was a vampire. She'd known him only a few days, really only a few hours, and she was seriously considering inviting him over to her house to talk. Right. Are you messing with my mind, Raj? She asked softly. I sure as hell hope so. She laughed and shook her head at her own foolishness. Not all of us can stay up all night. I've got to teach tomorrow, and it's already late. Tomorrow night, then, he persisted. 
She smiled, thinking of Linda's birthday celebration for Sam. What would her friend do if she showed up with a vampire as her date? I'm already committed to a friend tomorrow night. What kind of friend? He demanded, scowling. She gave him an exasperated look. Not that it's any of your business, she said pointedly. But she's a friend from the university. It's her husband's birthday party. Fine, I'll meet you after. Maybe I don't know. Her next words were cut off as he lifted her effortlessly and covered her mouth with another lingering kiss. She heard herself moaning softly against his lips and knew if he'd asked at that moment, she would have gone with him anywhere he wanted. He let her go gently, her body sliding down his in a slow, suggestive glide that left little doubt as to the state of his own arousal. She leaned against his chest, feeling safe in the circle of his arms as she caught her breath. "Do you know where I live?" she asked softly. She could hear his grin when he said, "I can find out." She had no doubt that was true. In fact. She had no doubt Raj could do pretty much anything he set his mind to. All right, she said. She forced herself to pull away from him, to put a few inches distance between them so she could think. She turned and threw her purse across the seat. I guess I'll see you tomorrow. Yes, you will. Sarah trembled at the heat in those three words and wondered if she'd finally lost her mind for real, just as her parents and her therapist had thought she had way back when. Raj stood back and watched Sarah drive out of the parking lot. He found himself eager for their next meeting, and not just because he was attracted to her, although there was no question about that. In fact, his feelings for her went a little deeper than he was comfortable with. He'd wanted her in New York, if not for her rather unique position at the time as a member of Raphael's entourage. He'd have taken her, but she wasn't with Raphael any more. The scent of her perfume lingered, and he grinned. Oh yes, he was definitely going to taste his sweet Sarah, and very soon too. But he was also curious about what she was hiding, and she was definitely hiding something. He could have taken it from her mind easily. The lightest exploratory touch had already told him she was amazingly susceptible to his will, maybe more so than most humans. But it also told him she was both physically and emotionally exhausted from whatever secret she was keeping. A secret Raj would uncover before too long. Of course, it didn't hurt that the secret came wrapped in a package he intended to unwrap slowly and with great relish. He wouldn't take her quickly, as he did the women he drank from usually, not like that woman in the bar earlier. Raj didn't pretend to be anything but what he was. He was a predator, and humans were his prey, and he was very good at what he did. But for some reason, he didn't want to trick Sarah Stratton into doing his bidding. He wanted her to go with him knowingly, to invite him into her home because she wanted him there, not because her mind was clouded with lust. Although she did desire him already, she hadn't completely surrendered to it yet, but the subtle notes of her body told him she would soon. He smiled to himself. Oh yes, he was going to enjoy unwrapping Sarah Stratton very much indeed. Chapter Fourteen. Fucking commissioners throwing a wild card at us, Dan. Raj heard Scavetti's blustering from down the hall. Captain says he didn't know about it until a few minutes ago. But he could be lying through his teeth, covering his own ass. They want in on the meeting. What meeting, and who wants in on it? Raj asked, strolling into the conference room. Scavetti gave him a scathing look. Just a quick bite, huh, Gregor? 
You're a crude man, Scavetti, Raj said, not even glancing at the detective as he dropped into a chair at the end of the table, leaving a wall at his back and his face to the open door. But Felder here seems like a decent sort, so I'll assume that you're a good cop. He leaned back into the chair, perfectly at ease. Shall we continue? You got somewhere else to be, vampire? Raj gave him a smug glance. I do now. Son of a bitch, Scavetti muttered. What is it about vampires and women? He shook his head in disgust, but his voice held an undercurrent of admiration that he couldn't disguise. Raj permitted himself a slight smile, knowing it would irritate Scavetti. The burly detective responded on cue, giving him a final glare before turning his delightful personality on his partner. Cowens and Blackwood are in on the meeting. Do they know, Felder began, that we have one of the bloodsuckers here? Yeah, they know. No offense, he added giving Raj a look that made it clear offense was very much intended. Mr. Gregor, Dan Felder started. Call me Raj. Raj, Tony drawled, stretching out the single syllable. A nickname, detective. We bloodsuckers are quite big on them. Scavetti's eyes went flat as he tried to decide if he was being played, but Felder intervened once again. Come on, Tony. Mr. Gregor, uh, Raj is here to help us. We asked him to come down here, remember? Raj pitied Felder, having to work every day with such a noisome partner. But the truth was he did have an interest in getting this case solved quickly, so he tried to be more diplomatic. Lord Kristoff is very interested in resolving this matter, gentlemen. He's asked me to assist in any way I can. Lord Kristoff, huh? Scavetti sneered predictably. Well, isn't that fucking sweet? I thought we were in America, Dan. Jesus Christ, Tony, what the hell is wrong with you? Evidently, even Dan Felder could only take so much. Scavetti snapped his mouth shut, sucking back whatever he'd been about to say. He scowled at Raj as if daring him to say anything. When Raj remained silent, Scavetti gave his partner an apologetic look. I'm all right, he muttered. He turned his back in an obvious attempt to keep his next words private. It didn't work. Raj could have hurt him easily, even if he'd been standing outside the room and down the hall. But Scavetti didn't know that. It just threw me off, that's all, Scavetti said softly to Dan. The commission is showing up at the last minute like this. This case is important to me, you know that. Which is why you should welcome help from the vamps, Felder replied. What do we know about the community? Nothing, that's what. So play nice for a change, you idiot. Yeah. Tony gave a nervous laugh and steeled himself visibly before turning back to face Raj. You okay with William Cowens and his fucking spiritual advisor being in the room? Raj shrugged easily. I have no problem with that. The more information we have, the sooner we can solve this case and get back to our own lives. Believe me, detective, I am no happier to be here than you are. Disbelief flashed quickly in Tony's brown eyes, but he nodded in agreement. Cowan's and the commissioner are in a private meeting. He crooked his fingers in the air, giving the last two words air quotes for emphasis— Blackwood's with them. They should be here any minute. Raj sighed, thinking every extra minute spent in Scavetti's company had to be taking at least an hour off his immortal life. But he waited, letting thoughts of the lovely Sarah Stratton and what he had planned for her make those minutes pass more pleasantly. He jerked his thoughts away from Sarah and fixed his sight on the door moments before a big man in a dark suit walked into the room. He recognized Police Commissioner Thornton from his picture in the lobby behind the bulletproof glass. With him were William Cowens, his bodyguard, and Edward Blackwood. Commissioner Thornton took a look around, 
his gaze lighting briefly on Raj before moving on to Scavetti. Have you begun the briefing yet? No, sir, Scavetti said. Captain said to wait for you and Mr. Cowens. Then let's get this started. William, he said, addressing Cowens, these are Detectives Scavetti and Felder. He indicated each man in turn. They're heading up Patricia's case, and I have every confidence in their abilities. He pulled out two chairs, offered one to Cowens, and sat in the other. Edward Blackwood, he continued with a nod toward the H.R. founder, is Mr. Cowens's advisor in this matter, and will be serving as his press spokesman unless we decide a more personal statement is warranted. He didn't bother to introduce the bodyguard, of course. It wasn't appropriate, and no one took offense. The man eyed the room carefully, his gaze lingering on Raj before he moved to take up a position between his client and the door, while still having a clear view of everyone in the room. "'And you, sir,' Thornton said, addressing Raj directly, "'must be the representative from our local vampire community.' He all but choked on the words, which Raj found amusing. That most humans preferred to believe vampires didn't exist was understandable, even preferable to the vampire community. As he'd told Kristoff, vampires survived largely by living below the radar, so to speak. If the humans thought too much about what walked among them, they might be prodded into doing something about it. And as powerful as vampires were, they were few in number, especially compared to the billions of humans now walking the earth but it always surprised him when the human authorities permitted themselves to remain equally ignorant. Thornton was the police commissioner of a major American city, a city which was controlled by a vampire lord, no less, a city that hosted the most powerful vampires on the continent at the Vampire Council meeting every eighth year. And the man couldn't even say the word vampire without choking on it. But Raj kept these thoughts private. He rose slightly, just enough to extend his hand halfway across the table, establishing the pecking order by forcing the commissioner to do likewise. Raymond Gregor, he said. He noticed the commissioner avoided looking at him directly, and once again had to stifle the urge to laugh out loud. Television and movies had spread many myths about vampires, most of them utter foolishness, although some played into the vampire's hands quite nicely. The need for eye contact was one of them. It helped sometimes to focus the target's attention. But if Raj wanted to seize control of a human's mind, he certainly didn't need to waste time staring into his eyes to do so. Always an honor to meet some of our fine men in blue, detectives. Blackwood's voice broke the sudden tension. Even if you wear a suit, he added, with his patented charming smile. He shook hands with the two detectives. And Mr. Gregor, he enthused, shaking Raj's hand in turn. This is indeed a pleasure. My institute would love to open a dialogue with your people. I believe we have much in common. Raj accepted the handshake without comment. Humanity, realized, had been after the vampire community for years trying to open a dialogue. Vampires were all but immortal, and H.R. wanted to know why so they could sell the secret to wealthy humans and thus fulfill their mission of realizing what they considered to be the full human potential. Since the last thing the people of Earth, or vampires either for that matter, needed was a competing bunch of rich immortal assholes running around— Every vampire council on the planet had issued a firm edict. There was to be no cooperation of any sort with humans when it came to researching vampire physiology. It was the one thing, possibly the only thing, every council member agreed upon wholeheartedly, and they enforced that edict absolutely. The penalty was death, permanent and instant death for any vampire caught breaking the edict. No trial, no appeal. Vampire justice had its own code, and it was uncompromising. I'd like to make something clear right now, Cowan said, 
his tone suggesting he was accustomed to having strict attention paid to everything he said. And indeed, silence fell as everyone in the room turned to look at him. My daughter is missing. He breathed deeply in and out through his nose, his jaw clenched, visibly struggling to bring his emotions under control. I know how this works, he said bluntly. I know you all think she's dead already. His eyes grew hard and he stared at Felder and Scavetti. I don't believe that. I won't believe that until I have a body to take home. I want a full investigation, do you understand me? I don't care if you resent me talking to you this way. You can complain to your union, to the commissioner, to God himself, I don't care. I want my daughter found. Dead. He closed his eyes against the pain. Dead or alive, he continued hoarsely, or heads will roll. Do you understand me? Felder and Scavetti returned his stare, and Raj gave them credit for not being cowed by the explicit threat. Cowans had more than enough influence to get a couple of city detectives broken down to street cops if they failed him, and they had to know that. And you, Cowan said, turning his angry gaze on Raj, who regarded him impassively. I don't give a fuck who you are, or who your so-called master is. If one of you monsters has my daughter, if you've harmed a single hair on her head. Cowan's rose and leaned forward across the table. I have resources you cannot imagine, vampire. No hole will be deep enough to hide you. He kicked his chair out of the way suddenly, raked all of them with an angry glare, and strode from the room, his bodyguard racing to hit the doorway before he did. Blackwood scrambled to his feet only steps behind, but the commissioner merely stood and watched them leave. When he turned back, his expression was somber. This is a difficult case, gentlemen. Not just for you, but for the department. I'm trusting you to take care of it. And he, too, departed, leaving just the three of them once again. Well, that was useful, Raj commented dryly. He straightened from his casual slouch to put both elbows on the table. So tell me, gentlemen, why exactly was Sarah Stratton here tonight? Scavetti swung around and stared at him for a few silent minutes, and then shook his head, chuckling in disbelief. She called, said she had an in with the local honcho. He gave Raj a skeptical look. You a boss, I assume. One would think. What's Blackwood's involvement? Fuck if I know. He seems to like you well enough. Maybe you should ask him yourself, Raj. Raj studied Scavetti lazily, thinking how easy it would be to grab the foul-mouthed detective some night and make him disappear. Would anyone miss him, he wondered? Could even a Neanderthal like Scavetti have people who loved him? Are you married, detective? he asked. You have a wife? A family? Scavetti regarded him suspiciously. What the hell do you care? Raj shrugged. Just curious. Well, leave me the fuck out of your curiosity. And if you want to know more about Stratton, you can ask her yourself, asshole. Felder rolled his eyes. How about we get on with the briefing, Tony? Raj here isn't the only one with a social life. I've got a late date with my next ex-wife. Scavetti brooded a few minutes longer, staring blankly at the wall. And then, with no outward warning, both hands slapped the table, rattling Felder's already chipped coffee cup and knocking over a couple of unopened water bottles. Fuck yeah, he announced. Let's do this. He stood and stomped over to a whiteboard which ran along the entire far wall. There was a roughly five-by-six-foot piece of thick poster stock leaning against the board, and Scavetti moved it aside to reveal a series of photographs and notes taped to the whiteboard itself. We've got three women over the last month who matched the profile, he said, suddenly all business. All three missing, no bodies found yet. What is the profile? Raj asked curiously. Scavetti gave him a dirty look, but said, 
We're going on the assumption that there's a vampire link for now, so that's fucking number one. The rest is the usual. Age, appearance, access. William Cowens' daughter, Patricia, 18 and single, was last seen at a vamp party. It was an open affair, advertised in the dorms in various places on campus, on bulletin boards and so on. We spoke to her airhead roommate, who says she persuaded Cowens to go to the party at the last minute, that she'd never been to one before. At this point, we don't think she was specifically targeted. There have been no calls to a father, no ransom demand, not even with all the publicity, which doesn't say much for her fucking chances. Unless one of you guys has her, he asked with fake curiosity. I understand you keep him alive for a few days. Raj didn't bother to respond, and Scavetti continued with a grunt. Anyway, for now it looks like a random snatch. She left the party early and, as far as we can tell, alone, and no one has seen her since. We do know she never made it back to the dorm. Going back to the most recent incident before Cowan's. He moved down the board to the picture of another young woman who looked older than Patricia Cowan's, but not by much. Regina Aiello, 21 years old, living with her mother who filed a missing report. Mother says she went out with friends, kind of a girl's night out before someone's wedding that weekend. We talk to the friends who say they all went to a fucking bloodhouse. That's apparently the in thing for bachelorette parties these days, Dan interrupted to add. No more Chippendale dances, I guess. Now it's vampires. The others didn't realize she was missing. Tony raised his voice slightly over his partner and kept talking until the mother started calling around the next day. Apparently several of her group peeled away during the festivities to do God knows what, and they just assumed Aiello had done the same. The mother says she didn't know they were going to a bloodhouse and seemed pretty shocked by the idea. Talking to the girl's friends, I get the impression Aiello wasn't exactly a player. Raj listened with half an ear to the facts, interviews with Aiello's friends and so on but pushed away from the table and stood, walking over to the board where he studied the pictures of the missing women. Trisha Cowens's disappearance might be questionable. Those ridiculous vamp parties had nothing to do with anything truly vampire. But Aiello disappearing from a bloodhouse was troubling. Raj frowned and kept reading as Scavetti's expletive-laced recitation moved on to the next woman— the first one taken as far as they knew. Martha Polk, 19, engaged to be married but living with her parents. She was employed by an upscale catering company and had worked a private party downtown, after which several people, including some of the waitstaff, went to another of the blood houses. Raj saw a definite pattern developing. But whether it was vampires or someone who wanted it to look like vampires was the big question. Not that everyone went right home from the bloodhouses. Scavetti wasn't far off on that point. When a vampire found a tasty and amenable partner, it wasn't unusual for the two of them to spend a few days together, especially on a weekend. The very young woman who'd been lounging around Christoph's office earlier was a good example— but Polk had been gone nearly a month, and that was far too long. Polk's group have all developed fucking amnesia about the night in question, Scavetti was saying. Not one of them will say for sure that Polk was with them at the bloodhouse, but they won't say she wasn't either. Apparently her fiancé's the jealous type, and no one wants to pony up and get her in trouble. Like she's not in fucking trouble already. Raj studied the young woman's picture, which was from her work photo ID. She seemed too young to be getting married. Her face was open and expressive, with a big smile and brown hair that was swept into a bouncy-looking ponytail. And then there's Dr. Estelle Edwards, Scavetti continued. She fits the time frame, disappearing about a week before Polk, and there's a vamp connection. But she's older than the others and travels in radically different circles. She's a research M.D. at the university. Raj moved down to Edward's profile, which was set apart from the rest. 
He leaned closer, straining to read someone's uneven handwriting. He frowned. Her husband said she'd gone out to meet a local vampire connection. What the hell was that about? He shifted his gaze once again to scan the pictures pinned across the top of the board. Scavetti was right. Estelle Edwards stood out. She was only in her late thirties, but with her carefully coiffed and highlighted blonde hair and her well-fleshed face, she appeared much older, almost matronly. Each of the three others was petite and dark-haired, with a youthful ripeness to them that Raj recognized as the kind of women who many vamps, including him, enjoyed feeding from. That ripeness gave them a special glow. Softening their cheeks and plumping their lips into a pouty fullness that invited a vampire to crush them with his mouth and sip at the juice of life. He turned back to the image of Estelle Edwards. Everything about her said settled, married, matron. She was attractive enough, but she'd never have turned heads the way the other three did. What kind of research? Raj asked, interrupting Scavetti's flow. The detective looked over with a predictable scowl, which transformed to quick interest when he saw the picture Raj was looking at. I'm not sure. You remember Dan? Yeah. Felder was flipping through his notes. Ah,、uh, hematology. Blood, Raj said unhappily. Her husband said she's been trying to get funding for a study of vampires. Felder added, wants to figure out whatever it is that makes them. He jerked a look at Raj, as if he'd forgotten for a moment there was a real vampire in the room with him. That is why you all live so long and everything. A dangerous subject, Raj said thoughtfully. How did she plan to do it without a test subject? What do you mean? He turned all the way around and looked between the two detectives, trying to decide how much to say. I mean, it's hard to study blood without a sample, and no vampire would have cooperated, not willingly anyway, or unless he had a death wish. Why not? We don't share, Raj said flatly. How do you know she's part of this case? Maybe she pressured a vampire who didn't want to cooperate and got killed for her efforts. We are not sure she is actually. Like Tony says, the timing fits, and there's a definite vamp connection. But for the rest of it, Felder shrugged. You might be right about some vamp getting pissed and taking her out, but her husband was pretty insistent that she'd made contact with someone in the vampire community, someone who was willing to cooperate in her research, and he told us she'd already met whoever it was at least once before. Did this supposed contact have a name? Scavetti snorted a dismissive laugh. I asked the same thing. He says she's very secretive about her work. We took a hard fucking look at the husband. I'll tell you, but I don't think there's anything there, as in nothing's there. I got the impression they don't spend that much time together. No heat, if you know what I mean. He's a doc at the university too, Felder added. Heads up a big psychiatric clinic or something. He seemed awfully certain his wife was going to get her samples, though. Says she had drug companies lining up to sponsor her, a lot of money too. How much money? Raj asked curiously. The good doctor almost choked on his own tongue trying to avoid answering that question, but I got him to admit we're talking well into the tens of millions. Interesting, Raj said, concealing his rising concern. I'll check into that angle for you," he said. "Someone may have been playing her along, either human or vampire, and if that's true, I'll find him, or her. I'd like to talk to Edwards's husband," he said, "and maybe visit her lab." "I'll set something," Felder started to say, but Scavetti interrupted, ignoring his partner's look of surprise. "That's not going to happen, Gregor." We appreciate the cooperation and all, but I can't have you contaminating my case, going around talking to people, muddying up my investigation. Raj didn't bother arguing. 
It no longer mattered what the detective did or didn't want. Kristoff had sent him here to cooperate with the police in their investigation, and he'd done so. But Raj had assumed going in that there was no vampire involved in these crimes, that all of this cooperation was just for show. He'd learned enough tonight to make him doubt that assumption, and that meant any real cooperation with the authorities was now over. If vampires were involved, it was an internal matter and it would be handled accordingly. If Edwards's husband was right and a vampire was providing blood for this research, well, there was only one possible outcome for that vampire and any humans involved with him, and that outcome probably wouldn't be acceptable to the human authorities. Raj glanced once again at the board, memorizing the salient facts of all four missing women, before turning away to stroll around the table. I guess we're done here, then. He glanced at Scavetti, who seemed surprised by his quick capitulation, even though he'd been the one insisting Raj get off the case and out of his life. Excellent, Raj said when no one objected. He started for the door, but a sudden thought made him stop and turn. If there is a vampire mixed up in any of this, I will find him, and he will be dealt with. For your own safety, gentlemen, leave that part of the investigation to me. If I learn anything that might help your own efforts, I'll let you know. In the meantime... He pulled a slim gold case out of his inner jacket pocket. My numbers, he said, opening the case and dropping a few thick white business cards on the table. Call any time, although night is always better, he said with a quick grin. Scavetti was still growling when Raj walked through the lobby and out into the dark night to begin searching for answers. Chapter 15 The temperature had dropped a few more degrees while Raj had been inside. Damn Buffalo and its weather. It reminded him of his hometown on the Baltic coast of Poland. The cold and wet had seemed to last forever there, too, days passing one after the other without even a glimmer of honest sunshine. His father had been a dock worker, and every once in a while, especially in winter, a crate of oranges from Italy or Spain would just happen to break open, spilling its cargo all over the dock. On those days, his father always brought home a few of the ripe, succulent globes wrapped in thin tissue paper like priceless treasures. The thick perfume of the citrus oil as his mother peeled away the skin, the sweetness of the juice as they savored each portion. A much younger Raj had dreamt of sun-drenched hillsides filled with beautiful women in skimpy dresses plucking the golden rounds into their aprons. A bus drove past on the street, spewing exhaust and crashing into his reverie. Raj sighed. It had been centuries since he'd seen the sun. On the other hand, there had been no shortage of beautiful women in skimpy dresses. He thought of Sarah Stratton and her red dress. Unfortunately, Sarah would have to wait until tomorrow. He had a vampire to talk to tonight. The drive to Kristoff's was a short one. The streets mostly empty of traffic. It was late for mortals, but the middle of the workday for vampires. Raj pulled out his cell phone and scrolled through the stored numbers, finding the one he wanted. Yeah, Joseph answered. We should meet, Raj said. There was a moment of silence. Give me a couple of hours. I'll be outside. Raj hung up. Two hours to kill. The luscious Sarah Stratton came to mind once more, but she was probably tucked safely into her bed by now, all toasty and warm. Ah, well. Two hours. He might as well check out the house where Patricia Cowens was last seen. 
he made a quick U-turn and drove back to his lair, staying there just long enough to get rid of the suit and pull on his usual cold-weather ensemble of sweater, jeans, and leather jacket, all in black. Back in the BMW, he called up the address of the missing girl's last known location from memory and entered it into his dash GPS for directions. There was a time when these streets had been as familiar to him as the docks of Poland, and this part of the city hadn't changed much in the intervening years. But unlike the streets of his childhood, Buffalo had no nostalgic hold on his memories. He'd let them go as soon as he'd left. This was no longer his town, if it had ever been. Cruising down the silent streets, he parked a couple of blocks away from the house where Patricia Cowens had attended the vamp wannabe party. No one knew exactly where or when she'd disappeared. She'd left the house a little after eleven, telling her roommate she intended to catch the bus back to campus. But she'd never made it back to the dorm, and the driver on the only bus running that night didn't remember picking her up. Of course, after a while, every passenger probably looked the same to those guys, but the police were going on the assumption she'd been taken between the house and the bus stop, probably before she ever reached the busy main street. The area was quiet when he climbed from his car and looked around. Nearby, a dog barked briefly, but quickly gave up the effort as Raj moved down the street. The neighborhood was older, rows of modest houses on lots just big enough to give the illusion of privacy. They were well kept for the most part, the driveways filled with minivans and mid-sized cars. It was a work night, so all the good citizens were sound asleep, their houses locked up tight, with only the occasional gleam of a nightlight through a window or the rare porch light to chase away the dark. Raj walked right up to the house where the party had been held climbing the stairs and turning around to stand on the porch and stare outward. There were street lights here, but plenty of trees, too. In the summer, the trees would block much of the light from the overhead lamps, but with winter only a couple of weeks gone, most of the trees were still bare, their branches casting twisted skeletons of shadow on the sidewalk and empty front yards. There'd been no sign of a struggle, he remembered from the report on Scavetti's board. No blood, not that the human police could find anyway. No torn bits of clothing or discarded possessions. More significantly, no one had heard anything at all. The dog down the street hadn't barked enough for the owner to notice, and there'd been no screams, no shouts. But if William Cowens was right, and his daughter's abductor was a vampire, she would have gone willingly. And if that vampire had hung around long enough, the dog would have grown used to him and stopped barking, just as he had for Raj tonight. He studied the silent street. Whoever had taken the girl had been waiting, not for her specifically, perhaps, but for someone from the party. And if Scavetti's working theory was correct, the abductor had done it at least twice before so he'd have found some place dark where no one would notice him, but with a clear view of the house so he could see people coming and going, waiting for a woman who left alone, a young woman like Patricia Cowens. Raj concentrated on the pattern of shadows and light, places where one of his own could have hidden. Three houses down and across the street, in between two older brick homes, was a space of roughly ten feet. The far house had a porch light burning, but none of that light made it to the dark canyon between the two houses. He scanned the neighborhood slowly and stepped off the porch, striding down the cracked walk and across the street. As he drew closer to the hide, his head came up and his already enhanced vampire senses snapped to attention. He drew a deep breath into his lungs, tasting the air as he moved closer, his boots nearly soundless on the dry grass. If a vampire was powerful enough, he could wrap himself in darkness and all but disappear, especially at night and with no direct light. In shadows as deep as these, there, some sort of cologne. It was faint, but Raj's sense of smell was far stronger than a human's, and, though it had been cold, there'd been no rain or snow since Trish had been kidnapped only a few days earlier. 
He inhaled again and wrinkled his nose in distaste. Too sweet. But mingled with the cologne was the old blood scent of vampire. Damn it. He'd come here hoping to prove himself wrong, to find evidence that it was a human preying on his own, not some rogue who'd decided to break every rule of vampire society in the New Age. He drew another breath, fixing the scent in his memory. It took power to hide in the shadows, to come upon the victim without her seeing anything. Other than Raj himself, Kristoff didn't generally keep people around who were strong enough to do something like that. If anything, the vampire lord's newest minions were weaker than ever, probably because Kristoff knew his control was weakening as well. Had an outsider sensed this vulnerability and moved in without Kristoff's knowledge? Someone who was scouting the area in preparation for a takeover? If so, the intruder would have no choice but to hunt in order to feed. The human donors at the bloodhouses would be unavailable to an outsider, someone who wasn't supposed to be here and had to hide his presence. But why abduct the women? Why not simply find a willing companion and wipe her mind as Raj had done earlier? He took a step out of the shadows between the two houses, but retreated quickly when he heard a car approaching from down the block, moving slowly, as if searching for an address. He watched as the driver almost stopped in front of the party house, but then kept going to park in front of the neighbors instead. The engine was turned off, and the interior light came on as the driver got out and closed the door, her eyes glued to the house where Trish Cowens had been seen last. Raj grinned, not at all surprised that the driver was Sarah Stratton. If anything, it gave him a moment of personal satisfaction. He'd been right about her. She was involved in this case somehow, and in a way she didn't want anyone to know. Wrapping the darkness around himself, just as the abductor must have done, Raj crossed the street, no more than the shadow of a cloud passing over the waning moon as it slid through the night. He approached her in perfect silence, until he was standing only a few feet away, beneath the bare branches of an elm. She was close enough that he could hear her every breath, hear her heart beating rapidly with nervousness, or perhaps fear. Not so bold as Rod, she walked only halfway up the uneven walk toward the house, muttering softly under her breath the whole way. What little he could make out of her words made no sense to him. She stopped and stared at the dark porch and then turned and headed quickly back toward her car, seeming suddenly eager to leave. Still unaware of him standing there, she hurried down the sidewalk, her stiletto heels clicking sharply on the cement. She passed right by him, arms crossed tightly, holding herself in a way that suggested the chill was coming from something other than the weather. Raj stepped out behind her and pulled her back against his chest, holding her there with one hand over her mouth to catch her scream. "'I thought you'd be safe in your bed by now, little one,' he murmured close to her ear. He gentled his hold without letting her go, exquisitely aware of her body against his, the thud of her heart against his arm where he held her tightly, and the fading shivers of fear as she realized who it was holding her. She was tiny compared to him, he could have lifted her bodily and carried her away easily, even as Trish Cowens had been carried away only days before. But he wasn't some rogue vampire, and this wasn't Trish Cowens. If I take my hand away, will you promise not to scream? She jerked her head downward in what he took for a scent. He dropped his hand from her mouth, resting it on the swell of her hip instead, still holding her in place. She drew in a long breath, but didn't try to break free. She relaxed in his arms briefly, letting her head fall back against his chest. "'You're trembling,' he said quietly. She stiffened in outrage. "'You scared me half to death!' Raj chuckled, shifting his grip and turning it into a caress, enjoying the feel of her soft curves beneath his hands, 
the warm weight of her breasts against his arms. What are you doing here, Sarah? She made a move then, but he only held her more securely. I was just curious, she insisted, and I'm worried about Trish. Sarah, Sarah, he chided. You are lying again. He let go of her as she spun around to glare at him. What are you doing here? He raised an eyebrow at her. I'm cooperating in an active police investigation. You, on the other hand, were told your services were not required. And yet here you are. He felt more than saw the heat of her blush. At least I wasn't sneaking around in the shadows spying on people, she muttered, refusing to meet his gaze. Raj gestured at the wide-open space. I was hardly sneaking. You simply didn't notice me, for which I am deeply wounded. He expected a smile, but instead she looked up at him with eyes filled with fear. She didn't see him either, she whispered. He was just... there. Who? Raj asked, suddenly intent. He stifled a sudden irritating urge to reach out to her, to pull her close and reassure her that nothing could harm her as long as he was with her. He wanted answers. What do you know, Sarah? She stared at him with haunted eyes, searching his face, looking for... What? Raj wondered. Nothing, she whispered. Nightmares. They don't mean anything. Her voice caught on the final words. He did reach out for her then, but she beat him to it, taking hold of the front of his jacket with both hands and gripping the leather like a lifeline. She was trembling again, and he wrapped his arms around her in confusion. "'Tell me their names, Raj,' she demanded unexpectedly, raising her head enough to give him a searching look. "'The other women. Tony wouldn't tell me.' Raj frowned. Why do you need their names, Sarah? She choked out a harsh laugh and lowered her forehead to his chest. Because I need to know whether or not I'm going crazy. Her voice was muffled against his sweater, but he could hear the desperation in her voice. It troubled him more than it should have, but it made his decision easy. You know about Trish. She's been in the papers. Sarah looked up at him in surprise, as if she hadn't expected him to answer her plea. She nodded. There are three other women. Estelle Edwards, Martha Polk, and Regina Aiello. Her face seemed to crumple, a sob escaping her lips as she hid her face once more against his chest. Regina, she said softly, I'm so sorry. Sorry for what, Sarah? Tell me what's going on. Nothing, she said, stepping back from him to stand on her own, even as one hand stroked the front of his sweater, wiping away the wetness of her tears. Regina's mother is someone I know. She's been worried, and when I heard about this case, I don't know what I'll tell her now. She was lying again, damn it. We need to talk about this. Your place, now, he said impatiently. I'll follow you. No. She met his angry gaze, the gold flecks in her hazel eyes glinting in the streetlights. It's late, she offered as an excuse. I shouldn't have come at all. I don't know what I thought I'd find here. Raj studied her silently, debating. She knew something, or thought she did. On the other hand, she hadn't even known the names of the missing women, beyond Trish Cowan's, so whatever she thought she knew didn't get to the heart of whoever was doing this. Probably. And he still had to meet with Joseph tonight. All right, he said, unsmiling. Tomorrow night, then. She stared back at him, as if not quite trusting his easy surrender. So we're good, right? Raj smiled then a slow curving of his lips. Oh, yes, Sarah, we're very good. She backed several steps away from him, retreating as she would have from a dangerous animal, 
as if she was worried he would suddenly leap upon her and ravage her right here on this cold buffalo street. The thought kept him amused as she turned finally and hurried to her car. She passed him when she drove away, giving a little wave through her open window. Raj smiled, and when she was gone, he punched a speed dial number. My lord, Emily answered instantly, how may I serve you? Raj winced. He hated that formal vampire shit, and M knew it. She only fell back on the formalities if she was pissed at him or if someone else was listening. And he couldn't think of anything he'd done to piss her off lately. Get rid of whoever it is, M. We need to talk. Yes, my lord. Raj waited, listening as M moved herself, rather than asking the others to leave. He could hear her steady breathing as she walked a door opening and closing, and then another. Okay, she said in a far more casual tone. I'm in the office. What's up, boss? Congratulations, he said dryly. You win. Get some of my people up here. Not an army, not yet, anyway. Just some backup. And no one but my own children, people I can trust absolutely. Yes, she breathed in obvious relief. We're ready to go, my lord. I put out a heads up right after you left, just in case. If we leave immediately, we can be there before dawn. Tomorrow night, soon enough. There's nothing specific yet, but there's a possibility someone from out of town is moving in on Kristoff, and I'm not going to let that happen. Only give the word, my lord. What would I do without you, M? You'd manage. Not as well, of course, she added, but you'd manage. Thanks. One more thing, M. I want to know everything we've got on the woman who visited Manhattan with Raphael and his mate last week, Sarah Stratton. Put Simon on it and tell him to go deep. I already know she teaches at the university here in Buffalo, so that's a place to start. But I want everything Simon can find. If he needs a picture, she should be on the security video from the club. Okay, M said slowly. You picking up stray kittens again, boss? Raj laughed. Her curiosity was fairly burning through the ether, but Raj didn't feel like saying anything more. Not yet. I'll talk to you later, M, he said, ignoring her question. He disconnected the call pocketed his phone and opened the car door, sliding into the comfortable interior. As he drove away in the opposite direction Sarah had taken, he thought about stray kittens and about Emily. She was always telling him he had a weakness for damsels in distress. And she should know, since the damsel he'd rescued once upon a time had been Emily herself. Albany, New York, 1918 Raj strolled down the darkened street, drinking in the excitement, the fear. The United States was at war. Men were lining up to go fight in Europe, seeking a glory in battle that would never be found on the streets of their hometowns. Raj could have warned them, could have told them there was nothing exciting about the stink of a battlefield, the blood and excrement, the screams of your friends dying all around you while you could do nothing but fight to save your own miserable life. But he said nothing. They wouldn't have listened anyway. Eager young men roamed the streets of Albany, drunk for the most part, enjoying a final fling before Uncle Sam sent them out to become soldiers. By tomorrow they'd be regretting this last night of indulgence, when their heads were throbbing, their stomachs rebelling, and they were stuck on a hot, crowded bus for the journey to some dismal boot camp. But for some of them, most of them probably, tonight was their first real taste of freedom, their first time away from the family farm, the small town scrutiny. Fights were common, but the police paid little attention, recognizing the futility of trying to bring order to a chaos that would dissipate itself in a day or two anyway. And as long as the new recruits limited themselves to pounding on each other, no one cared. He turned away from the main boulevard, seeking the side streets, 
the dark alleys where fledgling soldiers could be found sleeping or passed out. Either way, they were a quick, easy meal for a hungry vampire. The noise of a crowd drew his attention to what should have been a quiet side street. A rowdy group of men had gathered, shouting encouragements and threats. Yet another fistfight, no doubt. Raj almost turned away. There was nothing for him in these squabbles. But something made him turn back and take a second look. It wasn't the words the men were shouting. He could barely make those out. But the taunts carried a raw brutality, a gutter meanness that burned against his senses. Raj frowned, pushing his way through the crowd until he drew close enough to see what was going on over the shoulders of others. He swore viciously and shoved the rest of the way forward with a purpose, tossing bodies aside in his fury. A young woman lay at the heart of the circle, half naked, bloody and beaten, her latest rapist grunting between her legs. Raj kicked out, his thick boot breaking ribs with a resounding crunch. The man screamed as he flew through the air, the noise cut off with a choked gurgle when he hit a nearby wall. Raj crouched and spun, ready to fight, mouth open, fangs fully displayed, seeing the faint gleam of blue as his vampire-enhanced eyes burned ice cold with rage. Young men who moments earlier had been full of bravado at the prospect of raping a helpless woman fled before the wrath of vampire. Screams faded down the alley as they ran, trampling each other in their hurry to escape. To one side, the injured rapist was struggling to crawl away, whimpering wordlessly. Raj took a step forward, intending to drain him dry, to ensure he never again brutalized a helpless woman. But from behind him came a small, lost sound. He turned back toward the woman. She'd curled in on herself, thin fingers struggling to pull the tatters of her clothing around her battered body to cover her nakedness. He whipped off his jacket and covered her, careful not to touch her, letting her grasp the ends of the fabric to her chest as she shook silently. "'Let me help you, child,' he said softly. His voice was deep and melodic, the same voice he used to seduce the unwary, to persuade the unsuspecting to open their veins for him. She stilled, trembling like a small animal beneath the gaze of a predator, refusing to look at him, as if that would somehow save her. Do you have family? he asked. She started crying then, quiet sobs that racked her entire body. Raj wanted to reassure her, to tell her he could make it all go away. His blood might not be as strong as that of his master, Lord Kristoff, and she was very badly injured, but he was vampire nonetheless and his blood was stronger than most, strong enough to heal her injuries, strong enough that he could wipe this night from her mind, make it as if it had never happened. But in her present state she wouldn't have heard him, much less believed something so fantastic. Let me help you, he repeated instead. He laid a single gentle hand on her back, wincing as she jerked away from his touch, her cries finally finding voice as she grew more frantic. He sighed. The last thing she needed was a man's hands on her, but the sun was rising and he had to get inside. I'm sorry, sweetheart, he said. He scooped her up easily, silencing her cries with a quick mental jab that stole her consciousness and left her limp in his arms. It was crude but effective, and time was running out. As he sped down the side streets toward his hideaway, racing the sun, he thought to wonder what he was going to do with her now that he'd saved her. Chapter 16 Buffalo, New York, Present Day Raj pulled into the curb near Kristoff's and turned off the engine, climbing out of the car to lean against its warmth in the chilly early morning, 
waiting for Joseph to appear. He sometimes thought about the men who'd attacked Emily all those years ago. They'd been ordinary men, sons, fathers, and brothers. Some of them had no doubt died in the war. Others would have come home, raised families, and grown old. One way or another, they were almost certainly dead by now. Had they ever remembered that night in the alley? Had they ever watched their own daughters grow and been ashamed of what they'd done? There were people who called him a monster, people who would have wiped out every vampire on earth. But did they ever look at their own neighbors and wonder? He looked up as the front door opened on silent hinges. A deeper shadow resolved into Joseph's bulk, reminding Raj that Joseph, too, possessed the power to manipulate shadow if he chose. But Joseph wasn't the assailant. Raj dismissed that idea almost as soon as it occurred. Joseph was powerful enough, but it took intelligence and discipline to climb high in the vampire hierarchy. And that's where Joseph fell short. He was the perfect tool, reliable but completely without imagination. It was both an asset and a weakness in a security chief. He would never stage a rebellion, but he might not see someone else's rebellion coming either. In Raj's estimation, no one knew this better than Joseph himself. He had a good position here with Kristoff and a vested interest in keeping it that way. The security chief passed between the twinkling lights along the front walk, cutting across the yard, making directly for him. Raj, Joseph said when he got close enough. It's been a while since you visited Buffalo. Raj smiled to himself. Like Kristoff, Joseph preferred it when Raj was far away from the city. He shrugged carelessly. The old man doesn't like me around, and I'm content with Manhattan. Joseph raised his eyes to meet Raj's. So how can I help you? Help me get back to Manhattan, Raj thought, smiling. I see a lot of new faces, he said. The other vampire didn't respond immediately, turning to gaze up the street instead. Raj didn't hurry him. If Joseph wanted Raj gone, this was the best way to make that happen. Eventually, his mind would work around to that conclusion. In the meantime, Raj waited. Too many new faces, Joseph said abruptly. Kristoff's turning five, sometimes ten a month, and every one of them's as stupid as that idiot Morales, Joseph continued. An army? Raj asked sharply. Cannon fodder, more likely. But against what threat? None that I know of. Raj considered this in light of his suspicions. Any new vamps move into the area. Anyone who's strong enough to challenge Kristoff. Joseph barked a laugh. Other than you, you mean? It can't be me he's worried about. I've given him no reason. Yet, he added to himself, I'm talking about someone else, an outsider. Maybe someone in town unofficially. Joseph's gaze sharpened. You know something I don't? Rod shrugged and said, I went by the house where Cowens' daughter was taken last weekend. The sign was old, but there had been someone there, someone strong enough to stalk his prey undetected on an empty street. Joseph stiffened. If Kristoff thought someone was poaching, someone who could do what you say, I'd have heard about it. You know how he is. If there was any real danger, he'd be shoving everyone he could find between him and the threat— he paused, making the connection. You think that might be what this is? Why he's got all this new meat hanging around? But why not tell me about it? Now that was a good question. Kristoff understood Joseph's limitations every bit as well as Raj did, which was why he kept Joseph close and Raj far away. But if the vampire lord truly was falling into senility— he might not be thinking as logically as he once did. Raj scraped his fingers back through his hair in frustration. Damn that old man. Okay, look, 
I'm going to talk to some people about these missing women. Witnesses, family members, the usual. I will find whoever's doing this, and if it's one of us, I'll make him go away. He paused thoughtfully, remembering that too sweet cologne. Or her. Joseph's head came up. Her? You think it's a woman? No, I don't. But I can't rule it out, either, he added, thinking of Emily. Not as a suspect, but as an example. Like humans, female vampires were generally weaker than their male counterparts. But if the vampire had enough power, physical strength became less important, especially if the victim was a little girl like Patricia Cowan's. Joseph frowned as if trying to wrap his mind around the idea. Are the cops really letting you in on their investigation? No, they're not. They pretty much just wanted to go through the motions so they could say they'd tried. But I don't need their permission to ask questions. He started to say something about Sarah, but changed his mind. He might not trust her right now. She was definitely keeping something from him— but he still wanted to keep her as far away as possible from Kristoff and his clowns. Frowning, he tossed his keys up and caught them. I've got to go. You stay in touch, Joseph. He spun around without waiting for Joseph's reply, walked around the car, and opened the driver's door. By the time he was pulling away from the curb, the other vampire was already gone— and Raj was wondering why the very idea of another vampire coming anywhere near Sarah made his hackles rise. Chapter 17 Sarah struggled to keep her eyes open the next day, listening with only half an ear as the faculty meeting droned on. She'd gotten little sleep last night, partly because she was afraid the dreams would come back, the other part was because she'd tossed and turned like a silly teenager thinking about Raj and slow, soft kisses. She told herself it was just because she hadn't had a serious relationship with a man in a very long time. Not since college, and even then it hadn't been really serious. She'd learned early on to avoid close friendships because questions always got asked about the past, about where she grew up, where her family lived the kind of questions Sarah didn't have good answers for. Sin had been an exception to the rule, because, simply put, Sin didn't pry. And now, of course, there was her new friend, the incredibly sexy Raj. She remembered a professor she'd had in graduate school. He'd been born in Poland before the war, had survived the destruction of his small Jewish village, the obliteration of everyone and everything he knew— not only his entire family, although that was horrific enough, but of an entire way of life. She'd been his teaching assistant for a year and had spent a lot of time with him, drinking tea and listening to his stories of a world that was gone forever. He'd told her all sorts of things, but what she recalled now was a bit of wisdom from the old country. She'd never mastered the Polish words. It was a difficult language, and one you could study for years and still not get the nuances right. But a rough translation had been something like, for every monster there's a monster to love him. Maybe that's what she saw in Raj. They were both monsters of a sort, freaks in a world of people who went about their lives, never having to worry about dreams of tortured women or, well, whatever it was vampires worried about blood, she supposed, and where to get it. She became aware of movement around her and realized the meeting was breaking up at last. Across the table, the department chairman was giving her an odd look, and she tried to look thoughtful and scholarly instead of bored as she gathered up her papers and shoved them into her oversized purse. She must have succeeded, because he gave her a short approving nod before joining a group of the more senior i.e. male, department members who would now troop over to the nearest bar and drink themselves into a stupor. One thing she'd noticed right away about academics. They drank a lot. At least the older ones did. And who knew? 
A few more years of these meetings, and she might be drinking a lot, too. She started for the elevator with everyone else, but a glance at her watch sent her racing for the stairs instead. She wanted to shower and change before tonight. She might be a monster, but that didn't mean she had to look or smell like one. Raj woke in a much better mood on his second night in the city. He'd had plenty of time this morning to get back to his lair, strip off his clothes, and even enjoy a nice cold shot of vodka before settling down to sleep the day away, safe in his personal vault below the streets of downtown Buffalo. And it didn't hurt that he'd be paying Sarah a personal visit very soon. The taste of her skin had been sweet. Her blood would be even sweeter. He frowned. There was, however, a lot more to Sarah Stratton than a sweet taste. She was hiding something, and he intended to know what it was before this night was over. He checked his watch. It was just after eight. There was one stop he needed to make first, some preparations for M and the troops. And then sweet Sarah would have his undivided attention and he would have his answers. His phone rang as he pulled up to a big industrial building not far from Buffalo's International Airport. Where are you, M? he answered. My lord, M said, speaking loudly to be heard over the considerable background noise of a small airport. We're loading supplies now. We'll be there before midnight. I'm at the safe house, he said, staring out the windshield at the darkened building. I'll turn on the lights and warm it up, but I won't be here when you arrive. I'm meeting someone in a few minutes. Dinner, boss? You could say that. Speaking of which, you've all fed tonight, right? You have to ask? Right. Have everyone stay close when you get into town. I'll come by later and fill you in. But something is majorly fucked up in this city, and I don't want any of my people going out there blind. Will do, boss. Later. Raj slipped the phone into his jacket pocket and got out of the car. The old warehouse loomed two stories above him, lit only by the big security lights all along its substantial length and above the door. Its brick walls were old and blackened from years of airport pollution and hard weather, and it appeared deserted. An astute observer would have noticed, however, that the light fixtures were new and enclosed in sturdy cages to deter vandalism, that although the windows were dirty and flecked with bird droppings, not a single one of them was cracked or broken, the panes filled with safety glass and firmly sealed. And the single pedestrian entrance was a solid steel door with a heavy-duty lock. Raj had always known that some day he'd be making a move against Kristoff. He'd bought this property years ago, snapping it up at a bargain price when its former owner had needed a discreet sale and Raj had had the cash on hand. Of course, the title had changed several times since then, on paper anyway. As he stared up at the building, it hit him for the first time that before the month was out, he would be the Northeastern Vampire Lord. It never occurred to him that he would fail. He would defeat Kristoff and take his place as one of the rarefied few who controlled all of vampire society. It was not something he particularly lusted after. If Kristoff had been a different sort of master— Raj would have been content to stay in Manhattan with his clubs and his children, insulated against vampire politics. But Kristoff had always been a petty tyrant, forever the spoiled younger son of an aging royal house to which he'd been born as a human. The recent deterioration of his mind had only exacerbated inborn weaknesses. And as for Raj, he'd had enough of one master— he had no intention of serving another. He unlocked the sturdy metal door. A soft security light came on to reveal a small vestibule with a second door a few feet beyond. The interior door opened readily once the exterior door was fully closed, and Raj stepped into the main building, 
immediately flipping switches to bring up the overhead lights. While the building's exterior only hinted that it was more than it looked, the inside left no doubt. The only windows were high above the floor and sealed with thick steel shutters. Long banks of industrial lights illuminated every corner of the vast, empty space. And when Raj's people arrived later, they'd drive their vehicles right into the warehouse through the roll-up bay doors, which were currently secured by thick rods drilled into the concrete floor. There was a mezzanine over the loading bay with several rooms for his human guards, a few trusted men and women whom M would bring in from Manhattan along with the vampire contingent. As with Raj's much smaller private warehouse downtown, the main sleeping quarters for the vampires were below ground, safe behind a bank-like vault door. His booted footsteps echoed loudly as he crossed the warehouse floor. Down two short flights of stairs, he keyed in a digital combination and opened the vault. The accommodations inside were spartan, but then this had never been intended as a permanent headquarters. It was a staging area, nothing more. He turned on the lights there as well, checked the temperature on the thermostat, and headed back upstairs, leaving the door open behind him. Upstairs there was a microwave to serve the dual function of heating food for the humans and blood for the vampires. A refrigerator sat next to the counter, which doubled as a bar, and against the far wall, near the stairs, a large blood storage unit hummed happily. It was empty now, but not for long. He verified that it was working and glanced again at his watch. Time to go. Leaving the main lights on, he closed and secured the vault and exited the building, locking it behind him. M knew this place. She'd been the one who'd helped him set it up. She certainly didn't need him to tell her how to get their people settled. And besides, Sarah was waiting. Chapter 18 Sarah linked arms with Linda as they walked out of the restaurant. The cold night air bit hard after the warm restaurant, which, in this case, was a good thing. She'd probably had too much wine to drink, but it had tasted so good, and for a little while she'd been able to forget everything else and just enjoy the party. Unfortunately, she could never forget for too long or too well which was why Linda would soon be back inside with Sam and his friends, getting even tipsier, while sober Sarah went home like the good girl she'd never planned to become. "'Are you sure you won't stay, sweetie?' Linda's breath was fragrant with the lovely Chateau Margot they'd been drinking all evening. "'Yes, I'm sure. I've got to get some sleep or I'll be useless tomorrow, and I need to get back to my research.' She hadn't told Linda that Raj was coming over later and didn't intend to. Her friend would probably begin planning the wedding if she found out Sarah had an actual date. I do research, too, Linda said happily, just not very often. She laughed, as if that was the funniest thing she'd ever heard. In the restaurant, she'd insisted on walking Sarah safely out to her car— but now Sarah was wondering who was going to walk Linda safely back inside. "'Maybe you should go back inside,' she said now, trying to turn them back toward the restaurant. "'I can find my—' "'Good evening, Sarah.' She jumped at the sound of Raj's voice, turning to find him leaning casually against her car, looking like a cross between the bad boy every mother warned her daughter about and a model in a Calvin Klein aftershave ad. His broad shoulders were encased in leather, his narrow hips and long legs covered in snug-fitting denims that made her stomach, and lower parts of her anatomy, too, ache. He gave her a wicked smile, as if he knew exactly what she was feeling. Raj! she all but squeaked. Raj? Linda stopped dead in her tracks, suddenly completely sober as she took in this new development. "'And who might this be, Sarah, my darling?' she asked silkily, scanning the vampire head to toe with unabashed curiosity. "'That research you had to get back to, perhaps?' "'Um—' Sarah felt herself blushing and hurried to say, "'Linda, this is Raymond Gregor. Raj, my friend Linda Hoffman.' 
Raj gave Linda a cool glance and held out his hand to Sarah. She took it without thinking and found herself pulled away from Linda's embrace and into the curve of his arm. He secured her there before saying, A pleasure, Linda. I'll see to it that Sarah gets home safely. Will you? Linda said archly, with a speculative glance at Sarah. Well, well. Linda, Raj and I are old friends, Raj interrupted. I was in town and looked Sarah up. It's been a while, hasn't it, sweetheart? He kissed her temple, his breath warm on her skin, and she shivered with something other than the cold. Hmm. Linda clearly wasn't buying it, but she was just as clearly willing to wait for the entire story. I'll just leave you two to catch up, then. She laughed a little and said, We'll talk, Sarah, darling, before strolling back across the parking lot with a little wave over her shoulder. Sarah turned to demand an explanation from Raj, but found herself swept literally off her feet as he lifted her directly into a searing kiss that made her anger disappear, along with about half of her brain cells. He crushed her against him, kissing her as hungrily as if they truly had been separated for too long, even though it had been only hours. She felt her own response rising to meet his with an intensity she couldn't recall ever experiencing before. She didn't want to think about anything except the taste of his mouth, the sweep of his tongue against hers, the feel of his big body enclosing her, sheltering her from the unfriendly night. She moaned softly and wrapped her arms around his neck, whispering his name against his lips. I think... Raj began, but whatever he thought was delayed by her renewed demand for his mouth. Sarah? He tried again, succeeding in getting his lips close enough to her ear for her to hear what he was saying. Your friend is still watching. She stiffened at the reminder they were right outside Buffalo's most popular restaurant. She buried her face against his shoulder and he chuckled softly. I'll drive you home. No, she protested. I can... He tightened his hold. Well, I can't, he growled. I don't want you out of my sight. Fresh desire rolled through her body on a wave of warmth. Okay, she whispered. Roger's car was parked right next to hers. He beeped the locks open and all but lifted her into the passenger seat, closing the door with a solid thunk. Sarah jumped a little at the sound, a jolt of adrenaline clearing her head long enough to wonder what she was doing in Raj's car, getting ready to drive back to her house and... Raj leaned over from the driver's seat to give her a quick, hard kiss. Don't think so hard, sweetheart. I'm not dangerous. He spun the wheel in a tight circle, taking them past the startled valets and out of the parking lot. Not to you, anyway, he muttered. Sarah gave him a worried glance, but quickly realized she liked the idea that he might be dangerous. She liked this big, lethal vampire lusting after her, wanting her so badly that he'd been ready to take her right there in the parking lot. And he had been ready. She might not be experienced, but she knew when a man wanted her. Of course, she hadn't exactly been fighting him off, either. She smiled, feeling just a little satisfied with herself. Raj reached out at that moment to take her hand, raising it to his mouth for a soft kiss before settling it on his hard-muscled thigh. Your place or mine, sweetheart. Sarah gave him a surprised look. You have a place? He laughed. Of course I have a place. Where do you think I sleep? The local graveyard? Sarah blushed. No, she protested. Of course not. I just thought, I don't know, maybe a hotel? He snorted in dismissal. Have you seen the local hotels? I'm from Manhattan, darling. I'm accustomed to a higher standard. So, 
What's it to be? I've got a turn coming up. My place, I guess, Sarah said, beginning to worry again about what she'd gotten herself into. I live... I know where you live. I was supposed to meet you there. Then why... She frowned at a sudden thought. How do you know which restaurant? He shrugged easily. You said it was a celebration. There aren't that many places worth celebrating in around here. I got lucky and saw your car. Sarah wasn't sure she believed him, but couldn't figure out any other way he'd have known where to find her. Look, Raj. He kissed her hand again, one finger at a time, with a lingering caress of his lips and just a touch of tongue. You're thinking again, he said. And besides, he pulled to a stop in front of her house. We're here, and I've earned at least a good night kiss for seeing you home safely. Sarah opened her mouth to reply, but he was already out of the car and at her open door, holding out his hand to help her. She knew better, but she took his hand anyway, letting him pull her into his embrace knowing she'd feel that same tug of desire the minute, Oh, God, yes. Raj followed Sarah up the front stairs to a turn-of-the-century duplex with a pair of old and slightly warped doors. The unit on the left was dark, but the twitch of a curtain told him someone was watching. Beneath the porch light, Sarah inserted her key and unlocked the crummy piece of shit masquerading as a deadbolt. The door opened and Raj breathed in the scent of her home, feeling a deep satisfaction flowing in, along with the unique fragrance that was Sarah. She looked up at him, her long hair a golden spill over soft shoulders, and his brain was suddenly filled with a single word. Mine. The thought hit him before he could stop it, and he frowned even as his body kicked hard into an instinctive response. His fangs were pushing eagerly through his gums, hungry for a taste of her blood, and his cock was stiffening with an entirely different sort of hunger. He'd never felt this instant attraction to a woman. He wasn't sure he liked it, but he definitely wanted it. "'Are you going to invite me in?' he asked lazily. She looked up at him with wide, uncertain eyes. "'Do you think I should?' He gave her a shark's grin, tugging her close enough that she could feel his body's reaction. Unless you'd rather do this on the porch so your neighbor can enjoy it, too. Sarah blushed hotly and stepped inside the house. Come on in. Raj paused long enough to wink at whoever was watching next door, and then followed Sarah, immediately closing the door behind him. She threw her coat over the stairway banister, kicked off her heels, and started toward the back of the duplex. Without her coat, he could see she was wearing a skirt and sweater. It wasn't the silky, sheer dress of summer he'd wished for the other night, but it was very nice indeed, the skirt tight and clinging to her hips, accenting a very nicely rounded ass. He watched that ass as he followed her into the kitchen, she was muttering some nonsense about a cup of tea, lifting the kettle and shaking it before putting it back on the burner and twisting the knob to bring up the flame. When she turned to find him standing right behind her, she gave a little squeak of surprise. "'Are you afraid of me, Sarah?' he asked quietly, pushing her hair behind one ear with a gentle finger. "'Terrified,' she said with a nervous little laugh. "'But not the way you think.' Raj's lips quirked up in a smile as he let his finger travel down her neck and over the fragile arc of her clavicle, coming to rest just above the full swell of her breast, where he could feel the gentle beat of her heart. "'I think you look good enough to eat.' "'Oh!' she breathed. Her eyes, when they met his, were still wide but no longer uncertain. He closed the distance between them, pulling her against his body with a possessive arm around her waist, his hand on her hip as he bent down to breathe deeply of her warm scent.
Her heart was racing, her breathing fast and shallow. Her breasts were soft against his chest, her nipples hard. He slid his hand beneath her sweater to touch the soft, warm satin of her skin, and she melted into his embrace, reaching up to wrap her arms around his neck, her slender fingers playing with the ends of his hair as she raised her face to his for a kiss. Wanting far more than playful kisses, Raj growled and fisted his fingers into her silky tresses, lowering his mouth to her bare neck. He could smell the blood flowing hot and sweet, could feel the rush of her jugular against his lips as he bent to taste. His fangs emerged slowly to graze the velvet of her skin, as hard and ready as his cock against her belly. She moaned softly, and he felt it as a gentle vibration against his heart. His woman. Her blood, his to drink. Her body, his to take. Raj froze. He raised his head and his hands stilled. He blinked against the nearly overwhelming need to sink his teeth into her, to lift her up onto the counter and take her right there in the kitchen. Sarah whimpered his name softly, hungrily. What the hell? He placed his hands on her shoulders and straightened his arms, forcing her away from him, putting enough space between them that he could draw a breath without inhaling the intoxicating aroma of her arousal. Sarah, he said, shaking her slightly. Sarah? She protested softly, looking up at him in confusion with eyes that were blurred with desire. Raj, she said in a small, hurt voice. Fuck. He pulled her against his chest once more, wrapping his arms around her tightly and trapping her arms between them. She struggled fitfully to touch him, stroking him with aborted little jerks of her hands. His own arousal tormented him, screaming at him to go ahead and take her. He buried his face in her hair and groaned. It would be so easy to lift her up, to slide that tight skirt up to her waist, spread her legs and pound his aching cock into her until they both came screaming. She wanted it. And God knew he did. His entire body was throbbing, aching with the need of it. But the very strength of his desire made him stop, because Raj didn't do this sort of thing, didn't lose control with any woman, much less one he barely knew. He was in control, always in control. Sarah, he commanded. He took her delicate jaw in one hand and forced her to look at him. Raj, she responded impatiently. He sighed, regretting what he was about to do, wishing he was a bit more of a selfish bastard. But he wasn't. With a gentle nudge of her mind, he sent her to sleep, erasing her memories of the evening since her return home. She collapsed, but he caught her easily, lifting her in his arms, holding her against his chest, her head resting on his shoulder. He carried her upstairs, twisting nearly sideways on the ridiculously narrow stairway, knowing the nosy neighbor was probably listening to every step. There were two rooms up there, one obviously an office of some sort. He ignored that one for the time being and opened the door to her bedroom with a gentle kick. A queen-sized bed filled most of the space, a single bedside table in the corner. A jewel-toned Tiffany-style lamp sat on a dresser near the door, providing minimal light, but more than enough for his vampire sight. He laid Sarah's limp form on the bed, shoving a huge pile of lace-trimmed pillows to the floor. He left her clothes on, although with slight misgivings. Not that he didn't want to see her sweet little body naked. He definitely wanted that. But he didn't want her to wake up wondering what he'd been doing with her while she was unconscious. Especially since he'd denied himself the pleasure of doing exactly those things she would have wondered about. It was one thing to pay the price for one's sins, but another entirely to pay the price without the pleasure of sinning first. 
He tucked Sarah under the comforter, sliding her between the fresh-smelling sheets. She murmured softly, curling onto her side and snugging the remaining pillow beneath her cheek. Raj watched her breathe, in and out, indulging himself with a lingering touch on her pale cheek. He didn't understand what was going on. He had beautiful women lining up to bet him every night of the week. So what was it about sweet Sarah that had him contemplating mayhem against any male who dared touch her? Had him acting like a raw child panting after the first fresh blood he'd ever tasted? Raj didn't like things he didn't understand, especially not when those things had the power to make him vulnerable. He stood and crossed the hall to her office, which was even smaller than her bedroom. There was the usual computer paraphernalia, but mostly the room was filled with books. Books on shelves, books in boxes, books stacked on the floor. Curious, Raj glanced at the titles. A lot of academic volumes with those convoluted titles the eggheads were so fond of. He moved to the next bookcase and grimaced. Romance fiction. A lot of it vampires. M read these books by the dozen. She got a real kick out of passing them around to the guys and suggesting they could learn a few things. He retrieved one of his business cards from its golden case and tucked it under her phone where she'd be sure to see it, then flicked off the desk lamp. Across the hall, Sarah was sleeping peacefully, her hair a tousle of gold, her long lashes dark against a barely visible pale cheek. Cursing himself for every kind of fool, Raj spun and took the narrow staircase quickly, walking back to the kitchen where the damn tea kettle was screaming hysterically. He turned it off and stormed to the front door, his mood darkening with every step. Fuck, he swore, and just managed to stop himself from putting a fist through her wall. He had the whole damn night ahead of him, hard as a rock, and walking away from the one woman he was aching to fuck. Someone was going to pay the price for his bad mood. Maybe it was time to question a few of the local vampires. He wanted to see some blood flowing, and it sure as hell was not going to be his own. Chapter 19 The bloodhouse where Regina Aiello had disappeared was in the small village of Corfu, well beyond the main city, on a few acres bordered by the colorfully named Murder Creek. Raj had always wondered if that creek had been Kristoff's motivation to purchase the property. A house on Murder Creek for the vampires to play in was just too great a temptation to pass up. Outwardly, the place looked much the same as when Kristoff bought it just after World War II. A nicely maintained two-story clapboard with a covered porch— the front yard was covered by a manicured lawn, but the remaining acreage had been permitted to grow wild, with tall grass stretching out to either side, providing a buffer of privacy for what was really going on inside that simple white farmhouse. Raj pulled the BMW over to the side of the road. There were no curbs this far out of the city. The house was filled to the brim and more, with people spilling out onto the porch and even into the yard where tables and chairs had been set up to accommodate the overflow. As far as he could see, there was no control over who came and went, and sure as hell no one was checking IDs. What the fuck? He strode across the uneven grass, his tread heavy on the soft ground. Couples were all but having sex in the front yard, Vampire sinking fang in full view of the public road not twenty-five yards away. He grabbed a handful of long hair and pulled one of the offending vampires off his donor de la nuit. The vampire whipped around with a furious roar, fangs fully distended and dripping blood, hands curled into claws. Raj gave him a bored look. "'Who's in charge here?' he asked. Who the fuck are you? The vampire snarled. Raj didn't say a word. 
Using a small thread of power, he drove the vampire to his knees and then bent him backwards until the sound of vertebrae popping was so loud it could be heard over the pounding music coming from the house. The vampire could do little more than grunt in pain, but his eyes were wide with fear, gleaming golden yellow as they begged silently for mercy. I believe I asked you a question, Raj said calmly. He released the vamp without warning, causing him to snap forward with such force that he did a full face plant in the grass before slowly, painfully, raising himself just enough to answer Raj's query. Mick is in charge, my lord, the vampire rasped. He'll be in the first room on your right. Thank you, Raj said cheerfully and walked away. Behind him, he could hear the vampire's companion making concerned noises until she was driven away by a vicious snarl of profanity. Raj smiled. His evening was looking up already. He crossed to the front porch without incident. Every vampire outside the house had witnessed his display of power and backed off quickly, jerking their humans with them. As he suspected, there was no bouncer at the door— which meant there was not even a record of consent, much less signed waivers. This house was a disaster waiting to happen, and tonight that disaster's name was Raj. Once inside, he found Mick easily enough. The fool was lying in the middle of a big four-poster bed, surrounded by women. He was a big man, tall and thick, with a head full of unruly red hair, and a broad chest that was as naked as the women who were draped all over him. He had power, too, enough to control this house and its vampires, but not enough to face down a true master. Fortunately for Raj, he was too arrogant to realize it. Raj strolled into the room casually, looking like a prospective homebuyer checking out the furnishings. Mick's gaze followed him warily, but he didn't move from the bed. There are vampires sinking fang in the front yard, Raj commented, running his hand along the silver frame of a particularly fine antique mirror. Shocking, Mick said dryly. His women tittered. Raj glanced at him. And there appears to be no one checking the IDs of your lovely guests, he continued, giving a little nod of inclusion to the half-naked women who preened under his gaze. Mick growled out a command, drawing the attention of his adoring fans back to him alone. "'What's it to you?' he demanded. "'And for that matter, who the fuck are you?' "'I didn't introduce myself. How rude.' "'Raymond Gregor,' he said, continuing his perusal of the mostly gaudy furnishings. He paused and shifted his gaze to the big vampire." Raj to my friends, but I'm afraid that doesn't include you, Mick. The red-headed vampire snorted in disdain and began shoving away his unhappy playmates to climb from the bed. Raj was grateful to see the vampire was wearing pants, which he zipped with a quick jerk before turning to face him. So you're Raj. I've heard about you. Have you? I, on the other hand, have never heard of you. Mick squinted angrily and drew himself up to his full height, thrusting out his chest in challenge, much the same way the human Scavetti had the night before. Mick, Raj said gently, you might want to clear the humans from the room first. The other vampire looked puzzled for a moment and then laughed. Frankie! he said to a short, scared-looking vampire standing near the door. The house is closed. Get everybody out. Five minutes ago, he added with a snap, when Frankie just stood there staring at him. Raj waited patiently while the house was closed down and emptied of human witnesses. There was a lot of complaining from the humans, but none from the vampires. They moved through the house in taut silence, hustling their visitors out the door, hurrying them to their cars and shoving them inside. Raj only hoped there wasn't a rash of accidents on the way home. 
That wouldn't be good for business. So, Raj, Mick said finally, where do you want to do this? Raj smiled and slowly released a measure of his true power. It was an exquisite rush, as delicious as blood from the most succulent woman he'd ever taken, as sweet as that first slow glide of blood down his throat after a long drought. He skewered Mick with a derisive look. We can do it right here. It won't take long, he said with an arrogance born of certain knowledge. Mick's eyes widened, and Raj saw the first flash of fear as he recognized the true depths of Raj's power. But he didn't back down. He had to know he couldn't win this battle, but he stood his ground, and Raj decided in that moment not to kill good old Mick. He would need vampires with this kind of courage when he took over Kristoff's territory. And he was definitely going to take over the territory. Mick attacked first, understanding that it was his only slim chance. He aimed a spear of concentrated power at Raj's chest and attacked physically in the same moment, throwing himself across the room. His considerable bulk hit like a pile driver, and Raj grunted with the impact, but repelled it easily, using power alone to toss the other vampire into an elegant armoire that rose almost to the ceiling. Or it had before Mick crashed into it and reduced it to a pile of shattered wood. A shame, really, Raj thought idly. Mick stood with a roar and would have attacked again, but Raj, wanting, needing a more physical violence, crossed the room in two hard strides and caught the big vampire with a roundhouse punch, breaking his jaw and spinning him away to crash into the bed toppling the canopy and tangling him in a dusty shroud of blue velvet. Mick shook his head, a grotesque sight with his jaw hanging loose, and stood once again, fists bunched at his sides. Muscles strained and veins bulged as he concentrated his remaining strength, throwing everything he had into a last desperate burst of power— his mouth open in a furious howl, as if the sheer volume of his voice could add weight to the attack. Raj raised a hand and deflected every ounce of that power and more back on its owner, driving Mick to the floor and pressing down on him until his joints groaned and he screamed in agony beneath the crushing weight. Yield, Raj demanded softly. Yield and serve me willingly, or you die right here right now. Mick twisted beneath Raj's greater strength, his face contorted with rage and pain as he fought to the last shred of his power. He pounded the floor with one fist, driving it through the old wooden planks and shattering the bones in his hand before finally forcing his gaze up to meet Raj's implacable blue stare. He ground one word from his ruined mouth. Master, he said, Raj nodded and released him, and then immediately drew off his jacket and rolled up his sleeve, slicing his own wrist with a slash of his fangs. "'Do you come to me of your own free will and desire, Mick?' he asked formally. Mick's eyes met his briefly in surprise, but then he nodded, his hungry gaze lowering to the bounty of rich blood so tantalizingly close. "'I do, my lord.' And is this what you truly desire? My lord, it is my truest desire. Raj lowered his bloody arm to the vampire's ruined mouth. Then drink, Mick, and be mine. Mick closed his mouth over Raj's wrist, drawing the powerful blood into his body with great gulps. Raj could feel the tug not only on his wrist— but on his very soul as yet another vampire became his. His to command, his to live or die. One more stone added to a burden of responsibility that was already too heavy. When he felt the bond seal into permanence, he withdrew his arm from his new minion's eager mouth. He didn't bother to wipe it clean. The wound would heal on its own in a few minutes and there was nothing in this room he cared to clean it with. 
He rolled down his sleeve, drew his jacket back on, and stood to survey the assembled vampires. Some stared in open-mouthed shock, others seemed almost relieved. It was a testament to the failure of Kristoff's authority that not a single one of them protested his takeover, or even made a dash for the exits to report in. This house will reopen in two nights under new management, Raj announced. He glanced down at Mick, who was already beginning to heal with the surge of Raj's blood through his veins. Mick will see to its proper administration. Won't you, Mick? Yes, master, Mick said fervently. When he looked up this time, his gaze held nothing but respect. We've been waiting for you a long time, my lord. I know, Raj said somberly, but I'm here now. He spun around and left the house the way he'd come in, ignoring the vampires who knelt in obeisance as he passed. In taking Mick's oath, effectively stealing him from Kristoff, he'd openly declared his intention to overthrow the vampire lord. It was possible Kristoff's mind was so weakened that he wouldn't even notice the loss, or that he'd just ride it off to rivalry among his minions. After all, he'd brought Raj to Buffalo to clean up his mess— but whether Kristoff appreciated the true significance or not, Raj knew what he'd done. And he knew it could only lead to the ultimate confrontation with his sire. He also knew he should be reeling in triumph at the ease of his first victory, and a part of him recognized the importance of this night. But all he could feel was a keen awareness of the terrible burden that was about to be his— the burden every vampire lord carried, the weight of thousands of vampires who would draw their next breath by his will alone. He climbed into the comfort of his BMW and turned for the city, trying to remember when he'd ever felt this alone. It was nearly dawn when he pulled into the garage of his private lair. He'd meant to drive by the warehouse near the airport and check on M and the others, but he'd found himself sitting on the docks of Lake Erie instead. He watched as the longshoremen unloaded a single huge cargo ship, the giant cranes lifting big metal containers so different from the crates and barrels and even occasional livestock that had been the norm when he'd worked these docks long ago, until a chance meeting had brought Kristoff into his life. He'd often thought about that night, if he'd gone straight home after work to the mean little room he'd rented for far more than it was worth, or if he'd stopped at the bar a block further on instead of the first one he'd come to, feeling flush with money in his pocket on payday. A whim, not even a real decision, such an insignificant thing to have changed his life forever. Buffalo, New York, 1830 Ryman made his way back to the table, dodging flying fists and stumbling drunks, balancing three mugs of foamy beer which sloshed liberally over his fingers to join the layers of old spills lacquering the filthy floor. It was a seedy place, this tavern, set on the edge of a dark pier and stinking of wet grain from the docks only yards away. But it was one of the few bars that would serve him and his friends— immigrants, the lot of them, with accents as thick as a slice of his mother's bread, when they could come up with the American words at all, which wasn't often and not nearly fast enough. He sidestepped an Irish headed for the bar and slid into the chair Machek had saved for him, dropping the mugs onto the table with a thud and a final splash of golden liquid. "'Easy there, Raymond,' Machek said in Polish. "'There'll be nothing left for drinking.' Raj, Raymond corrected. I've told you, Maciek, the Americans don't have the tongue for Polish names. Call me Raj. Raj, Zosha said, her voice a low, sultry purr that made him think of dark corners and lifted skirts, preferably hers. It makes no sense, Raymond. He shrugged and leaned over to steal a kiss from her luscious lips. Perhaps not, my sweetness. 
But the Americans like it, no? And we're all Americans now. Maybe you are, she said, lifting a shoulder to brush him away. I'm still Polish. Ryman slung an arm around her and grinned, ignoring Machik's frown of disapproval. His friend's brain was stuck back home in Poland where a proper girl would be spending the evening with her mother, not drinking in a filthy tavern with the likes of Raymond Gregorczyk. But they weren't on the docks of Gdansk anymore. This was Buffalo, New York, America. And this was their future. Machik drew a long draft of his beer and put it down on the table. He wiped his face with the back of one dirty hand, spreading nearly as much of the thick foam around his scruffy beard and mustache as he wiped off. "'I'll tell you what I think,' he began. But they never had a chance to hear what Machek thought. The door flew open with a shudder as though a storm was blowing off the lake fit to tear the building down around them. The thick wood slammed against the wall with a sound like a ton of bricks hitting the dock. Silence. Every head in the place turned toward the empty doorway and stared. More than a few crossed themselves and muttered a prayer to the Virgin. A man stepped into the silence. A rich man. Raj could tell by his clean clothes, his white hands and buffed fingernails, his neatly combed hair, and the disdainful look he was passing over the assembled drunks. There were others with him. Strange, Ryman thought, that he'd not noticed them before, though they'd certainly entered the bar first. There were four of them, two in front and two flanking the rich man to either side, their bulky physiques and meaty fists describing them, just as the rich man's fine clothes had him. They were bodyguards, hired muscle to ensure the rich man's white hands stayed clean. The dandy sniffed once, immediately raising a delicate white handkerchief to his nose. Well, he said in strongly accented American, they will have to do. What followed next was a blur of blood and violence, as the four bodyguards tore into the crowd, their mouths gaping wide with impossible fangs, their fingers curled into claws like some sort of vicious beast. The hardened men in the tavern, men who tossed two hundred kilo crates like children's toys, screamed in terror, crawling on the filthy floor now slick with red as throats were torn and blood spilled everywhere. Raymond grabbed Zosha and threw her behind him, backing against the wall and trying to remember if there was a rear door and if it was barred. He saw Machek pick up a heavy chair and swing it, breaking it across the back of one of the beasts, but the creature turned and laughed, laughed, as it sank fangs into Machik's throat and he began to scream. Behind him, Zosha was screaming as well, her voice rising above the others, a shrill female cry in the room full of men. Ryman saw the rich man notice. Although he no longer looked so fine as he had, his expensive clothes were stained with dark blood and gore, his white hands buried in the flesh of a dead Irish whore. He raised his head, his eyes glowing like an animal in the dim light until Ryman thought surely he could feel the heat of them against his skin. Quiet, Zosha, Ryman hissed. He could feel her trembling behind him, her hands clinging to the thin fabric of his shirt. The rich man smiled and began walking toward them, gliding through the chaos as if God himself was clearing the way. Men and monsters brushed aside as if they were no more than silk curtains. What are you doing here, boy? Raj stared in shock. The monster was speaking to him in Polish. I... I work the docks, he stuttered, not knowing what else to say. The rich man grinned, and it was a horrible sight. Not any more. A single swipe of one delicate white hand tore out Ryman's throat. He fell to his knees, feeling the warmth of his own blood as it drained through his fingers to join the growing pool on the floor. Zosha screamed his name, and he watched helplessly as she was dragged over his useless body, 
her heels kicking weakly as the rich man buried his teeth in her neck and drank. The last thing Raj saw before a curtain of black fell over his eyes was Zosha's lovely face slack with death, her once bright blue eyes pale and lifeless. Raimond opened his eyes to darkness. He could see men, no, not men, monsters moving in the shadows, could hear their growls of pleasure as they sucked the juices from bits of meat he didn't want to think about. Was this death? Was this the hell the priests had warned him of, the corruption of his soul they predicted if he left the lands of his birth and traveled so far away? He's awake, someone growled. Ah, at last. Raimond recognized that voice. The rich man, the one who carried evil with him like an elegant cloak. Bring him the girl. The girl? Did he mean Zosha? Was she alive then? A young girl was pushed out of the darkness. Not Zosha. He didn't recognize this pathetic child. She stumbled and fell hard against him, crying pitifully. Her body stank of sex and sweat, and she shook with fear. He reached out to comfort her as she turned toward him, her eyes full of a silent plea. He touched the bare skin of her arm, and an unreasoning hunger roared through him. He could hear the rush of her blood and the terrified pounding of her heart, could smell a sweet, fresh scent so close beneath her paper-thin skin. It was intoxicating. He leaned closer, wallowing in the scent, his tongue lapping out to feel it pulsing like a small animal begging for release. He felt his gums split, felt something hard and sharp tearing his lips, and knew they were fangs as he pressed them against the soft flesh of her neck. One pointed tip punctured her skin to release a single drop of blood. He closed his eyes at the exhilarating flavor, his head thrown back as if it was a flood pouring down his throat instead of a meager drop. His gaze fell to the small red puncture wound, to the thick, ripe vein. He buried his face in her neck, and for the first time, he fed. Raimond pushed the girl's body aside, his jaw cracking wide as he sought to release the tension of his feeding. He sat for a moment in silence, rolling his head from side to side, hearing the pop of vertebrae as he stared around the room. He froze when he took in the carnage, when he realized what he'd become, what he'd done. Horrified, he scrambled across the littered floor until he felt a wall at his back. Someone laughed, and he looked up to find the rich man staring down at him, once again clothed in fine fabrics, his hands and face pristine and white. Zosha, Raimond croaked. Machek! The rich man gestured around the room with an elegant hand. I'm afraid they are all dead. To a worthy cause, if it's any consolation to you. His gaze bored into Raymond. But not you, Raymond. You're very much alive. Why? Raymond asked, more the cry of a tormented soul than a man's question. The rich man smiled. Because I can. Come along, boy. You're one of us now. Raimond threw his head back and howled. The ringing of his cell phone brought Raj back to the present. He pulled his phone from a pocket as he climbed out of the car, not bothering to check the ID. Yeah. Raj? M's voice was troubled. Yeah, M. Anything wrong? He punched in the security code on the private warehouse door, making certain it closed and locked behind him before he crossed the empty space and descended the stairs to his private apartment. No, M said cautiously. Not on this end. We're all here in the warehouse. The guys are settling in downstairs. I expected you— Something came up. Right, okay. 
Will we see you tonight? Yeah. The vault door swung shut behind him. He entered the code to engage the full security of his building and heard the vault's heavy lock slide home for the day. Let me think a minute, Em. He rubbed his forehead, trying to put the next twenty-four hours into place. He'd have to see Sarah again. He still had to find out what she was hiding, the real reason she'd been so eager to be a part of the police investigation. And Kristoff was probably waiting for a progress report, but he could fucking wait until Raj had time for him. His own people were far more important. I'll come by right after sunset. It's a real mess here, Em. Worse than I thought. Then I'm glad we're here for you, boss. Yeah. See you tonight. He hit disconnect and stared at the phone, thinking about Sarah Stratton. She was a complication he didn't need right now, and if the thought brought a twinge of unexpected pain, he ignored it. This wouldn't be the first time he'd been forced to leave behind a human he cared about. He immediately dialed her number, relieved when it gave him the option of going straight to voicemail. Sarah, we need to talk. I'll be over around ten tonight. He left it at that and hung up. She'd get the message when she woke this morning, and if she wasn't home when he got there, he'd track her down and get what he needed, one way or another. Chapter Twenty. Regina forced herself to sit up, open her eyes, and stay awake. Vampires had her; she was sure of that now. But not just vampires. There were regular humans too. The thing was, she couldn't figure out what they wanted. The one she sort of knew, the one she danced with at the house, and who must have knocked her out somehow and kidnapped her, came to see her almost every night. But everything that happened after his visits was kind of a blur, and she was grateful for that because what little she remembered about the other vampires and what they did to her, she didn't want to think about those things. She ran her hands up and down bare arms, pimply with cold. She'd lost even her thin jacket somewhere. Her fingers ran over a sore spot on her left arm, and she looked down, touching it gingerly. Dark bruises marred her skin, visible even in the low light. There had been another room, one with bright lights and the cold sting of an alcohol rub, her blood filling the little glass tube. A woman had talked to someone as she bent over Regina's arm. But what had the woman said, and who else had been there? Regina tried to recall, but a wave of dizziness hit her, making her empty stomach roll with nausea. She lay back down and closed her eyes, wishing it away. It was so ironic; she'd always been one of the good girls, no drugs, no drinking, and hardly ever a date. She'd finally decided to break out of the mold, her first tiny rebellion, and what happens? Some wacko nut job kidnaps her. She sighed wearily and shifted on the uncomfortable bed. It was so hard to think. Maybe that's what they wanted—to keep her confused so she couldn't think straight, couldn't remember their faces when they let her go, because she had to believe they were going to let her go, or that someone would find her and the others. It was the only thing that kept her going. She shivered and reached for the blankets he finally brought her last night. That was a good sign, wasn't it? It was just. The blankets had smelled of perfume. It was a scent she recognized, a musky scent she'd never worn, and she couldn't help wondering who'd been using these blankets before they'd given them to her. Her eyelids drooped closed, and the tears came unbidden. She wanted to go home. She wanted her mom. She drifted off to sleep. Maybe when she woke up, the police would be there. Maybe they'd find her. Maybe it would be in time. Before they did to her whatever they'd done to the girl who wore the musky perfume. 
the girl who didn't need her blankets anymore. Chapter 21 Sarah woke to the sting of tears running down her face, the pillow damp beneath her cheek. The tears weren't only Regina's this time. They were Sarah's, too. Tears of anger, of frustration, of despair at the girl's fragile courage and the hope that rescue was near. But how could they find Regina before it was too late, before she ended up like all the others Sarah hadn't been able to save? She sat up in bed, drawing a deep breath. She'd only been a teenager then, she reminded herself sternly. A child. She was an adult now, a woman with resources and contacts of her own. Surely she could figure out some way. Her phone rang, and she knew it wasn't the first time. It was the ringing that had woken her. She twisted automatically, reaching for her bedside table where she always left her cordless phone overnight. But it wasn't there. It rang again, in the other room. She frowned. She never went to sleep without her phone nearby. Never. She started to climb out of bed and had a second surprise. She was wearing the clothes she'd worn last night, her sweater and skirt of all things, and her bra. That was just wrong. No sane woman slept in a bra. It was one of the first things she took off when she walked through the door, along with her shoes. She must have been drunker than she thought when she left the restaurant last night. It was just luck that she'd managed to get home without hurting herself or someone else. Stupid, Sarah. She should have called a taxi. Her phone rang a final futile time. The ring chopped off as the call was routed automatically to voicemail. She stood, shivering slightly, as she shuffled on bare feet over to her closet for a pair of slippers and then a quick stop in the bathroom. Crossing into her office, she found her cordless sitting on the desk in its charger. She picked it up and noticed a business card sitting there, a thick white card with crisp edges and a familiar name. And it all came back to her in a rush. She had gone to the restaurant, but Raj had been waiting in the parking lot. He'd driven her back here and they'd... They'd what? She remembered opening the door remembered letting him into the house. Mrs. M. had been listening at her window like always. Raj had told her that. But then what happened? And how had she ended up in bed fully dressed? The light on her phone flashed, reminding her she had messages. She called voicemail and discovered there were two. She hit the play button absently, still trying to remember Sarah. Raj. She collapsed into the chair, suddenly overwhelmed by a wave of lust so strong it took her breath away. She leaned forward, hugging herself, her nipples stiff and painfully erotic against the lace of her bra, her thighs clenched tightly against a need so powerful that she groaned out loud. She wanted to strip away her clothes and, We need to talk. I'll be over around ten tonight. And that was it. He hung up without identifying himself, without saying goodbye, just assuming she'd be waiting for him tonight like a good little pet. Arrogant bastard, she muttered, albeit somewhat breathlessly. She pressed one hand over her heart, waiting for her body to recover, only half listening as her voicemail went on to the next message, which would be the call that had woken her. It was Linda, demanding Sarah call her immediately and tell her all about this gorgeous Raj person and why hadn't Sarah ever mentioned him before. Sarah smiled at Linda's description of Raj. He was pretty gorgeous with those beautiful blue eyes and hunky body. She shivered as another wave of longing hit her. Son of a bitch, she swore suddenly. She ran to the bathroom and began ripping off her clothes, her sweater first, her bra. Half naked, she leaned closer to the mirror, holding up her hair and searching her neck for any tell-tale marks. She was perversely disappointed when she found none, 
but immediately stripped off her skirt, shimmying it over her hips and down to the floor. She'd read all those books about vampires. There was a big vein in the thigh that some of them were very fond of. She stared at her bare thighs in the mirror and then sat down to look with her own eyes. Nothing. No bite marks of any kind. Perched on her closed toilet seat in the chilly bathroom, mostly naked, she suddenly felt pretty stupid. If he'd ravished her, why would he have bothered to put her clothes back on? Stupid, she muttered. She stood and stared at her reflection. He did something, though. I know he did. She shivered viciously and began picking up her scattered clothes. Walking back into the bedroom, she folded the sweater and threw the rest into her clothes hamper, then stripped off her underwear and went to take a hot shower, standing under the pulsing jets for a while and letting them warm her up. The first thing she'd done after moving into the duplex was replace the water saver abomination Mrs. M had frugally provided with a decent shower head. She believed in conservation, but enough was enough. Sometimes a woman needed a good, hot pummeling, of the watery variety, that is. Once out of the shower and dried off, she pulled on her warmest sweats and sheepskin-lined slippers and headed downstairs for coffee. As the first shot of caffeine flowed deliciously through her system, she again considered her murky memories of the night before. She definitely remembered arriving back here at the house with Raj, because she remembered specifically inviting him in. He closed the door and then... A jolt of desire swept her from head to toe, just like before. Something had happened to her, something to do with that damn vampire, and she intended to find out what it was. She stomped back up to her office and found the white business card he'd left on her desk. She dialed his number, knowing he'd be down for the day, and hoping the ringing phone would make his rest a hell of a lot less restful. Raj was uncharacteristically edgy and dissatisfied as he dressed for the night. And it wasn't the usual hunger making him feel this way. He was old enough and powerful enough that he didn't need to feed nightly. The woman at the bar two nights ago should have been more than sufficient to keep him strong for another day at least. Not that he had to go that long, but he could. He considered stopping in for a drink somewhere on the way to meet M and the others, but if he needed blood that badly, he could always tap into the bagged supply at the warehouse. And besides, for some reason, the idea of feeding from an anonymous stranger was unappealing. No, it wasn't for some reason. It was for a very specific reason— one with blonde hair and a tidy little body he was eager to taste in every way possible. Too eager. Raj didn't believe in self-indulgence. Yes, he drove nice cars and wore nice clothes, and his penthouse in Manhattan was well beyond comfortable in its amenities. But those were things, meaningless possessions he could walk away from without a thought. When it came to his personal life, he was all about discipline and control. He had the occasional vodka, but never drank to excess. He preferred blood from the vein of a beautiful woman, but he never overindulged, and always left his women happy and sated. He had his vampire children, but he was their master and their sire. He was not their friend or their drinking buddy. Emily he trusted utterly— but she was the only one. Which was why this sudden irrational attraction to Sarah Stratton was so irritating, his need to protect her, to taste her, to steal her away and make her his and his alone was powerful and instinctive. He didn't have to think about whether he wanted her. He did want her, totally and in every way possible. It took an effort to stop himself from ripping her clothes off and to hell with the consequences. He shook his head in disgust. If he had a choice, he'd fly back to Manhattan tonight and never see Sarah Stratton again. Since that wasn't an option, he'd simply have to act like a civilized man instead of a ravening beast, even if the latter was closer to the truth. 
He pulled on his leather jacket and picked up his cell phone, noticing there was an incoming message from the lovely Sarah herself. He frowned, thinking she was canceling their appointment tonight, which was unacceptable. When he heard her message, his frown deepened. I know you did something last night, vampire, and I want to know what it was. No one screws around with my head. You got that? Not even you. And to hell with ten o'clock, Mr. High and Mighty. I want you here ten minutes after sundown, or I'm going to the cops. There was a pause during which he could hear her give a frustrated sigh. Okay, so I won't really go to the cops, but I'm not waiting around either. If you're not here by nine, I'm leaving, and you can just use your stupid vampire tricks to try and find me. Part of him wanted to chuckle at the exasperation in her voice, and part of him, completely irrational, wanted to applaud her determination in standing up to him. The more rational part demanded to know why she remembered anything at all about what had happened last night. Had he unconsciously wanted her to remember him and left a weakness in the memories he'd planted? That would be both stupid and dangerous. Only one way to find out. He punched in M's speed dial. His vampires were awake and ready to go. He could hear their voices in the background when she answered. My lord. I've got an errand to run on the way over, M. It won't take long. I hope not, she said dryly. Being stuck in this warehouse is like being trapped in a monkey cage. These guys need to be let out. He laughed. Not much longer. I'm on my way. But first, he thought to himself, there's the matter of a stubborn little human to deal with. Chapter 22 Sarah pulled her sweater over her head, smoothing it over her hips and checking to make sure the lace on her bra didn't look lumpy beneath the fine weave. Her freshly shampooed hair shone in the overhead light of her bedroom, and she'd put on just enough makeup to give her eyes a slightly smoky quality, the gold flecks like bits of fire in the smoke. Oh, get a grip, Sarah. Flecks of fire in the smoke, for God's sake. She laughed at herself. Clearly, she'd been reading too many of those romance novels she was so fond of. Of course, she was nothing like the kick-ass heroines in those books. She had never fired a gun, never used a knife, unless the ones in her kitchen drawer counted. And although she kept herself fit, there was no way she was going to high-kick anyone into submission. She was too short, for one thing, and a little too curvy and five pounds too heavy— no matter how many mornings she ran her five-mile circuit. Some men liked her curves, though. Not usually the right men, but at least it proved she wasn't a total toad. And why was she spending so much time getting ready anyway? This wasn't a date. Quite the opposite. She intended to read Raj the Riot Act and send him on his way. That was it. This definitely isn't a date. She scolded her reflection for the umpteenth time. Of course, that begged the question of why she was wearing her best lace push-up bra and had taken the time to put on eyeshadow in the first place. Oh, well, gotta create the smoke for those flecks of fire, right? She laughed out loud, like a crazy person, and sat on the edge of the bed to pull on her shoes. They weren't designed by anyone famous. Like most women, she didn't have the budget to spend $500 on a pair of shoes. But they were nice and, more importantly, they had a four-inch heel so she wouldn't feel like such a shrimp standing next to Raj. Not that this was a date or anything. She stood and turned off the overhead light as she walked out of the bedroom, ready to beard the lion in his den, or her den, or whatever, because this definitely wasn't a date. Raj took the stairs up to Sarah's porch in a graceful leap. He was in a hurry to get over to the warehouse and didn't have time to waste pretending to be human. He put his hand on the doorknob and, finding it unlocked, twisted it open and walked in, knocking as he did so. He caught Sarah halfway down the stairs. 
She was wearing a different bra, one that made her obvious curves even more obvious beneath a soft wool sweater. And what the hell was he noticing that for? She was looking at him in shock, which quickly changed to outrage. Just come on in, why don't you? I did. Thanks, he said, ignoring her sarcasm. You ever think of locking your door? What would be the point? It wouldn't stop you, would it? Nice. You about ready to leave? Leave? Are we going somewhere? Yes. I have a stop to make, and then I'm taking you to dinner. Are you? she asked, in a tone that implied quite the opposite. She came down another couple of steps, but stayed on the staircase, which put her at eye level with him. What happened last night? And I want the truth, not more of your vampire bullshit. I wasn't aware I'd given you any vampire bullshit, he said mildly. Ha ha! What happened, Raj? And don't say nothing, because I know damn well you did something to my memories, and it sure as hell wasn't consensual. Raj pulled back in surprise. First of all, she shouldn't have remembered anything. But secondly, her choice of words made him distinctly uncomfortable. He didn't take women against their will. Not ever. Not since that first night in the tavern when he'd been too out of his mind to realize what was happening. Sarah was waiting for an answer, glaring at him accusingly. She'd done something with her eyes that brought out the gray, but didn't hide the gold flecks that were always there. We talked about the missing women, he said slowly. It was. You were upset. More than upset. I didn't understand why, but it bothered me to see you like that. So I put you out and took away the memories so you wouldn't have nightmares. It was a version of the truth anyway. She hadn't been upset precisely, although she'd definitely been out of control. And he didn't want to add to her nightmares by inflicting himself on her life. Sarah was watching him, searching his face, looking for the truth, he figured. He stared back at her calmly and knew the moment she decided to believe him. Don't ever do that again, Raj, she said softly. Not for any reason. My memories are mine, good and bad, and I'll deal with them. I can't stand the idea of anyone messing around in my head. There was more to that than what she was saying, and it made him wonder what had happened in her past. Did it have anything to do with whatever she was hiding? I'm sorry, he said. She smiled all at once, as if he'd surprised her. Well, that's something you don't hear every day. Her expression abruptly became serious again, and she gave him a funny look. Um, Raj, we didn't... That is, um, we didn't... Sarah, he said softly, catching her eyes. If I'd made love to you, you'd remember it. Her face flushed a delightful pink. Arrogant bastard, she muttered. But she smiled at him again, and he felt a weight lift from his soul. Okay, let me get my coat. He watched her walk past him down the rest of the stairs, watched her tight ass swing by beneath a pair of dark blue slacks with those damn sexy heels she was always wearing. Better make it a heavy coat, he said. It's cold out. Maybe the one you had on the other night. The one that hides the temptation of your sweet little body, he added to himself. Okay, she said agreeably and pulled out the long brown coat. He took it from her, holding it while she slipped it on, sliding it up over her shoulders. He let himself run his hands down her arms, ending with a light brush of fingertips but resisted the urge to bury his face in the warm gold of her hair. Jesus, Raj, you're in trouble. She looked up at him over her shoulder. So you're taking me to dinner? Are you hungry? She asked innocently. Are you offering? He couldn't help retorting. She snorted delicately. In your dreams, bud. 
He leaned down to murmur directly in her ear, or maybe in yours, sweetheart. She shivered, and he smiled in satisfaction. He might not have any intention of taking her, but he didn't want her completely immune to him either. Sarah pulled the door open, but he stepped in front of her, his attention directed next door where someone was watching once again. Your neighbor pays a lot of attention to who comes and goes here. That's just Mrs. M., she said blithely, walking around him and out onto the porch. She gave him a warning look. She keeps an eye on me. You get a lot of male visitors? Not at all, she said, patting his arm as if he needed reassurance. Mrs. M's just a bit overprotective. Good, he thought, but he kept it to himself. Lock your door, he instructed her. Yes, sir, Mr. Raj, sir. He walked ahead of her down the stairs. It was going to be a long night. Sarah watched Raj out of the corner of her eye as he maneuvered through the Friday night traffic. He seemed different tonight, still friendly and overprotective, but cooler somehow, except for that one slip about being hungry, which had been a pretty stupid thing for her to say. She hadn't meant it as a come on, had she? She had to admit she was attracted to him. Who wouldn't be? He had that whole tall, dark, and handsome vibe going. Except he was blonde and blue eyed, of course. His hair was thick, brushed straight back to his collar, just long enough that she wondered what it would look like if he let it grow even longer, maybe past his shoulders. And with those gorgeous blue eyes, kind of an icy blue, except for when they burned with an undeniable heat. She shivered inside her warm coat. Yeah, she was definitely attracted to him. And sometimes she was sure he was attracted to her, too. But then it was like he threw a switch and disappeared behind that all business exterior. You're different from the others, she said suddenly. In spite of the busy traffic, he turned to stare at her, his eyes practically glowing in the dim light. Others? he asked, his voice so low and deep it was nearly a growl. Sarah licked her lips nervously. The other vampires here in Buffalo. You've met other vampires here in Buffalo? There was something about the way he said it, the way he was looking at her, that suddenly made her aware she was trapped in a car with a vampire. A very big, dangerous vampire. She was sorry she brought the whole thing up now, but he was waiting for an explanation, so she said, Sort of. I mean, I didn't actually meet anyone, but there was a university reception last year. It was supposed to be a showcase of local Buffalo talent. Manhattan's gotten so expensive that some people are actually moving back to Buffalo to live. Not many, of course. But someone decided it couldn't hurt to remind people that there is a major university here, with a medical center and lots of eggheads and artists. It's not Manhattan, but it's not Outer Mongolia either. Raj gave her a skeptical look. The vampires? He reminded her. Right. Well, I'm just a historian and a junior one at that, but my friend Linda, you met her the other night. Her husband's kind of a star in the art department. He nodded, and Sarah thought it was possible she'd told him about it last night and didn't remember. Well, she continued, they invited me to go with them to the reception. All the local bigwigs were there, including your boss, Christoph Sapieha. He's not my boss, Raj snapped. Sarah frowned in confusion. But I thought he was the local vampire lord, and that— It's complicated. Go on with your story, he commanded. She gave him a dirty look. He really was going to have to stop giving her orders. Anyway, Sapieha was only there for maybe an hour or so with a couple of other vamps. Bodyguards, I guess. Although I wasn't too impressed. No. 
Raj gave her a quick, amused glance before switching his gaze back to the road to stop at a red light. What did you expect? Giant eunuchs. You know, gold earrings and stuff. He laughed. I'm sure they were quite capable, despite their absence of gold and gelding. And there were probably others in the crowd you didn't know about. Kristoff is very aware of his own safety. Maybe, but I thought it would be interesting to meet him. You know, because of Sin and Raphael? I figured they're probably friends. You spoke to Kristoff? She was suddenly aware that the light had turned green, but they were still sitting there. Raj was regarding her intently, overwhelming her, not just with his size, but with a sense of menace as if everything rested on whatever she said next. No, she said carefully. I tried to, but he was talking to this woman, like really involved, you know? I went over anyway, but when I got too close, one of the other vamps stopped me. She shrugged. Maybe Kristoff was lining up his next meal or something. He left right after that. Raj seemed satisfied with her answer. At least he relaxed so that she no longer felt as if her life hung on her next words. He glanced up at the light and accelerated across the intersection. Just as well, he said at last. Kristoff is very old, he said, as if that explained everything. He turned into an industrial area not far from the airport, taking several turns until they were driving along a dark side road, fronted by what looked like a bunch of abandoned warehouses. He pulled into the parking lot of one of those warehouses and stopped right by the door. Sarah looked around, leaning forward to see through the windshield. There were no other cars anywhere and no lights coming from inside. You're living up to your stereotype, you know, she said. Stereotype? Big bad vampire... Innocent, helpless female, abandoned warehouse, middle of the night, you know, stereotype. I've done nothing lately that was bad, and you are hardly helpless and probably not that innocent either, he added with a sidelong smirk. Also, this warehouse is not abandoned. I will give you middle of the night, however. Think of it as vampire noon. A sense of humor? Be careful, Raj, your stereotype is slipping. When he didn't so much as crack a smile, Sarah thought maybe he didn't have a sense of humor after all. Leaving the keys in the ignition and the car running, he turned and met her eyes directly. Wait in the car. I'll only be a few minutes. Yes, master, she intoned. He shook his head and climbed out. Before he'd taken two steps, the warehouse door opened and a woman emerged, a tall, beautiful woman who Raj looked awfully happy to see. Curious, Sarah opened her car door, intending to join the party. The woman looked over at the sound and grinned. "'Who's for dinner?' she asked, jerking her chin in Sarah's direction. Raj glanced quickly over his shoulder and turned to face Sarah, blocking her view of the other woman. Get back in the car, he ordered grimly. Don't be a party pooper, boss, the woman said clearly. Let your little friend join us. Raj spun back around and Sarah saw his fangs flash for the first time. Shut the fuck up, M. The woman's playful expression froze at his words. But what replaced it was not outrage, which Sarah would have expected from a girlfriend. Instead, the woman dropped to her knees, head bowed. My lord, she murmured, forgive me. Sarah stared from the kneeling woman to Raj and wondered if she should be afraid too. Get back in the car, Sarah, he repeated, walking toward her, his fangs once more out of sight. Wait. My lord? This woman was a vampire? Sarah heard Raj swear softly as she stepped around him, walked over to the woman, and stuck out her hand. Sarah Stratton, she said. 
The woman gave Raj a startled look, her eyes questioning. He made a disgusted noise and gestured his okay. The female vampire stood and took Sarah's hand, shaking it firmly. Not one of those fingers-only girly shakes, but a real handshake. Emily, she said. No last name, like Prince, she added with a quirked smile. Raj snorted, and Emily scowled at him over Sarah's shoulder. Everyone's waiting for you, my lord, she said pointedly. Give us a minute, Raj said. As you wish, Emily replied. Nice meeting you, Sarah. Maybe next time we can actually have a conversation. Over my dead body, Raj muttered. Too late, Emily said sweetly, and strolled back into the warehouse, closing the door behind her. Sarah spun around as soon as he was gone. My lord, she repeated. Raj closed his eyes briefly and then opened them, giving her a patient look. Vampires live a long time. We've developed a highly structured society in order to survive, for protection from each other as well as from humans with torches and stakes. When that structure was first conceived, there was no such thing as a democracy. And it wouldn't work anyway. Vampires are more than just humans who stay awake at night. He stepped closer suddenly and locked his gaze with hers. Remember that, Sarah. Vampires are dangerous and unpredictable, no matter how human they might appear. Okay, she said in a small voice. I'm properly terrified. He moved back a bit. No need to be afraid of M. Are you too— She let the words fall away, embarrassed that she'd even asked the question. Raj smiled a little too smugly. Would it bother you if we were? No, of course not. I just— Well, we're not. M's my best friend and my lieutenant. But there's never been anything else between us. Oh, well, okay. Sarah cleared her throat nervously. Uh -uh, so what now? Now you get back in the car and stay there. This won't take long. He took her arm and bundled her back into the BMW, shutting the door firmly. Stay there, he said through the window as she hit the button to lower it. And put the window back up. Emily's not the only vampire in there. As he walked away from the car, Sarah thought she heard him mutter, And I've no intention of sharing. But she might have been wrong. Chapter 23 Raj did a final scan of the area, checked that Sarah was sitting in the hopefully locked car as promised, and pulled open the warehouse door, ready to apologize to M., the lights were on inside, too low for human eyes, but just right for a vampire. And the large space was no longer empty. Four big SUVs, all black with black-tinted windows, were parked near the loading bay doors. Over near the big refrigerator, the eight members of the team Emily had brought from Manhattan were engaged in various activities. Some lounged, watching the big-screen TV, wearing cordless headphones to preserve the facade of silence from outside the warehouse. Others were checking gear, mostly guns and knives. Vampires didn't need much in the way of hardware. With their strength, speed, and fangs, they were their own deadliest weapon. But a gun came in handy sometimes, and knives were always fun. M was in conversation with Abel, one of Raj's oldest and most reliable children. Abel caught Raj's eye and nodded to him, the big diamond in his ear winking happily against his nearly black skin. Emily finished whatever she'd been saying and walked over, detouring around a table loaded down with computer gear and electronics. The team's tech wizard, a human named Simon, was set up there, Fingers flying over a keyboard while earpods blasted music so loudly that Raj could hear it from where he stood. 
Emily's eyes were downcast as she drew closer. To his horror, she went down on one knee and said, My apologies, my lord. I did not realize. Jesus Christ, Em, get up. Raj pulled her to her feet. I'm the one who has to apologize. I shouldn't have snapped at you like that. I don't know what's wrong with me. Em studied him, her dark brown eyes solemn. The lovely planes of her face showed off to advantage by a tight ponytail pulled up high on her head. Raj, my friend, she said softly. That's not true. I only spent a few minutes with the two of you, but I know what's happening. And so do you. Raj matched her serious gaze for a few breaths. When he looked away, he swore viciously. Fuck, why now? Why her? Jesus Christ, Em, this city's a total mess. Kristoff's making new vampires like they're nothing but toys. Someone's kidnapping women from bloodhouses, and now her. I don't fucking need this. His voice had gotten louder and louder until it drew the attention of the vampires on the other side of the room. They'd all stopped what they were doing. Even the TV watchers had pulled their headphones off. They might not mean to eavesdrop, but they couldn't help it if he was going to shout like an idiot. He drew a deep breath and let it out slowly. I can't deal with this right now. There's too much at stake. I can't afford to be distracted by some little bit of a girl who thinks vampires are something she reads about in books with half-naked men on the covers. Em's mouth tightened in an obvious effort to keep from laughing, but her eyes gave her away. Why not just take the girl, boss? she asked practically. Maybe that's all you need. A quick sip, a roll in the hay, and you're a free vamp. And if not... Then she's bound to a fucking vampire for the rest of her life. Not to mention things are about to get hairy around here. And there are plenty of vampires who'd love to get their hands on her if she's linked to me. She doesn't deserve to get tangled up in all this. Em shrugged. Maybe you should let Sarah make that decision for herself. She's a grown woman, you know, not a child. Besides, there are worse things in life than being bound to a vampire, especially one as powerful as you are. Raj just scowled at her. Why don't we drop the subject of my love life? M shrugged and said, You're the boss. You want to tell me what's going on, or you want to brief everyone at once? Let's do it all at once. I don't like leaving Sarah out there alone. So bring her inside. No, he said instantly. Em raised her brows significantly, shaking her head as she led Raj over to where the team waited. All right, people, Raj started. Here's what we've got. Several human women have disappeared in the last month, all connected somehow to vampire activities. The last one is the daughter of William Cowan's. He looked around and saw every member of his team nodding knowledgeably. It was Cowens who insisted the police follow up on the vampire angle. Kristoff agreed to cooperate, mostly, I think, because he was sure there was nothing to it, and it was an easy way to get some good citizen credit. He called me in to take the heat, and if there was fallout, to make sure it didn't fall on him. No surprises so far. But, he paused, meeting the eyes of every one of his people. Recent information leads me to believe there might actually be a vampire involved. I'm not certain if Kristoff knows about it or not, but he clearly feels threatened by someone or something, and I don't think it's just me. He's making new vampires left and right, so many that Joseph doesn't even know about all of them. The key is the blood houses. With all these new vamps running around, the houses are bound to be crowded, and someone might be dipping on the sly. I want you to split into teams of two, civilian dress. 
There are four bloodhouses in the greater Buffalo region. I already stopped at the Corfu house, and there's been... a change of management. Emily gave him a sharp look. I didn't get a chance to ask too many questions first, so I'll still want a team out there and at each of the other houses on a rotating basis. With all the new vamps, it shouldn't be a problem for you to blend in. But let's not push. Em and I will be at large. You have our cell phone numbers. You find anything weird, you call us. Unless your lives are threatened, and then you do whatever it takes. Questions? You want us on the bag, or can we feed? Abel asked. Raj thought about it for a minute and said, Go ahead and feed at the bloodhouses. You'll stand out otherwise. But don't overdo it. I need you alert and ready to move. Abel nodded his understanding, and Raj looked around. Anyone else? There were no other questions, so Raj turned to his lieutenant. M, he said, indicating she should walk with him to the door. Once outside, he verified that Sarah was where he'd left her. He was surprised when she gave him a cheery little wave, but then glanced over his shoulder and scowled to find M waving back. Christ! He swore again. Stop that! He positioned himself between M and the car, effectively blocking any view of Sarah. Look, M, he said quietly. This might be really bad. Some of what I'm hearing makes me think... Ah, shit. I don't even like to bring this up. He looked away, shaking his head, then looked back at her. I think someone's selling vamp blood for research. M's eyes widened in a shock that mirrored his own feelings. Not one of ours. Hell no. Someone local. One of the missing women was a researcher at the university. Her husband claimed she was meeting someone who said he could guarantee access to vampire blood samples. Christoph? M asked in disbelief. Rod shook his head. It seems out of character. I've never seen him risk so much as a paper cut. And for something like this... The council would crucify him at midnight and leave him for the sun, and he knows it. A lot of money in something like that, though. Yeah, but he doesn't need money. I thought maybe it was about finding a fix for whatever's wrong with him. But then why bring me here to dig into it? He shook his head. I don't think this is Kristoff. I'm not ruling it out yet, but it doesn't feel right. He glanced quickly over his shoulder and saw Sarah watching them closely, even though she couldn't possibly hear what they were saying. He turned back to M, lowering his voice even further. I'm going to talk to the husband of the missing researcher tomorrow. The cops don't want to let me in, but I don't need their permission. And if this involves vamps, it's none of their business anyway. I'll be in touch with you afterward. In the meantime, take care of what's mine. Make sure no one goes out alone, and that includes you, M. You go out with one of the teams or with me. I don't want to lose anyone over this. I love you too, boss. I'd kiss you, but your new girlfriend over there wouldn't like it. M. He shook his head in disgust. I'm leaving now, but I'll be in touch. Sarah watched Raj as he turned away from Emily and strode back to the car, moving with that lethal grace of his, every muscle coiled and ready. He glanced up at her, and she could see his eyes had gone that strange, icy blue again. She smiled and caught his look of surprise, followed quickly by a scowl. It made her wonder why he was trying so hard not to like her. He yanked the driver's door open and settled into the car, barely waiting until his door was closed before spinning them out of the dingy parking lot with a tire-squealing turn. He didn't say anything as they headed back toward the city, but Sarah didn't mind. She'd learned a lot about Raj tonight, 
probably a lot more than he'd intended her to know. You could learn things from watching people relate to one another, even without hearing what they were saying. In fact, sometimes it was better not to hear the words, because words didn't always tell the truth, but the body usually did. For example, she knew for certain that Raj had told her the truth about Emily. There was nothing sexual between them and never had been. They were friends, very old, close friends who were totally at ease with one another. But that was it. Not a hint of sexual tension between them. No flirting, no posing for effect, even unconsciously. On the other hand, there was Emily's reaction to Sarah and Raj's reaction to Emily's reaction. Sarah smiled very privately. Yes, she'd learned some things about Raj tonight, and it was all beginning to make sense to her. You still hungry? She interrupted her private thoughts to look over at him. Pardon? Dinner, he said patiently. Are you still hungry? Oh, sure. Yes. Um, do you go to restaurants? He laughed. Not usually. Well, not to eat food, anyway. She blushed at this unsubtle reminder. I'm not starving. I mean, it's okay if— I know a place, he said, and we still need to talk. About what? she asked nervously. He glanced over at her. About those lies you keep telling me. Boy, did he know a place, Sarah thought to herself. She forked up a final bite of the most succulent salmon she'd ever tasted. They were in a small restaurant, one she'd passed almost every day on her way to campus without ever realizing what a treasure it was. In one of those frustratingly rapid-fire mood changes she was beginning to associate with Raj, he'd become almost cheerful once they sat down. He seemed to be old friends with the Polish proprietor. At least, that was the incomprehensible language the two of them were speaking. Only Polish had that many variations of the letter S. Raj was even drinking vodka, much to her surprise and his obvious amusement. It's not that we can't eat regular food, sweetheart, he'd said, leaning across the table to whisper conspiratorially. It's just that the flavor pales compared to our usual diet. He'd winked at her then, those cool blue eyes flashing icy hot, and she'd begun to wonder just what it would be like to have all of that vampire sensuality focused on her for a single night or maybe two. Raj had given her a confident smile, as if he knew what she was thinking, and she'd glared back at him, which had only made him laugh yet again before the proprietor stopped by and the two of them downed yet another vodka. Not that it seemed to have any effect on Raj. She, on the other hand, was carefully nursing her single glass of white wine. It was hard enough to resist his charms while sober. Mr. Gregor. A hearty voice boomed out across the room, and Sarah looked up in shock to find Edward Blackwood bearing down on them. The proprietor gave Raj a questioning look, but Raj shook his head slightly and slid out of the booth, standing next to the table and not looking much happier to see the HR founder than Sarah was, although perhaps not for the same reason. Mr. Blackwood, he said smoothly. This is unexpected. An unexpected pleasure, surely, Blackwood oozed. I was sorry we didn't have the opportunity to chat more the other night. Perhaps we could take a moment now, if your companion wouldn't— He swept a glance over Sarah, and she stiffened, convinced he had paused for a brief second with something close to recognition. Raj seemed to sense her discomfort— he stepped in front of her again, blocking Blackwood's inquisitive eyes. Sorry, Blackwood, Raj said, not sounding sorry at all. We have plans. Of course you do. Rude of me to think otherwise. 
How is the investigation going, if I might presume for just a moment of your time? Investigation? Well, yes, with the police. Have you made any headway? You'd have to ask them about that. I'm afraid I've been politely requested to stay out of it. Blackwood frowned. But I thought... Well, that is, it was our understanding you would be involved. No, Raj said, shaking his head. I'm looking into it on my end, and I wouldn't mind talking to some of the witnesses, but I can't get access, not officially anyway. Really? Well, maybe I can make a few calls. He retrieved a slim wallet from the inside pocket of his suit jacket and extracted his business card. Handing it to Raj, he said, In return, perhaps you'll agree to meet with me when this is all over. Raj took the card and slipped it into his pocket while Blackwood waited in obvious expectation of a reciprocal offer of some sort. When none was forthcoming, he smoothed his tie nervously, coughed, and said, Well, I'll make those calls, then. You have a pleasant evening. Raj didn't move until Blackwood had crossed the main dining room and turned out of sight into one of the smaller private rooms. Without sitting down, he made some sort of gesture to his proprietor friend and slipped a hand under Sarah's arm. We're leaving, he said, all but lifting her from her chair. Sarah didn't protest since she wanted nothing more than to get as far away from Blackwood as possible. She let Raj propel her out of the restaurant, but finally dug her feet in when he would have dragged her like some sort of stuffed toy down the street to where his car was parked. Stop, she said, shaking her arm loose from his firm grip. He gave her a cool look. I was under the impression you wanted to avoid Blackwood. Sarah blushed, but raised her chin defiantly. That doesn't mean I want to be dragged down the street like a recalcitrant child. I can walk, you know. Yes, I know, he said in a way that made her blush even harder. How do you do that? What? Make everything seem like some sort of foreplay. It's just walking, she complained. He laughed and wrapped an arm around her waist, getting her moving again toward his car. Not when you do it, sweetheart, and not with those heels you're wearing. Sarah smiled despite herself as he opened the car door and she slid inside. But her smile faded when she saw Blackwood standing outside the restaurant looking their way. He's watching us, she murmured as Raj settled into the driver's seat. I know. He spun away from the curb, executing an illegal U-turn that took them in the opposite direction they wanted to go, but avoided driving past the restaurant and Blackwood's prying eyes. Sarah expected him to turn somewhere, but he caught the main road out of town instead. Where are we going? The words were no sooner out of her mouth than he was crossing several lanes of traffic and pulling to a stop on a dark street of quiet homes and very little traffic. He left the engine running, but put the car in park and turned to face her, one long arm along the back of her seat. I think it's time for our little talk, Sarah. Here? she asked. Here. We can begin with why you're afraid of Edward Blackwood, 